Chapter Twenty One of Old Mortality by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Ananias, I do not like the man. He is a heathen and speaks the language of Canaan truly. Tribulation, you must await his calling and the coming of the good spirit you did ill to upbraid him the alchemist we return to henry morton whom we left on the field of battle he was eating by one of the watchfires his portion of the provisions which had been distributed to the army and musing deeply on the path which he was next to pursue when burley suddenly came up to him accompanied by the young minister whose exhortation after the victory had produced such a powerful effect henry morton said balfour abruptly the council of the army of the covenant confiding that the son of silas morton can never prove a lukewarm laodicean or an indifferent gallio in this great day have nominated you to be a captain of their host with the right of a vote in their council and all authority fitting for an officer who is to command christian men mr balfour replied morton without hesitation i feel this mark of confidence and it is not surprising that a natural sense of the injuries of my country not to mention those i have sustained in my own person should make me sufficiently willing to draw my sword for liberty and freedom of conscience but i will own to you that i must be better satisfied concerning the principles on which you bottom your cause ere i can agree to take a command amongst you and can you doubt of our principles answered burley since we have stated them to be the reformation both of church and state the rebuilding of the decayed sanctuary the gathering of the dispersed saints and the destruction of the man of sin i will own frankly mr balfour replied morton much of this sort of language which i observe is so powerful with others is entirely lost on me it is proper you should be aware of this before we commune further together the young clergyman here groaned deeply i distress you sir said morton but perhaps it is because you will not hear me out i revere the scriptures as deeply as you or any christian can do i look into them with humble hope of extracting a rule of conduct and a law of salvation but i expect to find this by an examination of their general tenor and of the spirit which they uniformly breathe and not by wrestling particular passages from their context or by the application of scriptural phrases to circumstances and events with which they have often very slender relation the young divine seemed shocked and thunderstruck with this declaration and was about to remonstrate hush ephraim said burley remember he is but as a babe in swaddling clothes listen to me morton i will speak to thee in the worldly language of that carnal reason which is for the present thy blind and imperfect guide what is the object for which thou art content to draw thy sword is it not that the church and state should be reformed by the free voice of a free parliament with such laws as shall hereafter prevent the executive government from spilling the blood torturing and imprisoning the persons exhausting the estates and trampling upon the consciences of men at their own wicked pleasure most certainly said morton such i esteem legitimate causes of warfare and for such i will fight while i can yield a sword nay but said macbriar ye handle this matter too tenderly nor will my conscience permit me to fard or daub over the causes of divine wrath peace ephraim macbriar again interrupted burley 
i will not peace said the young man is it not the cause of my master who hath sent me is it not a profane and erastian destroying of his authority usurpation of his power denial of his name to place either king or parliament in his place as the master and governor of his household the adulterous husband of his spouse you speak well said burleigh dragging him aside but not wisely your own ears have heard this night in council how this scattered remnant are broken and divided and would ye now make a veil of separation between them would ye build a wall with unslaked mortar if a fox go up it will breach it i know said the young clergyman in reply that thou art faithful honest and zealous even unto slaying but believe me this worldly craft this temporizing with sin and with infirmity is in itself a falling away and i fear me heaven will not honour us to do much more for his glory when we seek to carnal cunning and to a fleshly arm the sanctified end must be wrought by sanctified means i tell thee answered balfour thy zeal is too rigid in this matter we cannot yet do without the help of the laodiceans and the erastians we must endure for a space the indulged in the midst of the council the sons of zeruiah are yet too strong for us i tell thee i like it not said macbriar god can work deliverance by a few as well as by a multitude the host of the faithful that was broken upon pentland hills paid but the fitting penalty of acknowledging the carnal interest of that tyrant and oppressor charles stuart well then said balfour thou knowest the healing resolution that the council have adopted to make a comprehending declaration that may suit the tender consciences of all who groan under the yoke of our present oppressors return to the council if thou wilt and get them to recall it and send forth one upon narrower grounds but abide not here to hinder my gaining over this youth whom my soul travails for his name alone will call forth hundreds to our banners do as thou wilt then said macbriar but i will not assist to mislead the youth nor bring him into jeopardy of life unless upon such grounds as will ensure his eternal reward the more artful balfour then dismissed the impatient preacher and returned to his proselyte that we may be enabled to dispense with detailing at length the arguments by which he urged morton to join the insurgents we shall take this opportunity to give a brief sketch of the person by whom they were used and the motives which he had for interesting himself so deeply in the conversion of young morton to his cause john balfour of kenlock or burleigh for he is designated both ways in the histories and proclamations of that melancholy period was a gentleman of some fortune and of good family in the county of fife and had been a soldier from his youth upwards in the younger part of his life he had been wild and licentious but had early laid aside open profligacy and embraced the strictest tenets of calvinism unfortunately habits of excess and intemperance were more easily rooted out of his dark saturnine and enterprising spirit than the vices of revenge and ambition which continued notwithstanding his religious professions to exercise no small sway over his mind daring in design precipitate and violent in execution and going to the very extremity of the most rigid recusancy it was his ambition to place himself at the head of the presbyterian interest to attain this eminence among the whigs he had been active in attending their conventicles and more than once had commanded them 
when they appeared in arms and beaten off the forces sent to disperse them at length the gratification of his own fierce enthusiasm joined as some say with motives of private revenge placed him at the head of that party who assassinated the primate of scotland as the author of the sufferings of the presbyterians the violent measures adopted by government to revenge this deed not on the perpetrators only but on the whole professors of the religion to which they belonged together with long previous sufferings without any prospect of deliverance except by force of arms occasioned the insurrection which as we have already seen commenced by the defeat of claverhouse in the bloody skirmish of loudon hill but burleigh notwithstanding the share he had in the victory was far from finding himself at the summit which his ambition aimed at this was partly owing to the various opinions entertained among the insurgents concerning the murder of archbishop sharp the more violent among them did indeed approve of this act as a deed of justice executed upon a persecutor of god's church through the immediate inspiration of the deity but the greater part of the presbyterians disowned the deed as a crime highly culpable although they admitted that the archbishop's punishment had by no means exceeded his deserts the insurgents differed in another main point which has been already touched upon the more warm and extravagant fanatics condemned as guilty of a pusillanimous abandonment of rights of the church those preachers and congregations who were contented in any manner to exercise their religion through the permission of the ruling government this they said was absolute erastianism or subjection of the church of god to the regulations of an earthly government and therefore but one degree better than prelacy or popery again the more moderate party were content to allow the king's title to the throne and in secular affairs to acknowledge his authority so long as it was exercised with due regard to the liberties of the subject and in conformity to the laws of the realm but the tenants of the wilder sect called from their leader richard cameron by the name of cameronians went the length of disowning the reigning monarch and every one of his successors who should not acknowledge the solemn league and covenant the seeds of disunion were therefore thickly sown in this ill-fated party and balfour however enthusiastic and however much attached to the most violent of those tenets which we have noticed saw nothing but ruin to the general cause if they were insisted on during this crisis when unity was of so much consequence hence he disapproved as we have seen of the honest downright and ardent zeal of macbriar and was extremely desirous to receive the assistance of the moderate party of presbyterians in the immediate overthrow of the government with the hope of being hereafter able to dictate to them what should be substituted in its place he was on this account particularly anxious to secure the accession of henry morton to the cause of the insurgents the memory of his father was generally esteemed among the presbyterians and as few persons of any decent quality had joined the insurgents this young man's family and prospects were such as almost ensured his being chosen a leader through morton's means as being the son of his ancient comrade burleigh conceived he might exercise some influence over the more liberal part of the army and ultimately perhaps ingratiate himself so far with them as to be chosen commander-in-chief which was the mark at which his ambition aimed he had therefore without waiting till any other person took up the subject exalted to the council the talents and disposition of morton and easily obtained his elevation to the painful rank of a leader 
in this disunited and undisciplined army the arguments by which balfour pressed morton to accept of this dangerous promotion as soon as he had gotten rid of his less wary and uncompromising companion mcbriar were sufficiently artful and urgent he did not affect either to deny or to disguise that the sentiments which he himself entertained concerning church government went as far as those of the preacher who had just left them but he argued that when the affairs of the nation were at such a desperate crisis minute difference of opinion should not prevent those who in general wished well to their oppressed country from drawing their swords in its behalf many of the subjects of division as for example that concerning the indulgence itself arose he observed out of circumstances which would cease to exist provided their attempt to free the country should be successful seeing that the presbytery being in that case triumphant would need to make no such compromise with the government and consequently with the abolition of the indulgence all discussion of its legality would be at once ended he insisted much and strongly upon the necessity of taking advantage of this favourable crisis upon the certainty of their being joined by the force of the whole western shires and upon the gross guilt which those would incur who seeing the distress of the country and the increasing tyranny with which it was governed should from fear or indifference withhold their active aid from the good cause morton wanted not these arguments to induce him to join in any insurrection which might appear to have a feasible prospect of freedom to the country he doubted indeed greatly whether the present attempt was likely to be supported by the strength sufficient to ensure success or by the wisdom and liberality of spirit necessary to make a good use of the advantages that might be gained upon the whole however considering the wrongs he had personally endured and those which he had seen daily inflicted on his fellow-subjects meditating also upon the precarious and dangerous situation in which he already stood with relation to the government he conceived himself in every point of view called upon to join the body of presbyterians already in arms but while he expressed to burley his acquiescence in the vote which had named him a leader among the insurgents and a member of their council of war it was not without a qualification i am willing he said to contribute everything within my limited power to effect the emancipation of my country but do not mistake me i disapprove in the utmost degree of the action in which this rising seems to have originated and no arguments should induce me to join it if it is to be carried on by such measures as that with which it has commenced burley's blood rushed to his face giving a ruddy and dark glow to his swarthy brow you mean he said in a voice which he designed should not betray any emotion you mean the death of james sharp frankly answered morton such is my meaning you imagine then said burley that the almighty in times of difficulty does not raise up instruments to deliver his church from her oppressors you are of opinion that the justice of an execution consists not in the extent of the sufferer's crime or in his having merited punishment or in the wholesome and salutary effect which that example is likely to produce upon other evil-doers but hold that it rests solely in the robe of the judge the height of the bench and the voice of the doomster is not just punishment justly inflicted whether on the scaffold or the moor and where constituted judges from cowardice or from having cast in their lot with transgressors suffer them not only to pass at liberty through the land but to sit in the high places and dye their garments in the blood of the saints 
is it not well done in any brave spirits who shall draw their private swords in the public cause i have no wish to judge this individual action replied morton further than is necessary to make you fully aware of my principles i therefore repeat that the case you have supposed does not satisfy my judgment that the almighty in his mysterious providence may bring a bloody man to an end deservedly bloody does not vindicate those who without authority of any kind take upon themselves to be the instruments of execution and presume to call them the executors of divine vengeance and were we not so said burleigh in a tone of fierce enthusiasm were not we was not every one who owned the interest of the covenanted church of scotland bound by that covenant to cut off the judas who had sold the cause of god for fifty thousand mercs a year had we met him by the way as he came down from london and there smitten him with the edge of the sword we had done but the duty of men faithful to our cause and to our oaths recorded in heaven was not the execution itself a proof of our warrant did not the lord deliver him into our hands when we looked out but for one of his inferior tools of persecution did we not pray to be resolved how we should act and was it not borne in on our hearts as if it had been written on them with the point of a diamond ye shall surely take him and slay him was not the tragedy full half an hour in acting ere the sacrifice was completed and that in an open heath and within the patrols of their garrisons and yet who interrupted the great work what dog so much as bade us during the pursuit the taking the slaying and the dispersing then who will say who dare say that a mightier arm than ours was not herein revealed you deceive yourself mr balfour said morton such circumstances of facility of execution and escape have often attended the commission of the most enormous crimes but it is not mine to judge you i have not forgotten that the way was opened to the former liberation of scotland by an act of violence which no man can justify the slaughter of coming by the hand of robert bruce and therefore condemning this action as i do and must i am not unwilling to suppose that you may have motives vindicating it in your own eyes though not in mine or in those of sober reason i only now mention it because i desire you to understand that i join a cause supported by men engaged in open war which it is proposed to carry on according to the rules of civilized nations without in any respect approving of the act of violence which gave immediate rise to it balfour bit his lip and with difficulty suppressed a violent answer he perceived with disappointment that upon points of principle his young brother-in-arms possessed a clearness of judgment and a firmness of mind which afforded but little hope of his being able to exert that degree of influence over him which he had expected to possess after a moment's pause however he said with coolness my conduct is open to men and angels the deed was not done in a corner i am here in arms to avow it and care not where or by whom i am called on to do so whether in the council the field of battle the place of execution or the day of the last great trial i will not now discuss it further with you who is yet on the other side of the veil but if you will cast in your lot with us as a brother come with me to the council who are still sitting to arrange the future march of the army and the means of improving our victory morton arose and followed him in silence not greatly delighted with his associate 
and better satisfied with the general justice of the cause which he had espoused than either with the measures or the motives of many of those who were embarked in it this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks volume two chapter one of old mortality by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah and look how many grecian tents do stand hollow upon this plain so many hollow factions troilus and cressida in a hollow of the hill about a quarter of a mile from the field of battle was a shepherd's hut a miserable cottage which as the only enclosed spot within a moderate distance the leaders of the presbyterian army had chosen for their council house towards this spot burley guided morton who was surprised as he approached it at the multifarious confusion of sounds which issued from its precincts the calm and anxious gravity which it might be supposed would have presided in councils held on such important subjects and at a period so critical seemed to have given place to discord wild and loud uproar which fell on the ear of their new ally as an evil augury of their future measures as they approached the door they found it open indeed but choked up with the bodies and heads of countrymen who though no members of the council felt no scruple in intruding themselves upon deliberations in which they were so deeply interested by expostulation by threats and even by some degree of violence burley the sternness of whose character maintained a sort of superiority over these disorderly forces compelled the intruders to retire and introducing morton into the cottage secured the door behind them against impertinent curiosity at a less agitating moment the young man might have been entertained with the singular scene of which he now found himself an auditor and a spectator the precincts of the gloomy and ruinous hut were enlightened partly by some firs which blazed on the hearth the smoke whereof having no legal vent eddied around and formed over the heads of the assembled council a clouded canopy as opaque as their metaphysical theology through which like stars through mist were dimly seen to twinkle a few blinking candles or rather rushes dipped in tallow the property of the poor owner of the cottage which were stuck to the walls by patches of wet clay this broken and dusky night showed many a countenance elated with spiritual pride or rendered dark by fierce enthusiasm and some whose anxious wandering and uncertain looks showed they felt themselves rashly embarked in a cause which they had neither courage nor conduct to bring to a good issue yet knew not how to abandon for very shame they were indeed a doubtful and disunited body the most active of their number were those concerned with burley in the death of the primate four or five of whom had found their way to loudon hill together with other men of the same relentless and uncompromising zeal who had in various ways given desperate and unpardonable offence to the government with them were mingled their preachers men who had spurned at the indulgence offered by government and preferred assembling their flocks in the wilderness to worshipping in temples built by human hands if their doing the latter should be construed to admit any right on the part of their rulers to interfere with the supremacy of the kirk 
the other class of counsellors were such gentlemen of small fortune and substantial farmers as a sense of intolerable oppression had induced to take arms and join the insurgents these also had their clergymen with them and such divines having many of them taken advantage of the indulgence were prepared to resist the measures of their more violent brethren who proposed a declaration in which they should give testimony against the warrants and instructions for indulgence as sinful and unlawful acts this delicate question had been passed over in silence in the first draft of the manifestos which they intended to publish of the reasons of their gathering in arms but it had been stirred anew during balfour's absence and to his great vexation he now found that both parties had opened upon it in full cry macbriar kettledrummel and other teachers of the wanderers being at the very spring tide of polemical discussion with peter pound text the indulged pastor of milnwood's parish who it seems had even girded himself with a broadsword but ere he was called upon to fight for the good cause of presbytery in the field was manfully defending his own dogmata in the council it was the din of this conflict maintained chiefly between pound text and kettle drummel together with the clamour of their adherents which had saluted morton's ears upon approaching the cottage indeed as both the divines were men well gifted with words and lungs and each fierce ardent and intolerant in defence of his own doctrine prompt in the recollection of texts wherewith they battered each other without mercy and deeply impressed with the importance of the subject of discussion the noise of the debate betwixt them fell little short of that which might have attended an actual bodily conflict burley scandalized at the disunion implied in this virulent strife of tongues interposed between the disputants and by some general remarks on the unseasonableness of discord a soothing address to the vanity of each party and the exertion of the authority which his services in that day's victory entitled him to assume at length succeeded in prevailing upon them to adjourn farther discussion of the controversy but although kettle drummel and pound text were thus for the time silenced they continued to eye each other like two dogs who having been separated by the authority of their masters while fighting have retreated each beneath the chair of his owner still watching each other's motions and indicating by occasional growls by the erected bristles of the back and ears and by the red glance of the eye that their discord is unappeased and that they only wait the first opportunity afforded by any general movement or commotion in the company to fly once more at each other's throats balfour took advantage of the momentary pause to present to the council mr henry morton of milnwood as one touched with a sense of the evils of the times and willing to peril goods and life in the precious cause for which his father the renowned silas morton had given in his time a soul-stirring testimony morton was instantly received with the right hand of fellowship by his ancient pastor pound text and by those among the insurgents who supported the more moderate principles the others muttered something about erastianism and reminded each other in whispers that silas morton once a stout and worthy servant of the covenant had been a backslider in the day when the resolutioners had led the way in owning the authority of charles stuart thereby making a gap whereat the present tyrant was afterwards brought in to the oppression both of kirk and country they added however that on this great day of calling 
they would not refuse society with any who should put hand to the plough and so morton was installed in his office of leader and counsellor if not with the full approbation of his colleagues at least without any formal or avowed dissent they proceeded on burley's motion to divide among themselves the command of the men who had assembled and whose numbers were daily increasing in this partition the insurgents of Poundtex parish and congregation were naturally placed under the command of morton an arrangement mutually agreeable to both parties as he was recommended to their confidence as well by his personal qualities as his having been born among them when this task was accomplished it became necessary to determine what use was to be made of their victory morton's heart throbbed high when he heard the tower of tilly tudlam named as one of the most important positions to be seized upon it commanded as we have often noticed the pass between the more wild and the more fertile country and must furnish it was plausibly urged a stronghold and place of rendezvous to the cavaliers and malignants of the district supposing the insurgents were to march onward and leave it uninvested this measure was particularly urged as necessary by Poundtext and those of his immediate followers whose habitations and families might be exposed to great severities if this strong place were permitted to remain in possession of the royalists i opine said Poundtext, for like the other divines of the period he had no hesitation in offering his advice upon military matters of which he was profoundly ignorant i opine that we should take in and raise that stronghold of the woman lady margaret bellenden even though we should build a fort and raise a mount against it for the race is a rebellious and a bloody race and their hand has been heavy on the children of the covenant both in the former and the latter times their hook hath been in our noses and their bridle betwixt our jaws what are their means and men of defence said burley the place is strong but i cannot conceive that two women can make it good against a host there is also said Poundtext, harrison the steward and john goodyell even the lady's chief butler who boasted himself a man of war from his youth upward and who spread the banner against the good cause with that man of belial james graham of montrose pshaw returned burley scornfully a butler also there is that ancient malignant replied Poundtext, miles bellenden of charnwood whose hands have been dipped in the blood of the saints if that said burley be miles bellenden the brother of sir arthur he is one whose sword will not turn back from battle but he must now be stricken in years there was word in the country as i rode along said another of the council that so soon as they heard of the victory which has been given to us they caused shut the gates of the tower and called in men and collected ammunition they were ever a fierce and a malignant house we will not with my consent said burley engage in a siege which may consume time we must rush forward and follow our advantage by occupying glasgow for i do not fear that the troops we have this day beaten even with the assistance of my lord ross's regiment will judge it safe to await our coming how be it said Poundtext, we may display a banner before the tower and blow a trumpet and summon them to come forth it may be that they will give over the place into our mercy though they be a rebellious people and we will summon the women to come forth of their stronghold that is lady margaret bellenden and her granddaughter and jenny dennison which is a girl of an ensnaring eye and the other maids and we will give them a safe conduct 
and send them in peace to the city even to the town of edinburgh but john goodyell and hugh harrison and miles bellenden we will restrain with fetters of iron even as they in times by past have done to the martyred saints who talks of safe conduct and of peace said a shrill broken and overstrained voice from the crowd peace brother habakkuk said macbriar in a soothing tone to the speaker i will not hold my peace reiterated the strange and unnatural voice is this a time to speak of peace when the earth quakes and the mountains are rent and the rivers are changed into blood and the two-edged sword is drawn from the sheath to drink gore as if it were water and devour flesh as the fire devours dry stubble while he spoke thus the orator struggled forward to the inner part of the circle and presented to morton's wondering eyes a figure worthy of such a voice and such language the rags of a dress which had once been black added to the tattered fragments of a shepherd's plaid composed a covering scarce fit for the purposes of decency much less for those of warmth or comfort a long beard as white as snow hung down on his breast and mingled with bushy uncombed grizzled hair which hung in elf locks around his wild and staring visage the features seemed to be extenuated by penury and famine until they hardly retained the likeness of a human aspect the eyes grey wild and wandering evidently betokened a bewildered imagination he held in his hand a rusty sword clotted with blood as were his long lean hands which were garnished at the extremity with nails like eagles claws in the name of heaven who is he said morton in a whisper to pound text surprised shocked and even startled at this ghastly apparition which looked more like the resurrection of some cannibal priest or druid read from his human sacrifice than like an earthly mortal it is habakkuk mucklewrath answered pound text in the same tone whom the enemy have long detained in captivity in forts and castles until his understanding hath departed from him and as i fear an evil demon hath possessed him nevertheless our violent brethren will have it that he speaketh of the spirit and that they fructify by his pouring forth here he was interrupted by mucklewrath who cried in a voice that made the very beams of the roof quiver who talks of peace and safe conduct who speaks of mercy to the bloody house of the malignants i say take the infants and dash them against the stones take the daughters and the mothers of the house and hurl them from the battlements of their trust that the dogs may fatten on their blood as they did on that of jezebel the spouse of ahab and that their carcasses may be dung to the face of the field even in the portion of their fathers he speaks right said more than one sullen voice from behind we will be honoured with little service in the great cause if we already make fair weather with heaven's enemies this is utter abomination and daring impiety said morton unable to contain his indignation what blessing can you expect in a cause in which you listen to the mingled ravings of madness and atrocity hush young man said kettledrummel and reserve thy censure for that for which thou canst render a reason it is not for thee to judge into what vessels the spirit may be poured we judge of the tree by the fruit said Poundtext, and allow not that to be of divine inspiration that contradicts the divine laws you forget brother Poundtext, said macbriar that these are the latter days when signs and wonders shall be multiplied 
pound text stood forward to reply but ere he could articulate a word the insane preacher broke in with a scream that drowned all competition who talks of signs and wonders am i not habakkuk mucklewrath whose name is changed to magor misabib because i am made a terror unto myself and unto all that are around me i heard it when did i hear it was it not in the tower of the baths that overhangeth the wide wild sea and it howled in the winds and it roared in the billows and it screamed and it whistled and it clanged with the screams and the clang and the whistle of the sea-birds as they floated and flew and dropped and dived on the bosom of the waters i saw it where did i see it was it not from the high peaks of dunbarton when i looked westward upon the fertile land and northward on the wild highland hills when the clouds gathered and the tempest came and the lightnings of heaven flashed in sheets as wide as the banners of an host what did i see dead corpses and wounded horses the rushing together of battle and garments rolled in blood what heard i the voice that cried slay slay smite slay utterly let not your eye have pity slay utterly old and young the maiden the child and the woman whose head is grey defile the house and fill the courts with the slain we receive the command exclaimed more than one of the company six days he hath not spoken nor broken bread and now his tongue is unloosed we receive the command as he hath said so will we do astonished disgusted and horror-struck at what he had seen and heard morton turned away from the circle and left the cottage he was followed by burley who had his eye on his motions whither are you going said the latter taking him by the arm anywhere i care not whither but here i will abide no longer art thou so soon weary young man answered burley thy hand is but now put to the plough and wouldst thou already abandon it is this thy adherence to the cause of thy father no cause replied morton indignantly no cause can prosper so conducted one party declares for the ravings of a bloodthirsty madman another leader is an old scholastic pedant a third he stopped and his companion continued the sentence is a desperate homicide thou wouldst say like john balfour of burleigh i can bear thy misconstruction without resentment thou dost not consider that it is not men of sober and self-seeking minds who arise in these days of wrath to execute judgment and to accomplish deliverance hadst thou but seen the armies of england during her parliament of sixteen forty whose ranks were filled with sectaries and enthusiasts wilder than the anabaptists of munster thou wouldst have had more cause to marvel and yet these men were unconquered on the field and their hands wrought marvellous things for the liberties of the land but their affairs replied morton were wisely conducted and the violence of their zeal expended itself in their exhortations and sermons without bringing divisions into their councils or cruelty into their conduct i have often heard my father say so and protest that he wondered at nothing so much as the contrast between the extravagance of their religious tenets and the wisdom and moderation with which they conducted their civil and military affairs but our councils seem all one wild chaos of confusion thou must have patience henry morton answered balfour thou must not leave the cause of thy religion and country either for one wild word or one extravagant action hear me i have already persuaded the wiser of our friends 
that the counsellors are too numerous and that we cannot expect that the midianites shall by so large a number be delivered into our hands they have hearkened to my voice and our assemblies will be shortly reduced within such a number as can consult and act together and in them thou shalt have a free voice as well as in ordering our affairs of war and protecting those to whom mercy should be shown art thou now satisfied it will give me pleasure doubtless answered morton to be the means of softening the horrors of civil war and i will not leave the post i have taken unless i see measures adopted at which my conscience revolts but to no bloody executions after quarter asked or slaughter without trial will i lend countenance or sanction and you may depend on my opposing them with both heart and hand as constantly and resolutely if attempted by our own followers as when they are the work of the enemy balfour waved his hand impatiently thou wilt find he said that the stubborn and hard-hearted generation with whom we deal must be chastised with scorpions ere their hearts be humbled and ere they accept the punishment of their iniquity the word is gone forth against them i will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant but what is done shall be done gravely and with discretion like that of the worthy james melvin who executed judgment on the tyrant and oppressor cardinal beaton i own to you replied morton that i feel still more abhorrent at cold-blooded and premeditated cruelty than at that which is practised in the heat of zeal and resentment thou art yet but a youth replied balfour and hast not learned how light in the balance are a few drops of blood in comparison to the weight and importance of this great national testimony but be not afraid thyself shall vote and judge in these matters it may be we shall see little cause to strive together anent them with this concession morton was compelled to be satisfied for the present and burleigh left him advising him to lie down and get some rest as the host would probably move in the morning and you answered morton do not you go to rest also no said burleigh my eyes must not yet know slumber this is no work to be done lightly i have yet to perfect the choosing of the committee of leaders and i will call you by times in the morning to be present at their consultation he turned away and left morton to his repose the place in which he found himself was not ill adapted for the purpose being a sheltered nook beneath a large rock well protected from the prevailing wind a quantity of moss with which the ground was overspread made a couch soft enough for one who had suffered so much hardship and anxiety morton wrapped himself in the horseman's cloak which he had still retained stretched himself on the ground and had not long indulged in melancholy reflections on the state of the country and upon his own condition ere he was relieved from them by deep and sound slumber the rest of the army slept on the ground dispersed in groups which chose their beds on the fields as they could best find shelter and convenience a few of the principal leaders held wakeful conference with burley on the state of their affairs and some watchmen were appointed who kept themselves on the alert by chanting psalms or listening to the exercises of the more gifted of their number chapter two of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah got with much ease now merrily to horse henry the fourth part one with the first peep of day henry awoke 
and found the faithful cuddy standing beside him with a portmanteau in his hand i have been just putting your honour's things in readiness again ye were waking said cuddy as is my duty seeing ye have been so good as to take me into your service i take you into my service cuddy said morton you must be dreaming no no stir answered cuddy didna i say when i was tied on the horse yonder that if ever ye got loose i would be your servant and ye didna say no and if that isna hiring i canna what is ye gave me no arls indeed but ye have given me enough before at milnwood well cuddy if you insist on taking the chance of my unprosperous fortunes oh ay i's warrant us a prosper well enough answered cuddy cheeringly and once my old mother was well puttin up i have begun the campaigning trade at an end that is easy enough to learn pillaging i suppose said morton for how else could you come by that portmanteau i wotna if it's pillaging or how ye call it said cuddy but it comes natural to a body and it's a profitable trade our folk have twirled the dead dragoons as bare as bobbies before we were loose a'most but when i saw the wigs all will yoke it by the lugs to kettle drummle and the other chilled i set off at the long trot on my own errand and your honours so i took up the syke a wee bit away to the right where i saw the marks of many a horsefoot and sure enough i came to a place where there had been some clean leatherin and all the poor shields were lying there busket with their clothes just as they had put them on that morning nobody had found out that pose of carcages and what would be in the midst thereof as my mother says but our old acquaintance sergeant bothwell ay has that man fallen said morton troth has he answered cuddy and his eyne were open and his brow bent and his teeth clenched together like the jaws of a trap for fumarts when the spring's down i was a most feared to look at him however i thought to have turn about with him and so i even riped his pouches as he had done money an honester man's and here's your own siller again or your uncle's which is the same that he got at milnwood that unlucky night that made us all soldiers together there can be no harm cuddy said morton in making use of this money since we know how he came by it but you must divide with me bide a wee bide a wee said cuddy well and there's a bit ring he had hanging in a black ribbon down on his breast i am thinking it has been a love token poor fellow there's nobody so rough but they have i a kind heart to the lasses and there's a book with a ween papers and i got twa or three odd things that i'll keep to myself for by upon my word you have made a very successful foray for a beginner said his new master havena i even now said cuddy with great exultation i told ye i wasna that doom stupid if it came to lifting things and forby i have gotten twa good horse a feckless loon of a straven weaver that has left his loom and his bean house to sit squirling on a cold hillside had catched twa dragoon nags and he could neither gar them hop nor wind so he took a gold noble for them both i should have tried him with half the siller but it's an unco ill place to get change in ye'll find the sillers missing out of bothwell's purse you have made a most excellent and useful purchase cuddy but what is that portmanteau the pock mantle answered cuddy it was the lord evandale's yesterday and it's yours the day 
i found it ahint the bush of broom yonder ilk a dog has its day ye ken what the old song says take turn about mother quo tam of the lynn and speaking of that i maun gang and see about my mother poor old body if your honour has na any immediate commands but cuddy said morton i really cannot take these things from you without some recompense how fie stir answered cuddy ye should i be taking for recompense ye may think about that some other time i have seen gay well to myself with some things that fit me better what could i do with lord evandale's bra clothes sergeant bothwell's will serve me well enough not being able to prevail on the self-constituted and disinterested follower to accept of anything for himself out of these warlike spoils morton resolved to take the first opportunity of returning lord evandale's property supposing him yet to be alive and in the meanwhile did not hesitate to avail himself of cuddy's prize so far as to appropriate some changes of linen and other trifling articles amongst those of more value which the portmanteau contained he then hastily looked over the papers which were found in bothwell's pocket-book these were of a miscellaneous description the roll of his troop with the names of those absent on furlough memorandums of tavern bills and lists of delinquents who might be made subjects of fine and persecution first presented themselves along with a copy of a warrant from the privy council to arrest certain persons of distinction therein named in another pocket of the book were one or two commissions which bothwell had held at different times and certificates of his services abroad in which his courage and military talents were highly praised but the most remarkable paper was an accurate account of his genealogy with reference to many documents for establishment of its authenticity subjoined was a list of the ample possessions of the forfeited earls of bothwell and a particular account of the proportions in which king james the sixth had bestowed them on the courtiers and nobility by whose descendants they were at present actually possessed beneath this list was written in red letters in the hand of the deceased hod immamore f s e b the initials probably intimating francis stuart earl of bothwell to these documents which strongly painted the character and feelings of their deceased proprietor were added some which showed him in a light greatly different from that in which we have hitherto presented him to the reader in a secret pocket of the book which morton did not discover without some trouble were one or two letters written in a beautiful female hand they were dated about twenty years back bore no address and were subscribed only by initials without having time to peruse them accurately morton perceived that they contained the elegant yet fond expressions of female affection directed towards an object whose jealousy they endeavoured to soothe and of whose hasty suspicious and impatient temper the writer seemed gently to complain the ink of these manuscripts had faded by time and notwithstanding the great care which had obviously been taken for their preservation they were in one or two places chafed so as to be illegible it matters not these words were written on the envelope of that which had suffered most i have them by heart with these letters was a lock of hair wrapped in a copy of verses written obviously with a feeling which atoned in morton's opinion for the roughness of the poetry and the conceits with which it abounded according to the taste of the period thy hue dear pledge is pure and bright as in that well-remembered night when first thy mystic braid was wove and first my agnes whispered love since then 
how often hast thou pressed the torrid zone of this wild breast whose wrath and hate have sworn to dwell with the first sin which peopled hell a breast whose blood's a troubled ocean each throb the earthquake's wild commotion oh if such clime thou canst endure yet keep thy hue unstained and pure what conquest over each erring thought of that fierce realm had agnes wrought i had not wandered wild and wide with such an angel for my guide nor heaven nor earth could then reprove me if she had lived and lived to love me not then this world's wild joys had been to me one savage hunting scene my sole delight the headlong race and frantic hurry of the chase to start pursue and bring to bay rush in drag down and rend my prey then from the carcass turn away mine ireful mood had sweetness tamed and soothed each wound which pride inflamed yes god and man might now approve me if thou hadst lived and lived to love me as he finished reading these lines morton could not forbear reflecting with compassion on the fate of this singular and most unhappy being who it appeared while in the lowest state of degradation and almost of contempt had his recollections continually fixed on the high station to which his birth seemed to entitle him and while plunged in gross licentiousness was in secret looking back with bitter remorse to the period of his youth during which he had nourished a virtuous though unfortunate attachment alas what are we said morton that our best and most praiseworthy feelings can be thus debased and depraved that honourable pride can sink into haughty and desperate indifference for general opinion and the sorrow of blighted affection inhabit the same bosom which license revenge and rapine have chosen for their citadel but it is the same throughout the liberal principles of one man sink into cold and unfeeling indifference the religious zeal of another hurries him into frantic and savage enthusiasm our resolutions our passions are like the waves of the sea and without the aid of him who formed the human breast we cannot say to its tides thus far shall ye come and no farther while he thus moralized he raised his eyes and observed that burley stood before him already awake said that leader it is well and shows zeal to tread the path before you what papers are these he continued morton gave him some brief account of cuddy's successful marauding party and handed him the pocket-book of bothwell with its contents the cameronian leader looked with some attention on such of the papers as related to military affairs or public business but when he came to the verses he threw them from him with contempt i little thought he said when by the blessing of god i passed my sword three times through the body of that arch tool of cruelty and persecution that a character so desperate and so dangerous could have stooped to an art as trifling as it is profane but i see that satan can blend the most different qualities in his well-beloved and chosen agents and that the same hand which can wield a club or a slaughter-weapon against the godly in the valley of destruction can touch a tinkling lute or a gittern to soothe the ears of the dancing daughters of perdition in their vanity fair your ideas of duty then said morton exclude love of the fine arts which have been supposed in general to purify and to elevate the mind to me young man answered burley and to those who think as i do the pleasures of this world under whatever name disguised are vanity as its grandeur and power are a snare we have but one object on earth 
and that is to build up the temple of the lord i have heard my father observe replied morton that many who assumed power in the name of heaven were as severe in its exercise and as unwilling to part with it as if they had been solely moved by the motives of worldly ambition but of this another time have you succeeded in obtaining a committee of the council to be nominated i have answered burley the number is limited to six of which you are one and i come to call you to their deliberations morton accompanied him to a sequestered grass plot where their colleagues awaited them in this delegation of authority the two principal factions which divided the tumultuary army had each taken care to send three of their own number on the part of the cameronians were burley mcbriar and kettledrummel and on that of the moderate party pound text henry morton and a small proprietor called the laird of langkell thus the two parties were equally balanced by their representatives in the committee of management although it seemed likely that those of the most violent opinions were as is usual in such cases to possess and exert the greater degree of energy their debate however was conducted more like men of this world than could have been expected from their conduct on the preceding evening after maturely considering their means and situation and the probable increase of their numbers they agreed that they would keep their position for that day in order to refresh their men and give time to reinforcements to join them and that on the next morning they would direct their march towards tilly tudlam and summon that stronghold as they expressed it of malignancy if it was not surrendered to their summons they resolved to try the effect of a brisk assault and should that miscarry it was settled that they should leave a part of their number to blockade the place and reduce it if possible by famine while their main body should march forward to drive claverhouse and lord ross from the town of glasgow such was the determination of the council of management and thus morton's first enterprise in active life was likely to be the attack of a castle belonging to the parent of his mistress and defended by her relative major bellenden to whom he personally owed many obligations he felt fully the embarrassment of his situation yet consoled himself with the reflection that his newly acquired power in the insurgent army would give him at all events the means of extending to the inmates of tilly tudlam a protection which no other circumstance could have afforded them and he was not without hope that he might be able to mediate such an accommodation betwixt them and the presbyterian army as should secure them a safe neutrality during the war which was about to ensue chapter three of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah there came a knight from the field of slain his steed was drenched in blood and rain finlay we must now return to the fortress of tilly tudlam and its inhabitants the morning being the first after the battle of loudon hill had dawned upon its battlements and the defenders had already resumed the labours by which they proposed to render the place tenable when the watchman who was placed in a high turret called the warder's tower gave the signal that a horseman was approaching as he came nearer his dress indicated an officer of the life guards and the slowness of his horse's pace as well as the manner in which the rider stooped on the saddle-bow plainly showed that he was sick or wounded the wicket was instantly opened to receive him and lord evandale rode into the courtyard 
so reduced by loss of blood that he was unable to dismount without assistance as he entered the hall leaning upon a servant the ladies shrieked with surprise and terror for pale as death stained with blood his regimentals soiled and torn and his hair matted and disordered he resembled rather a spectre than a human being but their next exclamation was that of joy at his escape thank god exclaimed lady margaret that you are here and have escaped the hands of the bloodthirsty murderers who have cut off so many of the king's loyal servants thank god added edith that you are here and in safety we have dreaded the worst but you are wounded and i fear we have little the means of assisting you my wounds are only sword cuts answered the young nobleman as he reposed himself on a seat the pain is not worth mentioning and i should not even feel exhausted but for the loss of blood but it was not my purpose to bring my weakness to add to your danger and distress but to relieve them if possible what can i do for you permit me he added addressing lady margaret permit me to think and act as your son my dear madam as your brother edith he pronounced the last part of the sentence with some emphasis as if he feared that the apprehension of his pretensions as a suitor might render his proffered services unacceptable to miss bellenden she was not insensible to his delicacy but there was no time for exchange of sentiments we are preparing for our defence said the old lady with great dignity my brother has taken charge of our garrison and by the grace of god we will give the rebels such a reception as they deserve how gladly said evandale would i share in the defence of the castle but in my present state i should be but a burden to you nay something worse for the knowledge that an officer of the life guards was in the castle would be sufficient to make these rogues more desperately earnest to possess themselves of it if they find it defended only by the family they may possibly march on to glasgow rather than hazard an assault and can you think so meanly of us my lord said edith with the generous burst of feeling which woman so often evinces and which becomes her so well her voice faltering through eagerness and her brow colouring with the noble warmth which dictated her language can you think so meanly of your friends as that they would permit such considerations to interfere with their sheltering and protecting you at a moment when you are unable to defend yourself and when the whole country is filled with the enemy is there a cottage in scotland whose owners would permit a valued friend to leave it in such circumstances and can you think we will allow you to go from a castle which we hold to be strong enough for our own defence lord evandale need never think of it said lady margaret i will dress his wounds myself it is all an old wife is fit for in war time but to quit the castle of tilly tudlam when the sword of the enemy is drawn to slay him the meanest trooper that ever wore the king's coat on his back should not do so much less my young lord evandale ours is not a house that ought to brook such dishonour the tower of tilly tudlam has been too much distinguished by the visit of his most sacred here she was interrupted by the entrance of the major we have taken a prisoner my dear uncle said edith a wounded prisoner and he wants to escape from us you must help us to keep him by force lord evandale exclaimed the veteran i am as much pleased as when i got my first commission claverhouse reported you were killed or missing at least i should have been slain but for a friend of yours said lord evandale speaking with some emotion 
and bending his eyes on the ground as if he wished to avoid seeing the impression that what he was about to say would make upon miss bellenden i was unhorsed and defenceless and the sword raised to dispatch me when young mr morton the prisoner for whom you interested yourself yesterday morning interposed in the most generous manner preserved my life and furnished me with the means of escaping as he ended the sentence a painful curiosity overcame his first resolution he raised his eyes to edith's face and imagined he could read in the glow of her cheek and the sparkle of her eye joy at hearing of her lover's safety and freedom and triumph at his not having been left last in the race of generosity such indeed were her feelings but they were also mingled with admiration of the ready frankness with which lord evandale had hastened to bear witness to the merit of a favoured rival and to acknowledge an obligation which in all probability he would rather have owed to any other individual in the world major bellenden who would never have observed the emotions of either party even had they been much more markedly expressed contented himself with saying since henry morton has influence with these rascals i am glad he has so exerted it but i hope he will get clear of them as soon as he can indeed i cannot doubt it i know his principles and that he detests their cant and hypocrisy i have heard him laugh a thousand times at the pedantry of that old presbyterian scoundrel poundtext who after enjoying the indulgence of the government for so many years has now upon the very first ruffle shown himself in his own proper colours and set off with three parts of his crop-eared congregation to join the host of the fanatics but how did you escape after leaving the field my lord i rode for my life as a recreant knight must answered lord evandale smiling i took the route where i thought i had least chance of meeting with any of the enemy and i found shelter for several hours you will hardly guess where at castle bracklin perhaps said lady margaret or in the house of some other loyal gentleman no madam i was repulsed under one mean pretext or another from more than one house of that description for fear of the enemy following my traces but i found refuge in the cottage of a poor widow whose husband had been shot within these three months by a party of our corps and whose two sons are at this very moment with the insurgents indeed said lady margaret bellenden and was a fanatic woman capable of such generosity but she disapproved i suppose of the tenets of her family far from it madam continued the young nobleman she was in principle a rigid recusant but she saw my danger and distress considered me as a fellow-creature and forgot that i was a cavalier and a soldier she bound my wounds and permitted me to rest upon her bed concealed me from a party of the insurgents who were seeking for stragglers supplied me with food and did not suffer me to leave my place of refuge until she had learned that i had every chance of getting to this tower without danger it was nobly done said miss bellenden and i trust you will have an opportunity of rewarding her generosity i am running up an arrear of obligation on all sides miss bellenden during these unfortunate occurrences replied lord evandale but when i can attain the means of showing my gratitude the will shall not be wanting all now joined in pressing lord evandale to relinquish his intention of leaving the castle but the argument of major bellenden proved the most effectual your presence in the castle will be most useful if not absolutely necessary my lord in order to maintain by your authority 
proper discipline among the fellows whom claverhouse has left in garrison here and who do not prove to be of the most orderly description of inmates and indeed we have the colonel's authority for that very purpose to detain any officer of his regiment who might pass this way that said lord evandale is an unanswerable argument since it shows me that my residence here may be useful even in my present disabled state for your wounds my lord said the major if my sister lady bellenden will undertake to give battle to any feverish symptom if such should appear i will answer that my old campaigner gideon pike shall dress a flesh wound with any of the incorporation of barber surgeons he had enough of practice in montrose's time for we had few regularly bred army chirurgeons as you may well suppose you agree to stay with us then my reasons for leaving the castle said lord evandale glancing a look towards edith though they evidently seemed weighty must needs give way to those which infer the power of serving you may i presume major to inquire into the means and plan of defence which you have prepared or can i attend you to examine the works it did not escape miss bellenden that lord evandale seemed much exhausted both in mind and body i think sir she said addressing the major that since lord evandale condescends to become an officer of our garrison you should begin by rendering him amenable to your authority and ordering him to his apartment that he may take some refreshment ere he enters on military discussions edith is right said the old lady you must go instantly to bed my lord and take some febrifuge which i will prepare with my own hand and my lady-in-waiting mistress martha weddle shall make some friar's chicken or something very light i would not advise wine john goodyell let the housekeeper make ready the chamber of dais lord evandale must lie down instantly pike will take off the dressings and examine the state of the wounds these are melancholy preparations madam said lord evandale as he returned thanks to lady margaret and was about to leave the hall but i must submit to your ladyship's directions and i trust that your skill will soon make me a more able defender of your castle than i am at present you must render my body serviceable as soon as you can for you have no use for my head while you have major bellenden with these words he left the apartment an excellent young man and a modest said the major none of that conceit said lady margaret that often makes young folk suppose they know better how their complaints should be treated than people that have had experience and so generous and handsome a young nobleman said jenny dennison who had entered during the latter part of this conversation and was now left alone with her mistress in the hall the major returning to his military cares and lady margaret to her medical preparations edith only answered these encomiums with a sigh but although silent she felt and knew better than any one how much they were merited by the person on whom they were bestowed jenny however failed not to follow up her blow after all it's true that my lady says there's no trusting a presbyterian they are all faithless man-sworn lounds what would have thought that young milnwood and cutty hedrig would have taken on with the rebel blackguards what do you mean by such improbable nonsense jenny said her young mistress very much displeased i can it's no pleasing for you to hear madam answered jenny heartily and it's as little pleasant for me to tell but as good ye should ken all about it soon as sign for the hall castle's ringing with it ringing with what jenny have you a mind to drive me mad answered edith impatiently just that henry morton of milnwood 
is out with the rebels and one of their chief leaders it is a falsehood said edith a most base calumny and you are very bold to dare to repeat it to me henry morton is incapable of such treachery to his king and country such cruelty to me to to all the innocent and defenceless victims i mean who must suffer in a civil war i tell you he is utterly incapable of it in every sense dear dear miss edith replied jenny still constant to her text they maun be better acquainted with young men than i am or ever wish to be that can tell precisely what they're capable or no capable of but there has been trooper tam and another child out in bonnets and grey plaids like countrymen to recon reconnoiter i think john goodiel called it and they have been among the rebels and brought back word that they had seen young milnwood mounted on one of the dragoon horses that was taken at loudon hill armed with swords and pistols like what but him and hand and glove with the foremost of them and drilling and commanding the men and cutty at the heels of him in one of sergeant bothwell's laced waistcoats and a cocket hat with a bab of blue ribbons at it for the old cause of the covenant but cutty i liked a blue ribband and a ruffled sark like any lord of the land it sets the like of him indeed jenny said her young mistress hastily it is impossible these men's report can be true my uncle has heard nothing of it at this instant because tam halliday answered the handmaiden came in just five minutes after lord evandale and when he heard his lordship was in the castle he swore the profane loon he would be damned ere he would make the report as he called it of his news to major bellenden since there was an officer of his own regiment in the garrison so he would have said nothing till lord evandale wakened the next morning only he told me about it here jenny looked a little down just to vex me about cutty po you silly girl said edith assuming some courage it is all a trick of that fellow to tease you no madam it cannot be that for john goodiel took the other dragoon he's an old hard favoured man i wotna his name into the cellar and gave him a toss of brandy to get the news out of him and he said just the same as tam halliday word for word and mr goodiel was in sick a rage that he told it all over again to us and says the whole rebellion is owing to the nonsense of my lady and the major and lord evandale that begged off young milnwood and cutty yesterday morning for that if they had suffered the country would have been quiet and troth i am muckle of that opinion myself this last commentary jenny added to her tale in resentment of her mistress's extreme and obstinate incredulity she was instantly alarmed however by the effect which her news produced upon her young lady an effect rendered doubly violent by the high church principles and prejudices in which miss bellenden had been educated her complexion became as pale as a corpse her respiration so difficult that it was on the point of altogether failing her and her limbs so incapable of supporting her that she sunk rather than sat down upon one of the seats in the hall and seemed on the eve of fainting jenny tried cold water burnt feathers cutting of laces and all the other remedies usual in hysterical cases but without any immediate effect god forgive me what have i done said the repentant filled the chamber i wish my tongue had been cut it out what would have thought of her taken on that way and all for a young lad oh miss edith dear miss edith hold your heart up about it 
it's maybe no true for all that i have said oh i wish my mouth had been blistered all body tells me my tongue will do me a mischief some day what if my lady comes or the major and she's sitting in the throne too that nobody has sat in since that weary morning the king was here oh what will i do oh what will become of us while jenny dennison thus lamented herself and her mistress edith slowly returned from the paroxysm into which she had been thrown by this unexpected intelligence if he had been unfortunate she said i never would have deserted him i never did so even when there was danger and disgrace in pleading his cause if he had died i would have mourned him if he had been unfaithful i would have forgiven him but a rebel to his king a traitor to his country the associate and colleague of cutthroats and common stabbers the persecutor of all that is noble the professed and blasphemous enemy of all that is sacred i will tear him from my heart if my life-blood should ebb in the effort she wiped her eyes and rose hastily from the great chair or throne as lady margaret used to call it while the terrified damsel hastened to shake up the cushion and efface the appearance of any one having occupied that sacred seat although king charles himself considering the youth and beauty as well as the affliction of the momentary usurper of his hallowed chair would probably have thought very little of the profanation she then hastened officiously to press her support on edith as she paced the hall apparently in deep meditation take my arm madam better just take my arm sorrow mon have its vent and doubtless no jenny said edith with firmness you have seen my weakness and you shall see my strength but ye leaned on me the other morning miss edith when ye were so sore grieved misplaced and erring affection may require support jenny duty can support itself yet i will do nothing rashly i will be aware of the reasons of his conduct and then cast him off for ever was the firm and determined answer of her young lady overawed by a manner of which she could neither conceive the motive nor estimate the merit jenny muttered between her teeth odd when the first flight's o'er miss edith takes it as easy as i do and muckle easier and i'm sure i never cared half so muckle about cuddy hedrig as she did about young milnwood for by that it's maybe as well to have a friend on both sides for if the whigs should come to take the castle as it's like they may when there's so little victual and the dragoons wasting what's of it oh in that case milnwood and cuddy would have the upper hand and their friendship would be worth siller i was thinking so this morning or i heard the news with this consolatory reflection the damsel went about her usual occupations leaving her mistress to school her mind as she best might for eradicating the sentiments which she had hitherto entertained towards henry morton chapter four of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah once more into the breach dear friends once more henry v on the evening of this day all the information which they could procure led them to expect that the insurgent army would be with early dawn on their march against tilly tudlam lord evandale's wounds had been examined by pike who reported them in a very promising state they were numerous but none of any consequence and the loss of blood as much perhaps as the boasted specific of lady margaret had prevented any tendency to fever so that notwithstanding he felt some pain and great weakness 
the patient maintained that he was able to creep about with the assistance of a stick in these circumstances he refused to be confined to his apartment both that he might encourage the soldiers by his presence and suggest any necessary addition to the plan of defence which the major might be supposed to have arranged upon something of an antiquated fashion of warfare lord evandale was well qualified to give advice on such subjects having served during his early youth both in france and in the low countries there was little or no occasion however for altering the preparations already made and excepting on the article of provisions there seemed no reason to fear for the defence of so strong a place against such assailants as those by whom it was threatened with the peep of day lord evandale and major bellenden were on the battlements again viewing and reviewing the state of their preparations and anxiously expecting the approach of the enemy i ought to observe that the report of the spies had now been regularly made and received but the major treated the report that morton was in arms against the government with the most scornful incredulity i know the lad better was the only reply he deigned to make the fellows have not dared to venture near enough and have been deceived by some fanciful resemblance or have picked up some story i differ from you major answered lord evandale i think you will see that young gentleman at the head of the insurgents and though i shall be heartily sorry for it i shall not be greatly surprised you are as bad as claverhouse said the major who contended yesterday morning down my very throat that this young fellow who is as high-spirited and gentlemanlike a boy as i have ever known wanted but an opportunity to place himself at the head of the rebels and considering the usage which he has received and the suspicions under which he lies said lord evandale what other course is open to him for my own part i should hardly know whether he deserved most blame or pity blame my lord pity echoed the major astonished at hearing such sentiments he would deserve to be hanged that's all and were he my own son i should see him strung up with pleasure blame indeed but your lordship cannot think as you are pleased to speak i give you my honour major bellenden that i have been for some time of opinion that our politicians and prelates have driven matters to a painful extremity in this country and have alienated by violence of various kinds not only the lower classes but all those in the upper ranks whom strong party feeling or a desire of court interest does not attach to their standard i am no politician answered the major and i do not understand nice distinctions my sword is the king's and when he commands i draw it in his cause i trust replied the young lord you will not find me more backward than yourself though i heartily wish that the enemy were foreigners it is however no time to debate that matter for yonder they come and we must defend ourselves as well as we can as lord evandale spoke the van of the insurgents began to make their appearance on the road which crossed the top of the hill and thence descended opposite to the tower they did not however move downwards as if aware that in doing so their columns would be exposed to the fire of the artillery of the place but their numbers which at first seemed few appeared presently so to deepen and concentrate themselves that judging of the masses which occupied the road behind the hill from the closeness of the front which they presented on the top of it 
their force appeared very considerable there was a pause of anxiety on both sides and while the unsteady ranks of the covenanters were agitated as if by pressure behind or uncertainty as to their next movement their arms picturesque from their variety glanced in the morning sun whose beams were reflected from a grove of pikes muskets halberds and battle-axes the armed mass occupied for a few minutes this fluctuating position until three or four horsemen who seemed to be leaders advanced from the front and occupied the height a little nearer to the castle john goodyell who was not without some skill as an artilleryman brought a gun to bear on this detached group i'll flee the falcon so the small cannon was called i'll flee the falcon whenever your honour gives command my surdy she'll ruffle their feathers for them the major looked at lord evandale stay a moment said the young nobleman they send us a flag of truce in fact one of the horsemen at that moment dismounted and displaying a white cloth on a pike moved forward towards the tower while the major and lord evandale descended from the battlement of the main fortress advanced to meet him as far as the barricade judging it unwise to admit him within the precincts which they designed to defend at the same time that the ambassador set forth the group of horsemen as if they had anticipated the preparations of john goodyell for their annoyance withdrew from the advance station which they had occupied and fell back to the main body the envoy of the covenanters to judge by his mien and manner seemed fully imbued with that spiritual pride which distinguished his sect his features were drawn up to a contemptuous primness and his half-shut eyes seemed to scorn to look upon the terrestrial objects around while at every solemn stride his toes were pointed outwards with an air that appeared to despise the ground on which they trod lord evandale could not suppress a smile at this singular figure did you ever said he to major bellenden see such an absurd automaton one would swear it moves upon springs can it speak think you oh ay said the major that seems to be one of my old acquaintance a genuine puritan of the right pharisaical leaven stay he coughs and hems he is about to summon the castle with the butt-end of a sermon instead of a parley on the trumpet the veteran who in his day had had many an opportunity to become acquainted with the manners of these religionists was not far mistaken in his conjecture only that instead of a prose exordium the laird of langkell for it was no less a personage uplifted with a stentorian voice a verse of the twenty-fourth psalm ye gates lift up your heads ye doors doors that do last for aye be lifted up i told you so said the major to evandale and then presented himself at the entrance of the barricade demanding to know for what purpose or intent he made that doleful noise like a hog in a high wind beneath the gates of the castle i come replied the ambassador in a high and shrill voice and without any of the usual salutations or deferences i come from the godly army of the solemn league and covenant to speak with two carnal malignants william maxwell called lord evandale and miles bellenden of charnwood and what have you to say to miles bellenden and lord evandale answered the major are you the parties said the laird of langkell in the same sharp conceited disrespectful tone of voice even so for fault of better said the major then there is the public summons said the envoy 
putting a paper into lord evandale's hand and there is a private letter for miles bellenden from a godly youth who is honoured with leading a part of our host read them quickly and god give you grace to fructify by the contents though it is muckle to be doubted the summons ran thus we the named and constituted leaders of the gentlemen ministers and others presently in arms for the cause of liberty and true religion do warn and summon william lord evandale and miles bellenden of charnwood and others presently in arms and keeping garrison in the tower of tilly tudlam to surrender the said tower upon fair conditions of quarter and license to depart with bag and baggage otherwise to suffer such extremity of fire and sword as belong by the laws of war to those who hold out an untenable post and so may god defend his own good cause this summons was signed by john balfour of burley as quartermaster-general of the army of the covenant for himself and in name of the other leaders the letter to major bellenden was from henry morton it was couched in the following language i have taken a step my venerable friend which among many painful consequences will i am afraid incur your very decided disapprobation but i have taken my resolution in honour and good faith and with the full approval of my own conscience i can no longer submit to have my own rights and those of my fellow-subjects trampled upon our freedom violated our persons insulted and our blood spilt without just cause or legal trial providence through the violence of the oppressors themselves seems now to have opened a way of deliverance from this intolerable tyranny and i do not hold him deserving of the name and rights of a free man who thinking as i do shall withhold his arm from the cause of his country but god who knows my heart be my witness that i do not share the angry or violent passions of the oppressed and harassed sufferers with whom i am now acting my most earnest and anxious desire is to see this unnatural war brought to a speedy end by the union of the good wise and moderate of all parties and a peace restored which without injury to the king's constitutional rights may substitute the authority of equal laws to that of military violence and permitting to all men to worship god according to their own consciences may subdue fanatical enthusiasm by reason and mildness instead of driving it to frenzy by persecution and intolerance with these sentiments you may conceive with what pain i appear in arms before the house of your venerable relative which we understand you propose to hold out against us permit me to press upon you the assurance that such a measure will only lead to the effusion of blood that if repulsed in the assault we are yet strong enough to invest the place and reduce it by hunger being aware of your indifferent preparations to sustain a protracted siege it would grieve me to the heart to think what would be the sufferings in such a case and upon whom they would chiefly fall do not suppose my respected friend that i would propose to you any terms which could compromise the high and honourable character which you have so deservedly won and so long borne if the regular soldiers to whom i will ensure a safe retreat are dismissed from the place i trust no more will be required than your parole to remain neuter during this unhappy contest and i will take care that lady margaret's property as well as yours shall be duly respected and no garrison intruded upon you i could say much in favour of this proposal but i fear as i must in the present instance appear criminal in your eyes 
good arguments would lose their influence when coming from an unwelcome quarter i will therefore break off with assuring you that whatever your sentiments may be hereafter towards me my sense of gratitude to you can never be diminished or erased and it would be the happiest moment of my life that should give me more effectual means than mere words to assure you of it therefore although in the first moment of resentment you may reject the proposal i make to you let not that prevent you from resuming the topic if future events should render it more acceptable for whenever or howsoever i can be of service to you it will always afford the greatest satisfaction to henry morton having read this long letter with the most marked indignation major bellenden put it into the hands of lord evandale i would not have believed this he said of henry morton if half mankind had sworn it the ungrateful rebellious traitor rebellious in cold blood and without even the pretext of enthusiasm that warms the liver of such a crack-brained fop as our friend the envoy there but i should have remembered he was a presbyterian i ought to have been aware that i was nursing a wolf-cub whose diabolical nature would make him tear and snatch at me on the first opportunity were st paul on earth again and a presbyterian he would be a rebel in three months it is in the very blood of them well said lord evandale i will be the last to recommend surrender but if our provisions fail and we receive no relief from edinburgh or glasgow i think we ought to avail ourselves of this opening to get the ladies at least safe out of the castle they will endure all ere they would accept the protection of such a smooth-tongued hypocrite answered the major indignantly i would renounce them for relatives were it otherwise but let us dismiss the worthy ambassador my friend he said turning to langkale tell your leaders and the mob they have gathered yonder that if they have not a particular opinion of the hardness of their own skulls i would advise them to beware how they knock them against these old walls and let them send no more flags of truce or we will hang up the messenger in retaliation of the murder of cornet graham with this answer the ambassador returned to those by whom he had been sent he had no sooner reached the main body than a murmur was heard amongst the multitude and there was raised in front of their ranks an ample red flag the borders of which were edged with blue as the signal of war and defiance spread out its large folds upon the morning wind the ancient banner of lady margaret's family together with the royal ensign were immediately hoisted on the walls of the tower and at the same time a round of artillery was discharged against the foremost ranks of the insurgents by which they sustained some loss their leaders instantly withdrew them to the shelter of the brow of the hill i think said john goodyell while he busied himself in recharging his guns they have found the falcon's nab a bit over hard for them it's no for naught that the hawk whistles but as he uttered these words the ridge was once more crowded with the ranks of the enemy a general discharge of their firearms was directed against the defenders upon the battlements under cover of the smoke a column of picked men rushed down the road with determined courage and sustaining with firmness a heavy fire from the garrison they forced their way in spite of opposition to the first barricade by which the avenue was defended they were led on by balfour in person who displayed courage equal to his enthusiasm and in spite of every opposition forced the barricade killing and wounding several of the defenders and compelling the rest 
to retreat to their second position the precautions however of major bellenden rendered this success unavailing for no sooner were the covenanters in possession of the post than a close and destructive fire was poured into it from the castle and from those stations which commanded it in the rear having no means of protecting themselves from this fire or of returning it with effect against men who were under cover of their barricades and defences the covenanters were obliged to retreat but not until they had with their axes destroyed the stockade so as to render it impossible for the defenders to reoccupy it balfour was the last man that retired he even remained for a short space almost alone with an axe in his hand labouring like a pioneer amid the storm of balls many of which were specially aimed against him the retreat of the party he commanded was not effected without heavy loss and served as a severe lesson concerning the local advantages possessed by the garrison the next attack of the covenanters was made with more caution a strong party of marksmen many of them competitors at the game of the popinjay under the command of henry morton glided through the woods where they afforded them the best shelter and avoiding the open road endeavoured by forcing their way through the bushes and trees and up the rocks which surrounded it on either side to gain a position from which without being exposed in an intolerable degree they might annoy the flank of the second barricade while it was menaced in front by a second attack from burley the besieged saw the danger of this movement and endeavoured to impede the approach of the marksmen by firing upon them at every point where they showed themselves the assailants on the other hand displayed great coolness spirit and judgment in the manner in which they approached the defences this was in a great measure to be ascribed to the steady and adroit manner in which they were conducted by their youthful leader who showed as much skill in protecting his own followers as spirit in annoying the enemy he repeatedly enjoined his marksmen to direct their aim chiefly upon the redcoats and to save the others engaged in the defence of the castle and above all to spare the life of the old major whose anxiety made him more than once expose himself in a manner that without such generosity on the part of the enemy might have proved fatal a dropping fire of musketry now glanced from every part of the precipitous mount on which the castle was founded from bush to bush from crag to crag from tree to tree the marksmen continued to advance availing themselves of branches and roots to assist their ascent and contending at once with the disadvantages of the ground and the fire of the enemy at length they got so high on the ascent that several of them possessed an opportunity of firing into the barricade against the defenders who then lay exposed to their aim and burley profiting by the confusion of the moment moved forward to the attack in front his onset was made with the same desperation and fury as before and met with less resistance the defenders being alarmed at the progress which the sharpshooters had made in turning the flank of their position determined to improve his advantage burley with his axe in his hand pursued the party whom he had dislodged even to the third and last barricade and entered it along with them kill kill down with the enemies of god and his people no quarter the castle is ours were the cries by which he animated his friends the most undaunted of whom followed him close whilst the others with axes spades and other implements threw up earth cut down trees hastily labouring to establish 
such a defensive cover in the rear of the second barricade as might enable them to retain possession of it in case the castle was not carried by this coup de main lord evandale could no longer restrain his impatience he charged with a few soldiers who had been kept in reserve in the courtyard of the castle and although his arm was in a sling encouraged them by voice and gesture to assist their companions who were engaged with burley the combat now assumed an air of desperation the narrow road was crowded with the followers of burley who pressed forward to support their companions the soldiers animated by the voice and presence of lord evandale fought with fury their small numbers being in some measure compensated by their greater skill and by their possessing the upper ground which they defended desperately with pikes and halberds as well as with the butt of the carabins and their broadswords those within the castle endeavoured to assist their companions whenever they could so level their guns as to fire upon the enemy without endangering their friends the sharpshooters dispersed around were firing incessantly on each object that was exposed upon the battlement the castle was enveloped with smoke and the rocks rang to the cries of the combatants in the midst of this scene of confusion a singular accident had nearly given the besiegers possession of the fortress cuddy hedrig who had advanced among the marksmen being well acquainted with every rock and bush in the vicinity of the castle where he had so often gathered nuts with jenny dennison was enabled by such local knowledge to advance farther and with less danger than most of his companions excepting some three or four who had followed him close now cuddy though a brave enough fellow upon the whole was by no means fond of danger either for its own sake or for that of the glory which attends it in his advance therefore he had not as the phrase goes taken the bull by the horns or advanced in front of the enemy's fire on the contrary he had edged gradually away from the scene of action and turning his line of ascent rather to the left had pursued it until it brought him under a front of the castle different from that before which the parties were engaged and to which the defenders had given no attention trusting to the steepness of the precipice there was however on this point a certain window belonging to a certain pantry and communicating with a certain yew tree which grew out of a steep cleft of the rock being the very pass through which goose gibby was smuggled out of the castle in order to carry edith's express to charnwood and which had probably in its day been used for other contraband purposes cuddy resting upon the butt of his gun and looking up at this window observed to one of his companions there's a place i ken well many a time i have helped jenny dennison out of the winnock for by creeping in whiles myself to get some daffin at even after the plough was loosed and what's to hinder us to creep in just now said the other who was a smart enterprising young fellow there's no muckle to hinder us and that were all answered cuddy but what were we to do next we'll take the castle cried the other there are five or six of us and all the soldiers are engaged at the gate come away with you then said cuddy but mind devil a finger ye maun lay on lady margaret or miss edith or the old major or a boon all on jenny dennison or anybody but the soldiers cut and quarter among them as ye like i care na ay ay said the other let us once in and we will make our own terms with them all gingerly and as if treading upon eggs cuddy began to ascend the well-known pass not very willingly 
for besides that he was something apprehensive of the reception he might meet with in the inside his conscience insisted that he was making but a shabby requital for lady margaret's former favours and protection he got up however into the yew-tree followed by his companions one after another the window was small and had been secured by stanchions of iron but these had been long worn away by time or forced out by the domestics to possess a free passage for their own occasional convenience entrance was therefore easy providing there was no one in the pantry a point which cuddy endeavoured to discover before he made the final and perilous step while his companions therefore were urging and threatening him behind and he was hesitating and stretching his neck to look into the apartment his head became visible to jenny dennison who had ensconced herself in said pantry as the safest place in which to wait the issue of the assault so soon as this object of terror caught her eye she set up a hysteric scream flew to the adjacent kitchen and in the desperate agony of fear seized on a pot of calbros which she herself had hung on the fire before the combat began having promised to tam holliday to prepare his breakfast for him thus burdened she returned to the window of the pantry and still exclaiming murder murder we are all harried and ravished the castle's taken take it among ye she discharged the whole scalding contents of the pot accompanied with a dismal yell upon the person of the unfortunate cuddy however welcome the mess might have been if cuddy and it had become acquainted in a regular manner the effects as administered by jenny would probably have cured him of soldiering for ever had he been looking upwards when it was thrown upon him but fortunately for our man of war he had taken the alarm upon jenny's first scream and was in the act of looking down expostulating with his comrades who impeded the retreat which he was anxious to commence so that the steel cap and buff coat which formerly belonged to sergeant bothwell being garments of an excellent endurance protected his person against the greater part of the scalding bros enough however reached him to annoy him severely so that in the pain and surprise he jumped hastily out of the tree oversetting his followers to the manifest danger of their limbs and without listening to arguments entreaties or authority made the best of his way by the most safe road to the main body of the army whereunto he belonged and could neither by threats nor persuasion be prevailed upon to return to the attack as for jenny when she had thus conferred upon one admirer's outward man the viands which her fair hands had so lately been in the act of preparing for the stomach of another she continued her song of alarm running a screaming division upon all those crimes which the lawyers call the four pleas of the crown namely murder fire rape and robbery these hideous exclamations gave so much alarm and created such confusion within the castle that major bellenden and lord evandale judged it best to draw off from the conflict without the gates and abandoning to the enemy all the exterior defences of the avenue confined themselves to the castle itself for fear of its being surprised on some unguarded point their retreat was unmolested for the panic of cuddy and his companions had occasioned nearly as much confusion on the side of the besiegers as the screams of jenny had caused to the defenders there was no attempt on either side to renew the action that day the insurgents had suffered most severely and from the difficulty which they had experienced in carrying the barricadoed positions without the precincts of the castle 
they could have but little hope of storming the place itself on the other hand the situation of the besieged was dispiriting and gloomy in the skirmishing they had lost two or three men and had several wounded and though their loss was in proportion greatly less than that of the enemy who had left twenty men dead on the place yet their small number could much worse spare it while the desperate attacks of the opposite party plainly showed how serious the leaders were in the purpose of reducing the place and how well seconded by the zeal of their followers but especially the garrison had to fear for hunger in case blockade should be resorted to as the means of reducing them the major's directions had been imperfectly obeyed in regard to laying in provisions and the dragoons in spite of all warning and authority were likely to be wasteful in using them it was therefore with a heavy heart that major bellenden gave directions for guarding the window through which the castle had so nearly been surprised as well as all others which offered the most remote facility for such an enterprise chapter five of old mortality by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah the king hath drawn the special head of all the land together henry the fourth part two the leaders of the presbyterian army had a serious consultation upon the evening of the day in which they had made the attack on tilly tudlam they could not but observe that their followers were disheartened by the loss which they had sustained and which as usual in such cases had fallen upon the bravest and most forward it was to be feared that if they were suffered to exhaust their zeal and efforts in an object so secondary as the capture of this petty fort their numbers would melt away by degrees and they would lose all the advantages arising out of the present unprepared state of the government moved by these arguments it was agreed that the main body of the army should march against glasgow and dislodge the soldiers who were lying in that town the council nominated henry morton with others to this last service and appointed burleigh to the command of a chosen body of five hundred men who were to remain behind for the purpose of blockading the tower of tilly tudlam morton testified the greatest repugnance to this arrangement he had the strongest personal motives he said for desiring to remain near tilly tudlam and if the management of the siege were committed to him he had little doubt but that he would bring it to such an accommodation as without being rigorous to the besieged would fully answer the purpose of the besiegers burley readily guessed the cause of his young colleague's reluctance to move with the army for interested as he was in appreciating the characters with whom he had to deal he had contrived through the simplicity of cuddy and the enthusiasm of old maz to get much information concerning morton's relations with the family of tilly tudlam he therefore took the advantage of pound texts arising to speak to business as he said for some short space of time which burley rightly interpreted to mean an hour at the very least and seized that moment to withdraw morton from the hearing of their colleagues and to hold the following argument with him thou art unwise henry morton to desire to sacrifice this holy cause to thy friendship for an uncircumcised philistine or thy last for a moabitish woman i neither understand your meaning mr balfour nor relish your allusions replied morton indignantly and i know no reason you have to bring so gross a charge or to use such uncivil language confess however the truth said balfour 
and own that there are those within yon dark tower over whom thou wouldst rather be watching like a mother over her little ones than thou wouldst bear the banner of the church of scotland over the necks of her enemies if you mean that i would willingly terminate this war without any bloody victory and that i am more anxious to do this than to acquire any personal fame or power you may be replied morton perfectly right and not wholly wrong answered burley in deeming that thou wouldst not exclude from so general a pacification thy friends in the garrison of tilly tudlam certainly replied morton i am too much obliged to major bellenden not to wish to be of service to him as far as the interest of the cause i have espoused will permit i never made a secret of my regard for him i am aware of that said burley but if thou hadst concealed it i should nevertheless have found out thy riddle now hearken to my words this miles bellenden hath means to subsist his garrison for a month this is not the case answered morton we know his stores are hardly equal to a week's consumption ay but continued burley i have since had proof of the strongest nature that such a report was spread in the garrison by that wily and grey-headed malignant partly to prevail on the soldiers to permit to a diminution of their daily food partly to detain us before the walls of his fortress until the sword should be whetted to smite and destroy us and why was not the evidence of this laid before the council of war said morton to what purpose said balfour why need we undeceive kettledrummel macbriar poundtext and langkill upon such a point thyself must own that whatever is told to them escapes to the host out of the mouth of the preachers at their next holding forth they are already discouraged by the thoughts of lying before the fort a week what would be the consequence were they ordered to prepare for the leaguer of a month but why conceal it then from me or why tell it me now and above all what proofs have you got of the fact continued morton there are many proofs replied burley and he put into his hands a number of requisitions sent forth by major bellenden with receipts on the back to various proprietors for cattle corn meal to such an amount that the sum total seemed to exclude the possibility of the garrison being soon distressed for provisions but burley did not inform morton of a fact which he himself knew full well namely that most of these provisions never reached the garrison owing to the rapacity of the dragoons sent to collect them who readily sold to one man what they took from another and abused the major's press for stores pretty much as sir john falstaff did that of the king for men and now continued balfour observing that he had made the desired impression i have only to say that i concealed this from thee no longer than it was concealed from myself for i have only received these papers this morning and i tell it unto thee now that thou mayest go on thy way rejoicing and work the great work willingly at glasgow being assured that no evil can befall thy friends in the malignant party since their fort is abundantly victualled and i possess not numbers sufficient to do more against them than to prevent their sallying forth and why continued morton who felt an inexpressible reluctance to acquiesce in balfour's reasoning why not permit me to remain in the command of this smaller party and march forward yourself to glasgow it is the more honourable charge and therefore young man answered burley have i laboured that it should be committed to the son of silas morton i am waxing old 
and this grey head has had enough of honour where it could be gathered by danger i speak not of the frothy bubble which men call earthly fame but the honour belonging to him that doth not the work negligently but thy career is yet to run thou hast to vindicate the high trust which has been bestowed on thee through my assurance that it was dearly well merited at loudon hill thou wert a captive and at the last assault it was thy part to fight under cover whilst i led the more open and dangerous attack and shouldst thou now remain before these walls when there is active service elsewhere trust me that men will say that the son of silas morton hath fallen away from the paths of his father stung by this last observation to which as a gentleman and soldier he could offer no suitable reply morton hastily acquiesced in the proposed arrangement yet he was unable to divest himself of certain feelings of distrust which he involuntarily attached to the quarter from which he received this information mr balfour he said let us distinctly understand each other you have thought it worth your while to bestow particular attention upon my private affairs and personal attachments be so good as to understand that i am as constant to them as to my political principles it is possible that during my absence you may possess the power of soothing or of wounding those feelings be assured that whatever may be the consequences to the issue of our present adventure my eternal gratitude or my persevering resentment will attend the line of conduct you may adopt on such an occasion and however young and inexperienced i am i have no doubt of finding friends to assist me in expressing my sentiments in either case if there be a threat implied in that denunciation replied burleigh coldly and haughtily it had better have been spared i know how to value the regard of my friends and despise from my soul the threats of my enemies but i will not take occasion of offence whatever happens here in your absence shall be managed with as much deference to your wishes as the duty i owe to a higher power can possibly permit with this qualified promise morton was obliged to rest satisfied our defeat will relieve the garrison said he internally ere they can be reduced to surrender at discretion and in case of victory i already see from the numbers of the moderate party that i shall have a voice as powerful as burleigh's in determining the use which shall be made of it he therefore followed balfour to the council where they found kettledrummel adding to his lastly a few words of practical application when these were expended morton testified his willingness to accompany the main body of the army which was destined to drive the regular troops from glasgow his companions in command were named and the whole received a strengthening exhortation from the preachers who were present next morning at break of day the insurgent army broke up from their encampment and marched towards glasgow it is not our intention to detail at length incidents which may be found in the history of the period it is sufficient to say that claverhouse and lord ross learning the superior force which was directed against them entrenched or rather barricadoed themselves in the centre of the city where the town-house and old jail were situated with the determination to stand the assault of the insurgents rather than to abandon the capital of the west of scotland the presbyterians made their attack in two bodies one of which penetrated into the city in the line of the college and cathedral church while the other marched up the gallow gate or principal access from the southeast both divisions were led by men of resolution and behaved with great spirit but the advantages of military skill and situation 
were too great for their undisciplined valor ross and claverhouse had carefully disposed parties of their soldiers in houses at the heads of the streets and in the entrances of closes as they are called or lanes besides those who were entrenched behind breastworks which reached across the streets the assailants found their ranks thinned by a fire from invisible opponents which they had no means of returning with effect it was in vain that morton and other leaders exposed their persons with the utmost gallantry and endeavoured to bring their antagonists to a close action their followers shrunk from them in every direction and yet though henry morton was one of the very last to retire and exerted himself in bringing up the rear maintaining order in the retreat and checking every attempt which the enemy made to improve the advantage they had gained by the repulse he had still the mortification to hear many of those in his ranks muttering to each other that this came of trusting to latitudinarian boys and that had honest faithful burley led the attack as he did that of the barricades of tillytudlam the issue would have been as different as might be it was with burning resentment that morton heard these reflections thrown out by the very men who had soonest exhibited signs of discouragement the unjust reproach however had the effect of firing his emulation and making him sensible that engaged as he was in a perilous cause it was absolutely necessary that he should conquer or die i have no retreat he said to himself all shall allow even major bellenden even edith that in courage at least the rebel morton was not inferior to his father the condition of the army after the repulse was so undisciplined and in such disorganization that the leaders thought it prudent to draw off some miles from the city to gain time for reducing them once more into such order as they were capable of adopting recruits in the meanwhile came fast in more moved by the extreme hardships of their own condition and encouraged by the advantage obtained at loudon hill than deterred by the last unfortunate enterprise many of these attached themselves particularly to morton's division he had however the mortification to see that his unpopularity among the more intolerant part of the covenanters increased rapidly the prudence beyond his years which he exhibited in improving the discipline and arrangement of his followers they termed a trusting in the arm of flesh and his avowed tolerance for those of religious sentiments and observances different from his own obtained him most unjustly the name of gallio who cared for none of those things what was worse than these misconceptions the mob of the insurgents always loudest in applause of those who push political or religious opinions to extremity and disgusted with such as endeavour to reduce them to the yoke of discipline preferred avowedly the more zealous leaders in whose ranks enthusiasm in the cause supplied the want of good order and military subjection to the restraints which morton endeavoured to bring them under in short while bearing the principal burden of command for his colleagues willingly relinquished in his favour every thing that was troublesome and obnoxious in the office of general morton found himself without that authority which alone could render his regulations effectual yet notwithstanding these obstacles he had during the course of a few days laboured so hard to introduce some degree of discipline into the army that he thought he might hazard a second attack upon glasgow with every prospect of success it cannot be doubted that morton's anxiety to measure himself with colonel graham of claverhouse at whose hands he had sustained such injury had its share in giving motive to his uncommon exertions but claverhouse disappointed his hopes 
for satisfied with having the advantage in repulsing the first attack upon glasgow he determined that he would not with the handful of troops under his command await a second assault from the insurgents with more numerous and better disciplined forces than had supported their first enterprise he therefore evacuated the place and marched at the head of his troops towards edinburgh the insurgents of course entered glasgow without resistance and without morton having the opportunity which he so deeply coveted of again encountering claverhouse personally but although he had not an opportunity of wiping away the disgrace which had befallen his division of the army of the covenant the retreat of claverhouse and the possession of glasgow tended greatly to animate the insurgent army and to increase its numbers the necessity of appointing new officers of organizing new regiments and squadrons of making them acquainted with at least the most necessary points of military discipline were labors which by universal consent seemed to be devolved upon henry morton and which he the more readily undertook because his father had made him acquainted with the theory of the military art and because he plainly saw that unless he took this ungracious but absolutely necessary labor it was vain to expect any other to engage in it in the meanwhile fortune appeared to favor the enterprise of the insurgents more than the most sanguine durst have expected the privy council of scotland astonished at the extent of resistance which their arbitrary measures had provoked seemed stupefied with terror and incapable of taking active steps to subdue the resentment which these measures had excited there were but very few troops in scotland and these they drew towards edinburgh as if to form an army for protection of the metropolis the feudal array of the crown vassals in the various counties was ordered to take the field and render to the king the military service due for their fiefs but the summons was very slackly obeyed the quarrel was not generally popular among the gentry and even those who were not unwilling themselves to have taken arms were deterred by the repugnance of their wives mothers and sisters to their engaging in such a cause meanwhile the inadequacy of the scottish government to provide for their own defence or to put down a rebellion of which the commencement seemed so trifling excited at the english court doubts at once of their capacity and of the prudence of the severities they had exerted against the oppressed presbyterians it was therefore resolved to nominate to the command of the army of scotland the unfortunate duke of monmouth who had by marriage a great interest large estate and a numerous following as it was called in the southern parts of that kingdom the military skill which he had displayed on different occasions abroad was supposed more than adequate to subdue the insurgents in the field while it was expected that his mild temper and the favorable disposition which he showed to presbyterians in general might soften men's minds and tend to reconcile them to the government the duke was therefore invested with a commission containing high powers for settling the distracted affairs of scotland and dispatched from london with strong succors to take the principal military command in that country chapter six of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah i am bound to bothwell hill where i mon either do or die old ballad there was now a pause in the military movements on both sides the government seemed contented to prevent the rebels advancing towards the capital while the insurgents were intent upon augmenting and strengthening their forces for this purpose they established a sort of encampment 
in the park belonging to the ducal residence at hamilton a centrical situation for receiving their recruits and where they were secured from any sudden attack by having the clyde a deep and rapid river in front of their position which was only passable by a long and narrow bridge near the castle and village of bothwell morton remained here for about a fortnight after the attack on glasgow actively engaged in his military duties he had received more than one communication from burley but they only stated in general that the castle of tilly tudlam continued to hold out impatient of suspense upon this most interesting subject he at length intimated to his colleagues in command his desire or rather his intention for he saw no reason why he should not assume a license which was taken by every one else in this disorderly army to go to milnwood for a day or two to arrange some private affairs of consequence the proposal was by no means approved of for the military council of the insurgents were sufficiently sensible of the value of his services to fear to lose them and felt somewhat conscious of their own inability to supply his place they could not however pretend to dictate to him laws more rigid than they submitted to themselves and he was suffered to depart on his journey without any direct objection being stated the rev mr poundtext took the same opportunity to pay a visit to his own residence in the neighbourhood of milnwood and favoured morton with his company on the journey as the country was chiefly friendly to their cause and in possession of their detached parties excepting here and there the stronghold of some old cavaliering baron they travelled without any other attendant than the faithful cuddy it was near sunset when they reached milnwood where poundtext bid adieu to his companions and travelled forward alone to his own man's which was situated half a mile's march beyond tilly tudlam when morton was left alone to his own reflections with what a complication of feelings did he review the woods banks and fields that had been familiar to him his character as well as his habits thoughts and occupations had been entirely changed within the space of little more than a fortnight and twenty days seemed to have done upon him the work of as many years a mild romantic gentle-tempered youth bred up in dependence and stooping patiently to the control of a sordid and tyrannical relation had suddenly by the rod of oppression and the spur of injured feeling been compelled to stand forth a leader of armed men was earnestly engaged in affairs of a public nature had friends to animate and enemies to contend with and felt his individual fate bound up in that of a national insurrection and revolution it seemed as if he had at once experienced a transition from the romantic dreams of youth to the labours and cares of active manhood all that had formerly interested him was obliterated from his memory excepting only his attachment to edith and even his love seemed to have assumed a character more manly and disinterested as it had become mingled and contrasted with other duties and feelings as he revolved the particulars of this sudden change the circumstances in which it originated and the possible consequences of his present career the thrill of natural anxiety which passed along his mind was immediately banished by a glow of generous and high-spirited confidence i shall fall young he said if fall i must my motives misconstrued and my actions condemned by those whose approbation is dearest to me but the sword of liberty and patriotism is in my hand and i will neither fall meanly nor unavenged 
they may expose my body and give it my limbs but other days will come when the sentence of infamy will recoil against those who may pronounce it and that heaven whose name is so often profaned during this unnatural war will bear witness to the purity of the motives by which i have been guided upon approaching milnwood henry's knock upon the gate no longer intimated the conscious timidity of a stripling who has been out of bounds but the confidence of a man in full possession of his own rights and master of his own actions bold free and decided the door was cautiously opened by his old acquaintance mrs ellison wilson who started back when she saw the steel cap and nodding plume of the martial visitor where is my uncle ellison said morton smiling at her alarm lord sake mr harry is this you returned the old lady in troth ye guard my heart loop to my very mouth but it canna be your own self for ye look taller and more manly like than ye used to do it is however my own self said henry sighing and smiling at the same time i believe this dress may make me look taller and these times ally make men out of boys sad times indeed echoed the old woman and oh that you should be endangered with them but what can help it ye were ill enough guided and as i tell your uncle if ye tread on a worm it will turn you were always my advocate ally he said and the housekeeper no longer resented the familiar epithet and would let no one blame me but yourself i am aware of that where is my uncle in edinburgh replied ellison the honest man thought it was best to gang and sit by the chimney when the reek rays a vexed man he's been and a feared but ye can the laird as well as i do i hope he has suffered nothing in health said henry nothing to speak of answered the housekeeper nor in goods neither we fended as well as we could and though the troopers of tilly tudlam took the red cow and old hacky ye'll mind them well yet they sold us a good bargain of four they were driving to the castle sold you a bargain said morton how do you mean oh they came out to gather marts for the garrison answered the housekeeper but they just fell to their old trade and raid through the country cooping and selling all that they got like so many west country drovers my sturdy major bellenden was laird of the least share of what they lifted though it was taken in his name then said morton hastily the garrison must be straitened for provisions stressed enough replied ally there's little doubt of that a light instantly glanced on morton's mind burley must have deceived me craft as well as cruelty is permitted by his creed such was his inward thought he said aloud i cannot stay mrs wilson i must go forward directly but oh bide to eat a mouthful entreated the affectionate housekeeper and i'll make it ready for you as i used to do before these sad days it is impossible answered morton cuddy get our horses ready they're just eating their corn answered the attendant cuddy exclaimed ally what guard ye bring that ill-fared unlucky loon along with ye it was him and his randy mother began all the mischief in this house tut tut replied cuddy ye should forget and forgive mistress mithers in glasgow with her titty and shall plague ye no more and i'm the captain's wally now and i keep him tighter in thack and rape than ever ye did saw ye him ever so well put on as he is now in troth and that's true said the old housekeeper looking with great complacency at her young master whose mien she thought much improved by his dress i'm sure ye never had a laced cravat like that when ye were at milnwood 
that's none of my sewing no no mistress replied cuddy that's a cast of my hand that's one of lord evandale's bras lord evandale answered the old lady that's him that the wigs are going to hang the morn as i hear say the wigs about to hang lord evandale said morton in the greatest surprise ay troth are they said the housekeeper yesterday night he made a sally as they call it my mother's name was sally i wonder they give christian folks names to sick unchristian doings but he made an outbreak to get provisions and his men were driven back and he was taken and the whig captain balfour guard set up a gallows and swore or said upon his conscience for they winna swear that if the garrison was not given over the morn by daybreak he would hang up the young lord poor thing as high as haman these are sore times but folk canna help them so do ye sit down and take bread and cheese until better meat's made ready ye shouldna have kenned a word about it and i had thought it was to spoil your dinner henny fed or unfed exclaimed morton saddle the horses instantly cuddy we must not rest until we get before the castle and resisting all ally's entreaties they instantly resumed their journey morton failed not to halt at the dwelling of poundtaxt and summon him to attend him to the camp that honest divine had just resumed for an instant his pacific habits and was perusing an ancient theological treatise with a pipe in his mouth and a small jug of ale beside him to assist his digestion of the argument it was with bitter ill-will that he relinquished these comforts which he called his studies in order to recommence a hard ride upon a high-trotting horse however when he knew the matter in hand he gave up with a deep groan the prospect of spending a quiet evening in his own little parlour for he entirely agreed with morton that whatever interest burleigh might have in rendering the breach between the presbyterians and the government irreconcilable by putting the young nobleman to death it was by no means that of the moderate party to permit such an act of atrocity and it is but doing justice to mr poundtext to add that like most of his own persuasion he was decidedly adverse to any such acts of unnecessary violence besides that his own present feelings induced him to listen with much complacence to the probability held out by morton of lord evandale's becoming a mediator for the establishment of peace upon fair and moderate terms with this similarity of views they hastened their journey and arrived about eleven o'clock at night at a small hamlet adjacent to the castle at tilly tudlam where burley had established his headquarters they were challenged by the sentinel who made his melancholy walk at the entrance of the hamlet and admitted upon declaring their names and authority in the army another soldier kept watch before a house which they conjectured to be the place of lord evandale's confinement for a gibbet of such great height as to be visible from the battlements of the castle was erected before it in melancholy confirmation of the truth of mrs wilson's report morton instantly demanded to speak with burley and was directed to his quarters they found him reading the scriptures with his arms lying beside him as if ready for any sudden alarm he started upon the entrance of his colleagues in office what has brought ye hither said burley hastily is there bad news from the army no replied morton but we understand that there are measures adopted here in which the safety of the army is deeply concerned lord evandale is your prisoner the lord replied burley hath delivered him into our hands and you will avail yourself of that advantage granted you by heaven to dishonour our cause in the eyes of all the world by putting a prisoner to an ignominious death 
if the house of tilly tudlam be not surrendered by daybreak replied burley god do so to me and more also if he shall not die that death to which his leader and patron john graham of claverhouse hath put so many of god's saints we are in arms replied morton to put down such cruelties and not to imitate them far less to avenge upon the innocent the acts of the guilty by what law can you justify the atrocity you would commit if thou art ignorant of it replied burley thy companion is well aware of the law which gave the man of jericho to the sword of joshua the son of nun but we answered the divine live under a better dispensation which instructeth us to return good for evil and to pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us that is to say said burley that thou wilt join thy gray hairs to his green youth to controvert me in this matter we are rejoined poundtext two of those to whom jointly with thyself authority is delegated over this host and we will not permit thee to hurt a hair of the prisoner's head it may please god to make him a means of healing these unhappy breaches in our israel i judged it would come to this answered burley when such as thou wert called into the council of the elders such as i answered poundtext and who am i that you should name me with such scorn have i not kept the flock of this sheepfold from the wolves for thirty years i even while thou john balfour wert fighting in the ranks of uncircumcision a philistine of hardened brow and bloody hand who am i sayest thou i will tell thee what thou art since thou wouldst so fain know said burley thou art one of those who would reap where thou hast not sowed and divide the spoil while others fight the battle thou art one of those that follow the gospel for the loaves and for the fishes that love their own mans better than the church of god and that would rather draw their stipends under prelatists or heathens than be a partaker with those noble spirits who have cast all behind them for the sake of the covenant and i will tell thee john balfour returned poundtext deservedly incensed i will tell thee what thou art thou art one of those for whose bloody and merciless disposition a reproach is flung upon the whole church of this suffering kingdom and for whose violence and blood guiltiness it is to be feared this fair attempt to recover our civil and religious rights will never be honoured by providence with the desired success gentlemen said morton cease this irritating and unavailing recrimination and do you mr balfour inform us whether it is your purpose to oppose the liberation of lord evandale which appears to us a profitable measure in the present position of our affairs you are here answered burley as two voices against one but you will not refuse to tarry until the united council shall decide upon this matter this said morton we would not decline if we could trust the hands in whom we are to leave the prisoner but you know well he added looking sternly at burley that you have already deceived me in this matter go to said burley disdainfully thou art an idle inconsiderate boy who for the black eyebrows of a silly girl would barter thy own faith and honour and the cause of god and of thy country mr balfour said morton laying his hand on his sword this language requires satisfaction and thou shalt have it stripling when and where thou darest said burley i plight thee my good word on it poundtext in his turn interfered to remind them of the madness of quarrelling and effected with difficulty a sort of sullen reconciliation concerning the prisoner said burley deal with him as ye think fit i wash my hands free from all consequences he is my prisoner 
made by my sword and spear while you mr morton were playing the adjutant at drills and parades and you mr pountext were warping the scriptures into erastianism take him unto you nevertheless and dispose of him as ye think meet dingwall he continued calling a sort of aide-de-camp who slept in the next apartment let the guard posted on the malignant evandale give up their post to those whom captain morton shall appoint to relieve them the prisoner he said again addressing poundtext and morton is now at your disposal gentlemen but remember that for all these things there will one day come a term of heavy accounting so saying he turned abruptly into an inner apartment without bidding them good evening his two visitors after a moment's consideration agreed it would be prudent to ensure the prisoner's personal safety by placing over him an additional guard chosen from their own parishioners a band of them happened to be stationed in the hamlet having been attached for the time to burleigh's command in order that the men might be gratified by remaining as long as possible near to their own homes they were in general smart active young fellows and were usually called by their companions the marksmen of milnwood by morton's desire four of these lads readily undertook the task of sentinels and he left with them hedrig on whose fidelity he could depend with instructions to call him if anything remarkable happened this arrangement being made morton and his colleague took possession for the night of such quarters as the overcrowded and miserable hamlet could afford them they did not however separate for repose till they had drawn up a memorial of the grievances of the moderate presbyterians which was summed up with a request of free toleration for their religion in future and that they should be permitted to attend gospel ordinances as dispensed by their own clergymen without oppression or molestation their petition proceeded to require that a free parliament should be called for settling the affairs of church and state and for redressing the injuries sustained by the subject and that all those who either now were or had been in arms for obtaining these ends should be indemnified morton could not but strongly hope that these terms which comprehended all that was wanted or wished for by the moderate party among the insurgents might when thus cleared of the violence of fanaticism find advocates even among the royalists as claiming only the ordinary rights of scottish freemen he had the more confidence of a favourable reception that the duke of monmouth to whom charles had entrusted the charge of subduing this rebellion was a man of gentle moderate and accessible disposition well known to be favourable to the presbyterians and invested by the king with full powers to take measures for quieting the disturbances in scotland it seemed to morton that all that was necessary for influencing him in their favour was to find a fit and sufficiently respectable channel of communication and such seemed to be opened through the medium of lord evandale he resolved therefore to visit the prisoner early in the morning in order to sound his dispositions to undertake the task of mediator but an accident happened which led him to anticipate his purpose chapter seven of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah give over your house lady he said give over your house to me edom of gordon morton had finished the revisal and the making out of a fair copy of the paper on which he and poundtext had agreed to rest as a full statement of the grievances of their party and the conditions on which the greater part of the insurgents would be contented to lay down their arms and he was about to betake himself to repose when there was a knocking at the door of his apartment 
enter said morton and the round bullet head of cuddy hedrig was thrust into the room come in said morton and tell me what you want is there any alarm no sir but i have brought one to speak with you who is that cuddy inquired morton one of your old acquaintance said cuddy and opening the door more fully he half led half dragged in a woman whose face was muffled in her plaid come come ye needna be so bashful before old acquaintance jenny said cuddy pulling down the veil and discovering to his master the well-remembered countenance of jenny dennison tell his honour now there's a bra lass tell him what ye were wanting to say to lord evandale mistress what was i wanting to say answered jenny to his honour himself the other morning when i visited him in captivity ye muckle hash do you think that folk dinna want to see their friends in adversity ye dour crowdy eater this reply was made with jenny's usual volubility but her voice quivered her cheek was thin and pale the tears stood in her eyes her hand trembled her manner was fluttered and her whole presence bore marks of recent suffering and privation as well as nervous and hysterical agitation what is the matter jenny said morton kindly you know how much i owe you in many respects and can hardly make a request that i will not grant if in my power many thanks milnwood said the weeping damsel but ye were i a kind gentleman though folk say ye have become sore changed now what do they say of me answered morton all body says replied jenny that you and the whigs have made a vow to ding king charles off the throne and that neither he nor his posteriors from generation to generation shall sit upon it any more and john goodyell threeps you're going to give all the church organs to the pipers and burn the book of common prayer by the hands of the common hangman in revenge of the covenant that was burnt when the king came home my friends at tilly tudlam judge too hastily and too ill of me answered morton i wish to have free exercise of my own religion without insulting any other and as to your family i only desire an opportunity to show them i have the same friendship and kindness as ever bless your kind heart for saying so said jenny bursting into a flood of tears and they never needed kindness or friendship more for they are famished for lack of food good god replied morton i have heard of scarcity but not of famine is it possible have the ladies and the major they have suffered like the love of us replied jenny for they shared every bit and sup with the whole folk in the castle i'm sure my poor eyne seen fifty colours with faintness and my head so dizzy with the merligos that i canna stand my lane the thinness of the poor girl's cheek and the sharpness of her features bore witness to the truth of what she said morton was greatly shocked sit down he said for god's sake forcing her into the only chair the apartment afforded while he himself strode up and down the room in horror and impatience i knew not of this he exclaimed in broken ejaculations i could not know of it cold-blooded iron-hearted fanatic deceitful villain cutty fetch refreshments food wine if possible whatever you can find whisky is good enough for her muttered cutty one wouldna have thought that good meal was so scant among them when the queen threw so muckle good kale bros scalding hot about my lugs faint and miserable as jenny seemed to be she could not hear the allusion to her exploit during the storm of the castle 
without bursting into a laugh which weakness soon converted into a hysterical giggle confounded at her state and reflecting with horror on the distress which must have been in the castle morton repeated his commands to hedrick in a peremptory manner and when he had departed endeavoured to soothe his visitor you come i suppose by the orders of your mistress to visit lord evandale tell me what she desires her orders shall be my law jenny appeared to reflect a moment and then said your honour is so old a friend i must needs trust to you and tell the truth be assured jenny said morton observing that she hesitated that you will best serve your mistress by dealing sincerely with me well then ye mun ken we're starving as i said before and have been more days than one and the major has sworn that he expects relief daily and that he will not give over the house to the enemy till we have eaten up his old boots and they are unco thick in the soles as ye may well mind for by being tough in the upper leather the dragoons again they think they will be forced to give up at last and they can abide hunger well after the life they led at free quarters for this while by past and since lord evandale's taken there's no guiding them and inglis says he'll give up the garrison to the whigs and the major and the leddies into the bargain if they will but let the troopers gang free themselves scoundrels said morton why do they not make terms for all in the castle they are feared for denial of quarter to themselves having done so muckle mischief through the country and burleigh has hanged one or twa of them already so they want to draw their own necks out of the collar at hazard of honest folks and you were sent continued morton to carry to lord evandale the unpleasant news of the men's mutiny just even so said jenny tam holliday took the rue and told me all about it and got me out of the castle to tell lord evandale if possibly i could win at him but how can he help you said morton he is a prisoner well a day ay answered the afflicted damsel but maybe he could make fair terms for us or maybe he could give us some good advice or maybe he might send his orders to the dragoons to be civil or or maybe said morton you were to try if it were possible to set him at liberty if it were so answered jenny with spirit it wouldna be the first time i have done my best to serve a friend in captivity true jenny replied morton i were most ungrateful to forget it but here comes cuddy with refreshments i will go and do your errand to lord evandale while you take some food and wine it will not be amiss ye should ken said cuddy to his master that this jenny this mrs dennison was trying to cuddle favour with tam rand the miller's man to win into lord evandale's room without anybody kennin she wasna thinking the gypsy that i was at her elbow and an unco fright ye gave me when ye came a hint and took a grip of me said jenny giving him a sly twitch with her finger and her thumb if ye hadna been an old acquaintance ye daft gomeral cuddy somewhat relenting grinned a smile on his artful mistress while morton wrapped himself up in his cloak took the sword under his arm and went straight to the place of the young nobleman's confinement he asked the sentinels if anything extraordinary had occurred nothing worth notice they said excepting the last that cuddy took up and two couriers that captain balfour had dispatched one to the reverend ephraim macbriar another to kettledrummel both of whom were beating the drum ecclesiastic in different towns between the position of burleigh and the headquarters of the main army near hamilton 
the purpose i presume said morton with an affectation of indifference was to call them hither so i understand answered the sentinel who had spoke with the messengers he is summoning a triumphant majority of the council thought morton to himself for the purpose of sanctioning whatever action of atrocity he may determine upon and thwarting opposition by authority i must be speedy or i shall lose my opportunity when he entered the place of lord evandale's confinement he found him ironed and reclining on a flock bed in the wretched garret of a miserable cottage he was either in a slumber or in deep meditation when morton entered and turned on him when aroused a countenance so much reduced by loss of blood want of sleep and scarcity of food that no one could have recognized in it the gallant soldier who had behaved with so much spirit at the skirmish of loudon hill he displayed some surprise at the sudden entrance of morton i am sorry to see you thus my lord said that youthful leader i have heard you are an admirer of poetry answered the prisoner in that case mr morton you may remember these lines stone walls do not a prison make or iron bars a cage a free and quiet mind can take these for a hermitage but were my imprisonment less endurable i am given to expect to-morrow a total enfranchisement by death said morton surely answered lord evandale i have no other prospect your comrade burley has already dipped his hand in the blood of men whose meanness of rank and obscurity of extraction might have saved them i cannot boast such a shield from his vengeance and i expect to meet its extremity but major bellenden said morton may surrender in order to preserve your life never while there is one man to defend the battlement and that man has one crust to eat i know his gallant resolution and grieved should i be if he changed it for my sake morton hastened to acquaint him with the mutiny among the dragoons and their resolution to surrender the castle and put the ladies of the family as well as the major into the hands of the enemy lord evandale seemed at first surprised and something incredulous but immediately afterwards deeply affected what is to be done he said how is this misfortune to be averted hear me my lord said morton i believe you may not be unwilling to bear the olive branch between our master the king and that part of his subjects which is now in arms not from choice but necessity you construe me but justly said lord evandale and to what does this tend permit me my lord continued morton i will set you at liberty upon parole nay you may return to the castle and shall have a safe conduct for the ladies the major and all who leave it on condition of its instant surrender in contributing to bring this about you will only submit to circumstances for with a mutiny in the garrison and without provisions it will be found impossible to defend the place twenty-four hours longer those therefore who refuse to accompany your lordship must take their fate you and your followers shall have a free pass to edinburgh or wherever the duke of monmouth may be in return for your liberty we hope that you will recommend to the notice of his grace as lieutenant-general of scotland this humble petition and remonstrance containing the grievances which have occasioned this insurrection a redress of which being granted i will answer with my head that the great body of the insurgents will lay down their arms lord evandale read over the paper with attention mr morton he said in my simple judgment i see little objection that can be made to the measure here recommended nay farther i believe in many respects they may meet the private sentiments of the duke of monmouth and yet to deal frankly with you i have no hopes of their being granted 
unless in the first place you were to lay down your arms the doing so answered morton would be virtually conceding that we had no right to take them up and that for one i will never agree to perhaps it is hardly to be expected you should said lord evandale and yet on that point i am certain the negotiations will be wrecked i am willing however having frankly told you my opinion to do all in my power to bring about a reconciliation it is all we can wish or expect replied morton the issue is in god's hands who disposes the hearts of princes you accept then the safe conduct certainly answered lord evandale and if i do not enlarge upon the obligation incurred by your having saved my life a second time believe that i do not feel it the less and the garrison of tilly tudlam said morton shall be withdrawn as you propose answered the young nobleman i am sensible the major will be unable to bring the mutineers to reason and i tremble to think of the consequences should the ladies and the brave old man be delivered up to this bloodthirsty ruffian burley you are in that case free said morton prepare to mount on horseback a few men whom i can trust shall attend you till you are in safety from our parties leaving lord evandale in great surprise and joy at this unexpected deliverance morton hastened to get a few chosen men under arms and on horseback each rider holding the rein of a spare horse jenny while she partook of her refreshment had contrived to make up her breech with cutty rode on the left hand of that valiant cavalier the tramp of their horses was soon heard under the window of lord evandale's prison two men whom he did not know entered the apartment disencumbered him of his fetters and conducting him downstairs mounted him in the centre of the detachment they set out at a round trot towards tilly tudlam the moonlight was giving way to the dawn when they approached that ancient fortress and its dark massive tower had just received the first pale colouring of the morning the party halted at the tower barrier not venturing to approach nearer for fear of the fire of the place lord evandale alone rode up to the gate followed at a distance by jenny dennison as they approached the gate there was heard to arise in the courtyard a tumult which accorded ill with the quiet serenity of a summer dawn cries and oaths were heard a pistol-shot or two were discharged and everything announced that the mutiny had broken out at this crisis lord evandale arrived at the gate where halliday was sentinel on hearing lord evandale's voice he instantly and gladly admitted him and that nobleman arrived among the mutinous troopers like a man dropped from the clouds they were in the act of putting their design into execution of seizing the place into their own hands and were about to disarm and overpower major bellenden and harrison and others of the castle who were offering the best resistance in their power the appearance of lord evandale changed the scene he seized inglis by the collar and upbraiding him with his villainy ordered two of his comrades to seize and bind him assuring the others that their only chance of impunity consisted in instant submission he then ordered the men into their ranks they obeyed he commanded them to ground their arms they hesitated but the instinct of discipline joined to their persuasion that the authority of their officer so boldly exerted must be supported by some forces without the gate induced them to submit take away those arms said lord evandale to the people of the castle they shall not be restored until these men know better the use for which they are entrusted with them and now he continued addressing the mutineers be gone make the best use of your time and a truce of three hours which the enemy are contented to allow you take the road to edinburgh and meet me at the house of muir 
i need not bid you beware of committing violence by the way you will not in your present condition provoke resentment for your own sakes let your punctuality show that you mean to atone for this morning's business the disarmed soldiers shrunk in silence from the presence of their officer and leaving the castle took the road to the place of rendezvous making such haste as was inspired by the fear of meeting with some detached party of the insurgents whom their present defenceless condition and their former violence might inspire with thoughts of revenge inglis whom evandale destined for punishment remained in custody halliday was praised for his conduct and assured of succeeding to the rank of the culprit these arrangements being hastily made lord evandale accosted the major before whose eyes the scene had seemed to pass like the change of a dream my dear major we must give up the place is it even so said major bellenden i was in hopes you had brought reinforcements and supplies not a man not a pound of meal answered lord evandale yet i am blithe to see you returned the honest major we were informed yesterday that these psalm-singing rascals had a plot on your life and i had mustered the scoundrelly dragoons ten minutes ago in order to beat up burley's quarters and get you out of limbo when the dog inglis instead of obeying me broke out into open mutiny but what is to be done now i have myself no choice said lord evandale i am a prisoner released on parole and bound for edinburgh you and the ladies must take the same route i have by the favour of a friend a safe conduct and a horse for you and your retinue for god's sake make haste you cannot propose to hold out with seven or eight men and without provisions enough has been done for honour and enough to render the defence of the highest consequence to government more were needless as well as desperate the english troops are arrived at edinburgh and will speedily move upon hamilton the possession of tilly tudlam by the rebels will be but temporary if you think so my lord said the veteran with a reluctant sigh i know you only advise what is honourable if then you really think the case inevitable i must submit for the mutiny of these scoundrels would render it impossible to man the walls goodyell let the women call up their mistresses and i'll be ready to march but if i could believe that my remaining in these old walls till i was starved to a mummy could do the king's cause the least service old miles bellenden would not leave them while there was a spark of life in his body the ladies already alarmed by the mutiny now heard the determination of the major in which they readily acquiesced though not without some groans and sighs on the part of lady margaret which referred as usual to the dejeune of his most sacred majesty in the halls which were now to be abandoned to rebels hasty preparations were made for evacuating the castle and long ere the dawn was distinct enough for discovering objects with precision the ladies with major bellenden harrison goodyell and the other domestics were mounted on the led horses and others which had been provided in the neighbourhood and proceeded towards the north still escorted by four of the insurgent horsemen the rest of the party who had accompanied lord evandale from the hamlet took possession of the deserted castle carefully forbearing all outrage or acts of plunder and when the sun arose the scarlet and blue colours of the scottish covenant floated from the keep of tilly tudlam chapter eight of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah and to my breast a bodkin in her hand were worth a thousand daggers marlowe 
the cavalcade which left the castle of tilly tudlam halted for a few minutes at the small town of bothwell after passing the outposts of the insurgents to take some slight refreshments which their attendants had provided and which were really necessary to persons who had suffered considerably by want of proper nourishment they then pressed forward upon the road towards edinburgh amid the lights of dawn which were now rising on the horizon it might have been expected during the course of the journey that lord evandale would have been frequently by the side of miss edith bellenden yet after his first salutations had been exchanged and every precaution solicitously adopted which could serve for her accommodation he rode in the van of the party with major bellenden and seemed to abandon the charge of immediate attendance upon his lovely niece to one of the insurgent cavaliers whose dark military cloak with the large flapped hat and feather which drooped over his face concealed at once his figure and his features they rode side by side in silence for more than two miles when the stranger addressed miss bellenden in a tremulous and suppressed voice miss bellenden he said must have friends wherever she is known even among those whose conduct she now disapproves is there anything that such can do to show their respect for her and their regret for her sufferings let them learn for their own sakes replied edith to venerate the laws and to spare innocent blood let them return to their allegiance and i can forgive them all that i have suffered were it ten times more you think it impossible then rejoined the cavalier for any one to serve in our ranks having the weal of his country sincerely at heart and conceiving himself in the discharge of a patriotic duty it might be imprudent while so absolutely in your power replied miss bellenden to answer that question not in the present instance i plight you the word of a soldier replied the horseman i have been taught candour from my birth said edith and if i am to speak at all i must utter my real sentiments god only can judge the heart men must estimate intentions by actions treason murder by the sword and by gibbet the oppression of a private family such as ours who were only in arms for the defence of the established government and of our own property are actions which must needs sully all that have accession to them by whatever specious terms they may be gilded over the guilt of civil war rejoined the horseman the miseries which it brings in its train lie at the door of those who provoked it by illegal oppression rather than of such as are driven to arms in order to assert their natural rights as free men that is assuming the question replied edith which ought to be proved each party contends that they are right in point of principle and therefore the guilt must lie with them who first drew the sword as in an affray law holds those to be the criminals who are the first to have recourse to violence alas said the horseman were our vindication to rest there how easy would it be to show that we have suffered with a patience which almost seemed beyond the power of humanity ere we were driven by oppression into open resistance but i perceive he continued sighing deeply that it is vain to plead before miss bellenden a cause which she has already prejudged perhaps as much from her dislike of the persons as of the principles of those engaged in it pardon me answered edith i have stated with freedom my opinion of the principles of the insurgents of their persons i know nothing excepting in one solitary instance and that instance said the horseman has influenced your opinion of the whole body 
"'Far from it,' said Edith. "'He is, at least I once thought him, one in whose scale few were fit to be weighed. He is, or he seemed, one of early talent, high faith, pure morality, and warm affections. Can I approve of a rebellion which has made such a man, formed to ornament, to enlighten, and to defend his country, the companion of gloomy and ignorant fanatics, or canting hypocrites, the leader of brutal clowns, the brother-in-arms to banditti and highway murderers. Should you meet such a one in your camp, tell him that Edith Bellenden has wept more over his fallen character, blighted prospects, and dishonored name, than over the distresses of her own house, and that she has better endured that famine which has wasted her cheek and dimmed her eye than the pang of heart which attended the reflection by and through whom these calamities were inflicted. As she thus spoke, she turned upon her companion a countenance whose faded cheek attested the reality of her sufferings even while it glowed with the temporary animation which accompanied her language the horseman was not insensible to the appeal he raised his hand to his brow with the sudden motion of one who feels a pang shoot along his brain passed it hastily over his face and then pulled the shadowing hat still deeper on his forehead the movement and the feelings which it excited did not escape edith nor did she remark them without emotion and yet she said should the person of whom i speak seem to you too deeply affected by the hard opinion of of an early friend say to him that sincere repentance is next to innocence that though fallen from a height not easily recovered and the author of much mischief because gilded by his example he may still atone in some measure for the evil he has done and in what manner asked the cavalier in the same suppressed and almost choked voice by lending his efforts to restore the blessings of peace to his distracted countrymen and to induce the deluded rebels to lay down their arms by saving their blood he may atone for that which has been already spilt and he that shall be most active in accomplishing this great end will best deserve the thanks of this age and an honoured remembrance in the next and in such a peace said her companion with a firm voice miss bellenden would not wish i think that the interests of the people were sacrificed unreservedly to those of the crown i am but a girl was the young lady's reply and i scarce can speak on the subject without presumption but since i have gone so far i will fairly add i would wish to see a peace which would give rest to all parties and secure the subjects from military rapine which i detest as much as i do the means now adopted to resist it miss bellenden answered henry morton raising his face and speaking in his natural tone the person who has lost such a highly valued place in your esteem has yet too much spirit to plead his cause as a criminal and conscious that he can no longer claim a friend's interest in your bosom he would be silent under your hard censure were it not that he can refer to the honoured testimony of lord evandale that his earnest wishes and most active exertions are even now directed to the accomplishment of such a peace as the most loyal cannot censure he bowed with dignity to miss bellenden who though her language intimated that she well knew to whom she had been speaking probably had not expected that he would justify himself with so much animation she returned his salute confused and in silence morton then rode forward to the head of the party henry morton exclaimed major bellenden surprised at the sudden apparition 
the same answered morton who is sorry that he labours under the harsh construction of major bellenden and his family he commits to my lord evandale he continued turning towards the young nobleman and bowing to him the charge of undeceiving his friends both regarding the particulars of his conduct and the purity of his motives farewell major bellenden all happiness attend you and yours may we meet again in happier and better times believe me said lord evandale your confidence mr morton is not misplaced i will endeavour to repay the great services i have received from you by doing my best to place your character on its proper footing with major bellenden and all whose esteem you value i expected no less from your generosity my lord said morton he then called his followers and rode off along the heath in the direction of hamilton their feathers waving and their steel caps glancing in the beams of the rising sun cuddy hedrig alone remained an instant behind his companions to take an affectionate farewell of jenny dennison who had contrived during this short morning's ride to re-establish her influence over his susceptible bosom a straggling tree or two obscured rather than concealed their tete-a-tete -tete as they halted their horses to bid adieu fare ye well jenny said cuddy with a loud exertion of his lungs intended perhaps to be a sigh but rather resembling the intonation of a groan ye'll think of poor cuddy sometimes an honest lad that loves ye jenny ye'll ever think of him now and then whiles at brose time answered the malicious damsel unable either to suppress the repartee or the arch smile which attended it cuddy took his revenge as rustic lovers are wont and as jenny probably expected caught his mistress round the neck kissed her cheeks and lips heartily and then turned his horse and trotted after his master devil's in the fellow said jenny wiping her lips and adjusting her head-dress he has twice the spunk of tam halliday after all coming my lady coming lord have a care of us i trust the old lady didna see us jenny said lady margaret as the damsel came up was not that young man who commanded the party the same that was captain of the popinjay and who afterwards prisoner at tilly tudlam on the morning claverhouse came there jenny happy that the query had no reference to her own little matters looked at her young mistress to discover if possible whether it was her cue to speak truth or not not being able to catch any hint to guide her she followed her instinct as a lady's maid and lied i dinna believe it was him my lady said jenny as confidently as if she had been saying her catechism he was a little black man that you must have been blind jenny said the major henry morton is tall and fair and that youth is the very man i had ither thing ado than be looking at him said jenny tossing her head he may be as fair as a farthing candle for me is it not said lady margaret a blessed escape which we have made out of the hands of so desperate and bloodthirsty a fanatic you are deceived madam said lord evandale mr morton merits such a title from no one but least from us that i am now alive and that you are now on your safe retreat to your friends instead of being prisoners to a real fanatical homicide is solely and entirely owing to the prompt active and energetic humanity of this young gentleman he then went into a particular narrative of the events with which the reader is acquainted dwelling upon the merits of morton and expatiating on the risk at which he had rendered them these important services as if he had been a brother instead of a rival i were worse than ungrateful he said were i silent on the merits of the man who has twice saved my life 
i would willingly think well of henry morton my lord replied major bellenden and i own he has behaved handsomely to your lordship and to us but i cannot have the same allowances which it pleases your lordship to entertain for his present course you are to consider replied lord evandale that he has been partly forced upon them by necessity and i must add that his principles though differing in some degree from my own are such as ought to command respect claverhouse whose knowledge of man is not to be disputed spoke justly of him as to his extraordinary qualities but with prejudice and harshly concerning his principles and motives you have not been long in learning all his extraordinary qualities my lord answered major bellenden i who have known him from boyhood could before this affair have said much of his good principles and good nature but as to his high talents they were probably hidden major replied the generous lord evandale even from himself until circumstances called them forth and if i have detected them it was only because our intercourse and conversation turned on momentous and important subjects he is now laboring to bring this rebellion to an end and the terms he has proposed are so moderate that they shall not want my hearty recommendation and have you hopes said lady margaret to accomplish a scheme so comprehensive i should have madam were every whig as moderate as morton and every loyalist as disinterested as major bellenden but such is the fanaticism and violent irritation of both parties that i fear nothing will end this civil war save the edge of a sword it may be readily supposed that edith listened with the deepest interest to this conversation while she regretted that she had expressed herself harshly and hastily to her lover she felt a conscious and proud satisfaction that his character was even in the judgment of his noble-minded rival such as her own affection had once spoke it civil feuds and domestic prejudices she said may render it necessary for me to tear his remembrance from my heart but it is not small relief to know assuredly that it is worthy of the place it has so long retained there while edith was thus retracting her unjust resentment her lover arrived at the camp of the insurgents near hamilton which he found in considerable confusion certain advices had arrived that the royal army having been recruited from england by a large detachment of the king's guards were about to take the field fame magnified their numbers and their high state of equipment and discipline and spread abroad other circumstances which dismayed the courage of the insurgents what favor they might have expected from monmouth was likely to be intercepted by the influence of those associated with him in command his lieutenant-general was the celebrated general thomas dalzell who having practised the art of war in the then barbarous country of russia was as much feared for his cruelty and indifference to human life and human sufferings as respected for his steady loyalty and undaunted valour this man was second in command to monmouth and the horse were commanded by claverhouse burning with desire to revenge the death of his nephew and his defeat at drumclog to these accounts was added the most formidable and terrific description of the train of artillery and the cavalry force with which the royal army took the field large bodies composed of the highland clans having in language religion and manners no connection with the insurgents had been summoned to join the royal army under their various chieftains and these amorites or philistines as the insurgents termed them came like eagles to the slaughter 
in fact every person who could ride or run at the king's command was summoned to arms apparently with the purpose of forfeiting and fining such men of property whom their principles might deter from joining the royal standard though prudence prevented them from joining that of the insurgent presbyterians in short every rumour tended to increase the apprehension among the insurgents that the king's vengeance had only been delayed in order that it might fall more certain and more heavy morton endeavoured to fortify the minds of the common people by pointing out the probable exaggeration of these reports and by reminding them of the strength of their own situation with an unfordable river in front only passable by a long and narrow bridge he called to their remembrance their victory over claverhouse when their numbers were few and then much worse disciplined and appointed for battle than now showed them that the ground on which they lay afforded by its undulation and the thickets which intersected it considerable protection against artillery and even against cavalry if stoutly defended and that their safety in fact depended on their own spirit and resolution but while morton thus endeavoured to keep up the courage of the army at large he availed himself of those discouraging rumours to endeavour to impress on the minds of the leaders the necessity of proposing to the government moderate terms of accommodation while they were still formidable as commanding an unbroken and numerous army he pointed out to them that in the present humour of their followers it could hardly be expected that they would engage with advantage the well-appointed and regular force of the duke of monmouth and that if they chanced as was most likely to be defeated and dispersed the insurrection in which they had engaged so far from being useful to the country would be rendered the apology for oppressing it more severely pressed by these arguments and feeling it equally dangerous to remain together or to dismiss their forces most of the leaders readily agreed that if such terms could be obtained as had been transmitted to the duke of monmouth by the hands of lord evandale the purpose for which they had taken up arms would be in a great measure accomplished they then entered into similar resolutions and agreed to guarantee the petition and remonstrance which had been drawn up by morton on the contrary there were still several leaders and those men whose influence with the people exceeded that of persons of more apparent consequence who regarded every proposal of treaty which did not proceed on the basis of the solemn league and covenant of sixteen forty as utterly null and void impious and unchristian these men diffused their feelings among the multitude who had little foresight and nothing to lose and persuaded many that the timid counsellors who recommended peace upon terms short of the dethronement of the royal family and the declared independence of the church with respect to the state were cowardly labourers who were about to withdraw their hands from the plough and despicable trimmers who sought only a specious pretext for deserting their brethren in arms these contradictory opinions were fiercely argued in each tent of the insurgent army or rather in the huts or cabins which served in the place of tents violence in language often led to open quarrels and blows and the divisions into which the army of sufferers was rent served as too plain a presage of their future fate chapter nine of old mortality by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah the curse of growing factions and divisions still vex your counsels venice preserved the prudence of morton found sufficient occupation in stemming the furious current 
of these contending parties when two days after his return to hamilton he was visited by his friend and colleague the rev mr poundtext flying as he presently found from the face of john balfour of burley whom he laughed not a little incensed at the share he had taken in the liberation of lord evandale when the worthy divine had somewhat recruited his spirits after the hurry and fatigue of his journey he proceeded to give morton an account of what had passed in the vicinity of tilly tudlam after the memorable morning of his departure the night march of morton had been accomplished with such dexterity and the men were so faithful to their trust that burley received no intelligence of what had happened until the morning was far advanced his first enquiry was whether mcbriar and kettledrummel had arrived agreeably to the summons which he had dispatched at midnight mcbriar had come and kettledrummel though a heavy traveller might he was informed be instantly expected burley then dispatched a messenger to morton's quarters to summon him to an immediate council the messenger returned with news that he had left the place poundtext was next summoned but he thinking as he said himself that it was ill dealing with fractious folk had withdrawn to his own quiet man's preferring a dark ride though he had been on horseback the whole preceding day to a renewal in the morning of a controversy with burley whose ferocity overawed him when unsupported by the firmness of morton burley's next enquiries were directed after lord evandale and great was his rage when he learned that he had been conveyed away overnight by a party of the marksmen of milnwood under the immediate command of henry morton himself the villain exclaimed burley addressing himself to macbriar the base mean-spirited traitor to curry favour for himself with the government hath set at liberty the prisoner taken by my own right hand through means of whom i have little doubt the possession of the place of strength which hath wrought us such trouble might now have been in our hands but is it not in our hands said macbriar looking up towards the keep of the castle and are not these the colours of the covenant that float over its walls a stratagem a mere trick said burley an insult over our disappointment intended to aggravate and embitter our spirits he was interrupted by the arrival of one of morton's followers sent to report to him the evacuation of the place and its occupation by the insurgent forces burley was rather driven to fury than reconciled by the news of this success i have watched he said i have fought i have plotted i have striven for the reduction of this place i have forborne to seek to head enterprises of higher command and of higher honour i have narrowed their outgoings and cut off the springs and broken the staff of bread within their walls and when the men were about to yield themselves to my hand that their sons might be bondsmen and their daughters a laughing-stock to our whole camp cometh this youth without a beard on his chin and takes it on him to thrust his sickle into the harvest and to rend the prey from the spoiler surely the labourer is worthy of his hire and the city with its captives should be given to him that wins it nay said macbriar who was surprised at the degree of agitation which balfour displayed chafe not thyself because of the ungodly heaven will use its own instruments and who knows but this youth hush hush said burley do not discredit thine own better judgment it was thou that first badest me beware of this painted sepulchre this lacquered piece of copper that passed current with me for gold it fares ill even with the elect 
when they neglect the guidance of such pious pastors as thou but our carnal affections will mislead us this ungrateful boy's father was mine ancient friend they must be as earnest in their struggles as thou ephraim mcbriar that would shake themselves clear of the clogs and chains of humanity this compliment touched the preacher in the most sensible part and burley deemed therefore he should find little difficulty in moulding his opinions to the support of his own views more especially as they agreed exactly in their high-strained opinions of church government let us instantly he said go up to the tower there is that among the records in yonder fortress which well used as i can use it shall be worth to us a valiant leader and an hundred horsemen but will such be the fitting aids of the children of the covenant said the preacher we have already among us too many who hunger after lands and silver and gold rather than after the word it is not by such that our deliverance shall be wrought out thou errest said burley we must work by means and these worldly men shall be our instruments at all events the moabitish woman shall be despoiled of her inheritance and neither the malignant evandale nor the erastian morton shall possess yonder castle and lands though they may seek in marriage the daughter thereof so saying he led the way to tilly tudlam where he seized upon the plate and other valuables for the use of the army ransacked the charter room and other receptacles for family papers and treated with contempt the remonstrances of those who reminded him that the terms granted to the garrison had guaranteed respect to private property burley and mcbriar having established themselves in their new acquisition were joined by kettle drummle in the course of the day and also by the laird of langkell whom that active divine had contrived to seduce as poundtext termed it from the pure light in which he had been brought up thus united they sent to the said poundtext an invitation or rather a summons to attend a council at tilly tudlam he remembered however that the door had an iron grate and the keep a dungeon and resolved not to trust himself with his incensed colleagues he therefore retreated or rather fled to hamilton with the tidings that burley mcbriar and kettle drummle were coming to hamilton as soon as they could collect a body of cameronians sufficient to overawe the rest of the army and ye see concluded poundtext with a deep sigh that they will then possess a majority in the council for langkale though he has always passed for one of the honest and rational party cannot be suitably or precisely termed either fish or flesh or good red herring whoever has the stronger party has langkale thus concluded the heavy narrative of honest poundtext who sighed deeply as he considered the danger in which he was placed betwixt unreasonable adversaries amongst themselves and the common enemy from without morton exhorted him to patience temper and composure informed him of the good hope he had of negotiating for peace and indemnity through means of lord evandale and made out to him a very fair prospect that he should again return to his own parchment-bound calvin his evening pipe of tobacco and his noggin of inspiring ale providing always he would afford his effectual support and concurrence to the measures which he morton had taken for a general pacification thus backed and comforted poundtext resolved magnanimously to await the coming of the cameronians to the general rendezvous burley and his confederates had drawn together a considerable body of these sectaries amounting to a hundred horse and about fifteen hundred foot clouded and severe in aspect morose and jealous in communication 
haughty of heart and confident as men who believed that the pale of salvation was open for them exclusively while all other christians however slight were the shades of difference of doctrine from their own were in fact little better than outcasts or reprobates these men entered the presbyterian camp rather as dubious and suspicious allies or possibly antagonists than as men who were heartily embarked in the same cause and exposed to the same dangers with their more moderate brethren in arms burley made no private visits to his colleagues and held no communication with them on the subject of the public affairs otherwise than by sending a dry invitation to them to attend a meeting of the general council for that evening on the arrival of morton and poundtext at the place of assembly they found their brethren already seated slight greeting passed between them and it was easy to see that no amicable conference was intended by those who convoked the council the first question was put by mcbriar the sharp eagerness of whose zeal urged him to the van on all occasions he desired to know by whose authority the malignant called lord evandale had been freed from the doom of death justly denounced against him by my authority and mr morton's replied poundtext who besides being anxious to give his companion a good opinion of his courage confided heartily in his support and moreover had much less fear of encountering one of his own profession and who confined himself to the weapons of theological controversy in which poundtext feared no man than of entering into debate with the stern homicide balfour and who brother said kettledrummel who gave you authority to interpose in such a high matter the tenor of our commission answered poundtext gives us authority to bind and to loose if lord evandale was justly doomed to die by the voice of one of our number he was of a surety lawfully redeemed from death by the warrant of two of us go to go to said burley we know your motives it was to send that silkworm that gilded trinket that embroidered trifle of a lord to bear terms of peace to the tyrant it was so replied morton who saw his companion begin to flinch before the fierce eyes of balfour it was so and what then are we to plunge the nation in endless war in order to pursue schemes which are equally wild wicked and unattainable hear him said balfour he blasphemeth it is false said morton they blaspheme who pretend to expect miracles and neglect the use of the human means with which providence has blessed them i repeat it our avowed object is the re-establishment of peace on fair and honourable terms of security to our religion and our liberty we disclaim any desire to tyrannise over those of others the debate would now have run higher than ever but they were interrupted by intelligence that the duke of monmouth had commenced his march towards the west and was already advanced half-way from edinburgh this news silenced their divisions for the moment and it was agreed that the next day should be held as a fast of general humiliation for the sins of the land that the rev mr poundtext should preach to the army in the morning and kettledrummel in the afternoon that neither should touch upon any topics of schism or of division but animate the soldiers to resist to the blood like brethren in a good cause this healing overture having been agreed to the moderate party ventured upon another proposal confiding that it would have the support of langkale who looked extremely blank at the news which they had just received and might be supposed reconverted to moderate measures it was to be presumed they said that since the king had not entrusted the command of his forces upon the present occasion 
to any of their active oppressors but on the contrary had employed a nobleman distinguished by gentleness of temper and a disposition favourable to their cause there must be some better intention entertained towards them than they had yet experienced they contended that it was not only prudent but necessary to ascertain from a communication with the duke of monmouth whether he was not charged with some secret instructions in their favour this could only be learned by dispatching an envoy to his army and who will undertake the task said burley evading a proposal too reasonable to be openly resisted who will go up to their camp knowing that john graham of claverhouse hath sworn to hang up whomsoever we shall dispatch towards them in revenge of the death of the young man his nephew let that be no obstacle said morton i will with pleasure encounter any risk attached to the bearer of your errand let him go said balfour apart to macbriar our counsels will be well rid of his presence the motion therefore received no contradiction even from those who were expected to have been most active in opposing it and it was agreed that henry morton should go to the camp of the duke of monmouth in order to discover upon what terms the insurgents would be admitted to treat with him as soon as his errand was made known several of the more moderate party joined in requesting him to make terms upon the footing of the petition entrusted to lord evandale's hands for the approach of the king's army spread a general trepidation by no means allayed by the high tone assumed by the cameronians which had so little to support it excepting their own headlong zeal with these instructions and with cuddy as his attendant morton set forth towards the royal camp at all the risks which attended those who assume the office of mediator during the heat of civil discord morton had not proceeded six or seven miles before he perceived that he was on the point of falling in with the van of the royal forces and as he ascended a height saw all the roads in the neighbourhood occupied by armed men marching in great order towards bothwell muir an open common on which they proposed to encamp for that evening at the distance of scarcely two miles from the clyde on the farther side of which river the army of the insurgents was encamped he gave himself up to the first advanced guard of cavalry which he met as bearer of a flag of truce and communicated his desire to obtain access to the duke of monmouth the non-commissioned officer who commanded the party made his report to his superior and he again to another in still higher command and both immediately rode to the spot where morton was detained you are but losing your time my friend and risking your life said one of them addressing morton the duke of monmouth will receive no terms from traitors with arms in their hands and your cruelties have been such as to authorize retaliation of every kind better trot your nag back and save his mettle to-day that he may save your life to-morrow i cannot think said morton that even if the duke of monmouth should consider us as criminals he would condemn so large a body of his fellow-subjects without even hearing what they have to plead for themselves on my part i fear nothing i am conscious of having consented to or authorized no cruelty and the fear of suffering innocently for the crimes of others shall not deter me from executing my commission the two officers looked at each other i have an idea said the younger that this is the young man of whom lord evandale spoke is my lord evandale in the army said morton he is not replied the officer we left him at edinburgh too much indisposed to take the field your name sir i presume is henry morton it is sir answered morton we will not oppose your seeing the duke sir said the officer 
with more civility of manner but you may assure yourself it will be to no purpose for were his grace disposed to favour your people others are joined in commission with him who will hardly consent to his doing so i shall be sorry to find it thus said morton but my duty requires that i should persevere in my desire to have an interview with him lumley said the superior officer let the duke know of mr morton's arrival and remind his grace that this is the person of whom lord evandale spoke so highly the officer returned with a message that the general could not see mr morton that evening but would receive him by times in the ensuing morning he was detained in a neighbouring cottage all night but treated with civility and everything provided for his accommodation early on the next morning the officer he had first seen came to conduct him to his audience the army was drawn out and in the act of forming column for march or attack the duke was in the centre nearly a mile from the place where morton had passed the night in riding towards the general he had an opportunity of estimating the force which had been assembled for the suppression of the hasty and ill-concerted insurrection there were three or four regiments of english the flower of charles's army there were the scottish life-guards burning with desire to revenge their late defeat other scottish regiments of regulars were also assembled and a large body of cavalry consisting partly of gentlemen volunteers partly of the tenants of the crown who did military duty for their fiefs morton also observed several strong parties of highlanders drawn from the points nearest to the lowland frontiers a people as already mentioned particularly obnoxious to the western whigs and who hated and despised them in the same proportion these were assembled under their chiefs and made part of this formidable array a complete train of field artillery accompanied these troops and the whole had an air so imposing that it seemed nothing short of an actual miracle could prevent the ill-equipped ill-modelled and tumultuary army of the insurgents from being utterly destroyed the officer who accompanied morton endeavoured to gather from his looks the feelings with which this splendid and awful parade of military force had impressed him but true to the cause he had espoused he laboured successfully to prevent the anxiety which he felt from appearing in his countenance and looked around him on the warlike display as on a sight which he expected and to which he was indifferent you see the entertainment prepared for you said the officers if i had no appetite for it replied morton i should not have been accompanying you at this moment but i shall be better pleased with a more peaceful regale for the sake of all parties as they spoke thus they approached the commander-in-chief who surrounded by several officers was seated upon a knoll commanding an extensive prospect of the distant country and from which could be easily discovered the windings of the majestic clyde and the distant camp of the insurgents on the opposite bank the officers of the royal army appeared to be surveying the ground with the purpose of directing an immediate attack when captain lumley the officer who accompanied morton had whispered in monmouth's ear his name and errand the duke made a signal for all around him to retire excepting only two general officers of distinction while they spoke together in whispers for a few minutes before morton was permitted to advance he had time to study the appearance of the persons with whom he was to treat it was impossible for any one to look upon the duke of monmouth without being captivated by his personal graces and accomplishments of which the great high priest of all the nine afterwards recorded whatever he did was done with so much ease in him alone twas natural to please his motions all accompanied with grace and paradise was opened in his face 
yet to a strict observer the manly beauty of monmouth's face was occasionally rendered less striking by an air of vacillation and uncertainty which seemed to imply hesitation and doubt at moments when decisive resolution was most necessary beside him stood claverhouse whom we have already fully described and another general officer whose appearance was singularly striking his dress was of the antique fashion of charles the first time and composed of chamois leather curiously slashed and covered with antique lace and garniture his boots and spurs might be referred to the same distant period he wore a breastplate over which descended a grey beard of venerable length which he cherished as a mark of mourning for charles the first having never shaved since that monarch was brought to the scaffold his head was uncovered and almost perfectly bald his high and wrinkled forehead piercing grey eyes and marked features evinced age unbroken by infirmity and stern resolution unsoftened by humanity such is the outline however feebly expressed of the celebrated general thomas dalzell a man more feared and hated by the whigs than even claverhouse himself and who executed the same violences against them out of a detestation of their persons or perhaps an innate severity of temper which graham only resorted to on political accounts as the best means of intimidating the followers of presbytery and of destroying that sect entirely the presence of these two generals one of whom he knew by person and the other by description seemed to morton decisive of the fate of his embassy but notwithstanding his youth and inexperience and the unfavourable reception which his proposals seemed likely to meet with he advanced boldly towards them upon receiving a signal to that purpose determined that the cause of his country and of those with whom he had taken up arms should suffer nothing from being entrusted to him monmouth received him with the graceful courtesy which attended even his slightest actions dalzell regarded him with a stern gloomy and impatient frown and claverhouse with a sarcastic smile and inclination of his head seemed to claim him as an old acquaintance you come sir from these unfortunate people now assembled in arms said the duke of monmouth and your name i believe is morton will you favour us with the purport of your errand it is contained my lord answered morton in a paper termed a remonstrance and supplication which my lord evandale has placed i presume in your grace's hands he has done so sir answered the duke and i understand from lord evandale that mr morton has behaved in these unhappy matters with much temperance and generosity for which i have to request his acceptance of my thanks here morton observed dalzell shake his head indignantly and whisper something into claverhouse's ear who smiled in return and elevated his eyebrows but in a degree so slight as scarce to be perceptible the duke taking the petition from his pocket proceeded obviously struggling between the native gentleness of his own disposition and perhaps his conviction that the petitioners demanded no more than their rights and the desire on the other hand of enforcing the king's authority and complying with the sterner opinions of the colleagues in office who had been assigned for the purpose of controlling as well as advising him there are mr morton in this paper proposals as to the abstract propriety of which i must now waive delivering any opinion some of them appear to me reasonable and just and although i have no express instructions from the king upon the subject yet i assure you mr morton and i pledge my honour that i will interpose in your behalf and use my utmost influence to procure you satisfaction from his majesty but you must distinctly understand 
that I can only treat with supplicants, not with rebels, and as a preliminary to every act of favor on my side, I must insist upon your followers laying down their arms and dispersing themselves. To do so, my lord duke, replied Morton, undauntedly, were to acknowledge ourselves the rebels that our enemies term us, our swords are drawn for recovery of a birthright wrested from us. Your grace's moderation and good sense has admitted the general justice of our demand, a demand which would never have been listened to had it not been accompanied with the sound of the trumpet. We cannot, therefore, and dare not, lay down our arms, even on your grace's assurance of indemnity, unless it were accompanied with some reasonable prospect of the redress of the wrongs which we complain of. Mr. Morton, replied the Duke, you are young, but you must have seen enough of the world to perceive that requests, by no means dangerous or unreasonable in themselves, may become so by the way in which they are pressed and supported." we may reply my lord answered morton that this disagreeable mode has not been resorted to until all others have failed mr morton said the duke i must break this conference short we are in readiness to commence the attack yet i will suspend it for an hour until you can communicate my answer to the insurgents if they please to disperse their followers lay down their arms and send a peaceful deputation to me i will consider myself bound in honour to do all i can to procure redress of their grievances if not let them stand on their guard and expect the consequences i think gentlemen he added turning to his two colleagues this is the utmost length to which i can stretch my instructions in favor of these misguided persons. By my faith, answered Dalzell suddenly, and it is a length to which my poor judgment durst not have stretched them, considering I had both the king and my conscience to answer to. But doubtless your grace knows more of the king's private mind than we, who have only the letter of our instructions to look to. Monmouth blushed deeply, you hear, he said, addressing Morton, General Dalzell blames me for the length which I am disposed to go in your favor. General Dalzell's sentiments, my lord, replied Morton, are such as we expected from him. Your graces, such as we were prepared to hope, you might please to entertain. Indeed, I cannot help adding that in the case of the absolute submission upon which you are pleased to insist it might still remain something less than doubtful how far with such counsellors around the king even your grace's intercession might procure us effectual relief but i will communicate to our leaders your grace's answer to our supplication and since we cannot obtain peace we must bid war welcome as well as we may good morning sir said the duke i suspend the movements of attack for one hour and for one hour only if you have an answer to return within that space of time i will receive it here and earnestly entreat it may be such as to save the effusion of blood at this moment another smile of deep meaning passed between dalzell and claverhouse the duke observed it and repeated his words with great dignity yes gentlemen i said i trusted the answer might be such as would save the effusion of blood i hope the sentiment neither meets your scorn nor incurs your displeasure dalzell returned the duke's frown with a stern glance but made no answer claverhouse his lip just curled with an ironical smile bowed and said it was not for him to judge the propriety of his grace's sentiments the duke made a signal to morton to withdraw he obeyed and accompanied by his former escort rode slowly through the army to return to the camp of the nonconformists 
as he passed the fine corps of life guards he found claverhouse was already at their head that officer no sooner saw morton than he advanced and addressed him with perfect politeness of manner i think this is not the first time i have seen mr morton of milnwood it was not colonel graham's fault said morton smiling sternly that he or any one else should be now incommoded by my presence allow me at least to say replied claverhouse that mr morton's present situation authorizes the opinion i have entertained of him and that my proceedings at our last meeting only squared to my duty to reconcile your actions to your duty and your duty to your conscience is your business colonel graham not mine said morton justly offended at being thus in a manner required to approve of the sentence under which he had so nearly suffered nay but stay an instant said claverhouse evandell insists that i have some wrongs to acquit myself of in your instance i trust i shall always make some difference between a high-minded gentleman who though misguided acts upon generous principles and the crazy fanatical clowns yonder with the bloodthirsty assassins who had them therefore if they do not disperse upon your return let me pray you instantly come over to our army and surrender yourself for be assured they cannot stand our assault for half an hour if you will be ruled and do this be sure to inquire for me monmouth strange as it may seem cannot protect you dalzell will not i both can and will and i have promised to evandell to do so if you will give me an opportunity i should owe lord evandell my thanks answered morton coldly did not his scheme imply an opinion that i might be prevailed on to desert those with whom i am engaged for you colonel graham if you will honour me with a different species of satisfaction it is probable that in an hour's time you will find me at the west end of bothwell bridge with my sword in my hand i shall be happy to meet you there said claverhouse but still more so should you think better on my first proposal they then saluted and parted that is a pretty lad lumley said claverhouse addressing himself to the other officer but he is a lost man his blood be upon his head so saying he addressed himself to the task of preparation for instant battle chapter ten of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah but hark the tent has changed its voice there's peace and rest no longer burns the laudian militia they came with their coats of blue five hundred men from london came clad in a reddish hue bothwell lines when morton had left the well-ordered outposts of the regular army and arrived at those which were maintained by his own party he could not but be peculiarly sensible of the difference of discipline and entertain a proportional degree of fear for the consequences the same discords which agitated the councils of the insurgents raged even among their meanest followers and their pickets and patrols were more interested and occupied in disputing the true occasion and causes of wrath and defining the limits of erastian heresy than in looking out for and observing the motions of their enemies though within hearing of the royal drums and trumpets there was a guard however of the insurgent army posted at the long and narrow bridge of bothwell over which the enemy must necessarily advance to the attack but like the others they were divided and disheartened and entertaining the idea that they were posted on a desperate service 
they even meditated withdrawing themselves to the main body this would have been utter ruin for on the defence or loss of this pass the fortune of the day was most likely to depend all beyond the bridge was a plain open field excepting a few thickets of no great depth and consequently was ground on which the undisciplined forces of the insurgents deficient as they were in cavalry and totally unprovided with artillery were altogether unlikely to withstand the shock of regular troops morton therefore viewed the pass carefully and formed the hope that by occupying two or three houses on the left bank of the river with the copse and thickets of alders and hazels that lined its side and by blockading the passage itself and shutting the gates of a portal which according to the old fashion was built on the central arch of the bridge of bothwell it might be easily defended against a very superior force he issued directions accordingly and commanded the parapets of the bridge on the farther side of the portal to be thrown down that they might afford no protection to the enemy when they should attempt the passage morton then conjured the party at this important post to be watchful and upon their guard and promised them a speedy and strong reinforcement he caused them to advance vedettes beyond the river to watch the progress of the enemy which outposts he directed should be withdrawn to the left bank as soon as they approached finally he charged them to send regular information to the main body of all that they should observe men under arms and in a situation of danger are usually sufficiently alert in appreciating the merit of their officers morton's intelligence and activity gained the confidence of these men and with better hope and heart than before they began to fortify their position in the manner he recommended and saw him depart with three loud cheers morton now galloped hastily towards the main body of the insurgents but was surprised and shocked at the scene of confusion and clamour which it exhibited at the moment when good order and concord were of such essential consequence instead of being drawn up in line of battle and listening to the commands of their officers they were crowding together in a confused mass that rolled and agitated itself like the waves of the sea while a thousand tongues spoke or rather vociferated and not a single ear was found to listen scandalized at a scene so extraordinary morton endeavoured to make his way through the press to learn and if possible to remove the cause of this so untimely disorder while he is thus engaged we shall make the reader acquainted with that which he was some time in discovering the insurgents had proceeded to hold their day of humiliation which agreeably to the practice of the puritans during the earlier civil war they considered as the most effectual mode of solving all difficulties and waiving all discussions it was usual to name an ordinary week-day for this purpose but on this occasion the sabbath itself was adopted owing to the pressure of the time and the vicinity of the enemy a temporary pulpit or tent was erected in the middle of the encampment which according to the fixed arrangement was first to be occupied by the rev peter poundtext to whom the post of honour was assigned as the eldest clergyman present but as the worthy divine with slow and stately steps was advancing towards the rostrum which had been prepared for him he was prevented by the unexpected apparition of habakkuk mucklewrath the insane preacher whose appearance had so much startled morton at the first council of the insurgents after their victory at loudon hill it was not known whether he was acting under the influence and instigation of the cameronians or whether he was merely compelled 
by his own agitated imagination and the temptation of a vacant pulpit before him to seize the opportunity of exhorting so respectable a congregation it is only certain that he took occasion by the forelock sprung into the pulpit cast his eyes wildly round him and undismayed by the murmurs of many of the audience opened the bible read forth as his text from the thirteenth chapter of deuteronomy certain men the children of belial are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city saying let us go and serve other gods which you have not known and then rushed at once into the midst of his subject the harangue of mucklewrath was as wild and extravagant as his intrusion was unauthorized and untimely but it was provokingly coherent in so far as it turned entirely upon the very subjects of discord of which it had been agreed to adjourn the consideration until some more suitable opportunity not a single topic did he omit which had offence in it and after charging the moderate party with heresy with crouching to tyranny with seeking to be at peace with god's enemy he applied to morton by name the charge that he had been one of those men of belial who in the words of his text had gone out from amongst them to withdraw the inhabitants of his city and to go astray after false gods to him and all who followed him or approved of his conduct mucklewrath denounced fury and vengeance and exhorted those who would hold themselves pure and undefiled to come up from the midst of them fear not he said because of the neighing of horses or the glittering of breastplates seek not aid of the egyptians because of the enemy though they may be numerous as locusts and fierce as dragons their trust is not as our trust nor their rock as our rock how else shall a thousand fly before one and two put ten thousand to the flight i dreamed it in the visions of the night and the voice said habakkuk take thy fan and purge the wheat from the chaff that they be not both consumed with the fire of indignation and the lightning of fury wherefore i say take this henry morton this wretched Aachen, who hath brought the accursed thing among ye and made himself brethren in the camp of the enemy take him and stone him with stones and thereafter burn him with fire that the wrath may depart from the children of the covenant he hath not taken a babylonish garment but he hath sold the garment of righteousness to the women of babylon he hath not taken two hundred shekels of fine silver but he hath bartered the truth which is more precious than shekels of silver or wedges of gold at this furious charge brought so unexpectedly against one of their most active commanders the audience broke out into open tumult some demanding that there should instantly be a new election of officers into which office none should hereafter be admitted who had in their phrase touched of that which was accursed or temporized more or less with the heresies and corruptions of the times while such was the demand of the cameronians they vociferated loudly that those who were not with them were against them that it was no time to relinquish the substantial part of the covenanted testimony of the church if they expected a blessing on their arms and their cause and that in their eyes a lukewarm presbyterian was little better than a prelatist an anti-covenanter and a nullifidian the parties accused repelled the charge of criminal compliance and defection from the truth with scorn and indignation and charged their accusers with breach of faith as well as with wrong-headed and extravagant zeal in introducing such divisions into an army the joint strength of which could not by the most sanguine 
be judged more than sufficient to face their enemies pound text and one or two others made some faint efforts to stem the increasing fury of the factious exclaiming to those of the other party in the words of the patriarch let there be no strife i pray thee between me and thee and between thy herdsmen and my herdsmen for we be brethren no pacific overture could possibly obtain audience it was in vain that even burley himself when he saw the dissension proceed to such ruinous lengths exerted his stern and deep voice commanding silence and obedience to discipline the spirit of insubordination had gone forth and it seemed as if the exhortation of habakkuk mucklewrath had communicated a part of his frenzy to all who heard him the wiser or more timid part of the assembly were already withdrawing themselves from the field and giving up their cause as lost others were moderating a harmonious call as they somewhat improperly termed it to new officers and dismissing those formerly chosen and that with a tumult and clamour worthy of the deficiency of good sense and good order implied in the whole transaction it was at this moment when morton arrived in the field and joined the army in total confusion and on the point of dissolving itself his arrival occasioned loud exclamations of applause on the one side and of imprecation on the other what means this ruinous disorder at such a moment he exclaimed to burley who exhausted with his vain exertions to restore order was now leaning on his sword and regarding the confusion with an eye of resolute despair it means he replied that god has delivered us into the hands of our enemies not so answered morton with a voice and gesture which compelled many to listen it is not god who deserts us it is we who desert him and dishonour ourselves by disgracing and betraying the cause of freedom and religion hear me he exclaimed springing to the pulpit which mucklewrath had been compelled to evacuate by actual exhaustion i bring from the enemy an offer to treat if you incline to lay down your arms i can assure you the means of making an honourable defence if you are of more manly tempers the time flies fast on let us resolve either for peace or war and let it not be said of us in future days that six thousand scottish men in arms had neither courage to stand their ground and fight it out nor prudence to treat for peace nor even the coward's wisdom to retreat in good time and with safety what signifies quarrelling on minute points of church discipline when the whole edifice is threatened with total destruction oh remember my brethren that the last and worst evil which god brought upon the people whom he had once chosen the last and worst punishment of their blindness and hardness of heart was the bloody dissensions which rent asunder their city even when the enemy were thundering at its gates some of the audience testified their feeling of this exhortation by loud exclamations of applause others by hooting and exclaiming to your tents o israel morton who beheld the columns of the enemy already beginning to appear on the right bank and directing their march upon the bridge raised his voice to its utmost pitch and pointing at the same time with his hand exclaimed silence your senseless clamours yonder is the enemy on maintaining the bridge against him depend our lives as well as our hope to reclaim our laws and liberties there shall at least one scottishman die in their defence let any one who loves his country follow me the multitude had turned their heads in the direction to which he pointed the sight of the glittering files of the english foot-guards supported by several squadrons of horse 
of the cannon which the artillerymen were busily engaged in planting against the bridge of the platted clans who seemed to search for a ford and of the long succession of troops which were destined to support the attack silenced at once their clamorous uproar and struck them with as much consternation as if it were an unexpected apparition and not the very thing which they ought to have been looking out for they gazed on each other and on their leaders with looks resembling those that indicate the weakness of a patient when exhausted by a fit of frenzy yet when morton springing from the rostrum directed his steps towards the bridge he was followed by about an hundred of the young men who were particularly attached to his command burley turned to macbriar ephraim he said it is providence points us the way through the worldly wisdom of this latitudinarian youth he that loves the light let him follow burley terry replied macbriar it is not by henry morton or such as he that our goings out and our comings in are to be meted therefore tarry with us i fear treachery to the host from this nullifidian aachen thou shalt not go with him thou art our chariots and our horsemen hinder me not replied burley he hath well said that all is lost if the enemy win the bridge therefore let me not shall the children of this generation be called wiser or braver than the children of the sanctuary array yourselves under your leaders let us not lack supplies of men and ammunition and accursed be he who turneth back from the work on this great day having thus spoken he hastily marched towards the bridge and was followed by about two hundred of the most gallant and zealous of his party there was a deep and disheartened pause when morton and burley departed the commanders availed themselves of it to display their lines in some sort of order and exhorted those who were most exposed to throw themselves upon their faces to avoid the cannonade which they might presently expect the insurgents ceased to resist or to remonstrate but the awe which had silenced their discords had dismayed their courage they suffered themselves to be formed into ranks with the docility of a flock of sheep but without possessing for the time more resolution or energy for they experienced a sinking of the heart imposed by the sudden and imminent approach of the danger which they had neglected to provide against while it was yet distant they were however drawn out with some regularity and as they still possessed the appearance of an army their leaders had only to hope that some favourable circumstance would restore their spirits and courage kettledrummel poundtext macbriar and other preachers busied themselves in their ranks and prevailed on them to raise a psalm but the superstitious among them observed as an ill omen that their song of praise and triumph sunk into a quaver of consternation and resembled rather a penitentiary stave sung on the scaffold of a condemned criminal than the bold strain which had resounded along the wild heath of loudon hill in anticipation of that day's victory the melancholy melody soon received a rough accompaniment the royal soldier shouted the highlanders yelled the cannon began to fire on one side and the musketry on both and the bridge of bothwell with the banks adjacent were involved in wreaths of smoke This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 11 of Old Mortality by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. 
as ever ye saw the rain down fall or yet the arrow from the bow so our scots lads fell even down and they lay slain on every knoll old ballad ere morton or burley had reached the post to be defended the enemy had commenced an attack upon it with great spirit the two regiments of foot guards formed into a close column rushed forward to the river one corps deploying along the right bank commenced a galling fire on the defenders of the pass while the other pressed on to occupy the bridge the insurgents sustained the attack with great constancy and courage and while part of their number returned the fire across the river the rest maintained a discharge of musketry upon the further end of the bridge itself and every avenue by which the soldiers endeavoured to approach it the latter suffered severely but still gained ground and the head of their column was already upon the bridge when the arrival of morton changed the scene and his marksmen commencing upon the pass a fire as well aimed as it was sustained and regular compelled the assailants to retire with much loss they were a second time brought up to the charge and a second time repulsed with still greater loss as burley had now brought his party into action the fire was continued with the utmost vehemence on both sides and the issue of the action seemed very dubious monmouth mounted on a superb white charger might be discovered on the top of the right bank of the river urging entreating and animating the exertions of his soldiers by his orders the cannon which had hitherto been employed in annoying the distant main body of the presbyterians were now turned upon the defenders of the bridge but these tremendous engines being wrought much more slowly than in modern times did not produce the effect of annoying or terrifying the enemy to the extent proposed the insurgents sheltered by copsewood along the bank of the river or stationed in the houses already mentioned fought under cover while the royalists owing to the precautions of morton were entirely exposed the defence was so protracted and obstinate that the royal generals began to fear it might be ultimately successful while monmouth threw himself from his horse and rallying the foot guards brought them on to another close and desperate attack he was warmly seconded by dalzell who putting himself at the head of a body of lennox highlanders rushed forward with their tremendous war-cry of loch sloy the ammunition of the defenders of the bridge began to fail at this important crisis messages commanding and imploring succors and supplies were in vain dispatched one after the other to the main body of the presbyterian army which remained inactively drawn up on the open fields in the rear fear consternation and misrule had gone abroad among them and while the post on which their safety depended required to be instantly and powerfully reinforced there remained none either to command or to obey as the fire of the defenders of the bridge began to slacken that of the assailants increased and in its turn became more fatal animated by the example and exhortations of their generals they obtained a footing upon the bridge itself and began to remove the obstacles by which it was blockaded the portal gate was broke open the beams trunks of trees and other materials of the barricade pulled down and thrown into the river this was not accomplished without opposition morton and burley fought to the very front of their followers and encouraged them with their pikes halberds and partisans to encounter the bayonets of the guards and the broadswords of the highlanders but those behind the leaders began to shrink from the unequal combat and fly singly 
or in parties of two or three towards the main body until the remainder were by the mere weight of the hostile column as much as by their weapons fairly forced from the bridge the passage now being open the enemy began to pour over but the bridge was long and narrow which rendered the manoeuvre slow as well as dangerous and those who were first passed had still to force the houses from the windows of which the covenanters continued to fire burley and morton were near each other at this critical moment there is yet time said the former to bring down horse to attack them ere they can get into order and with the aid of god we may thus regain the bridge hasten thou to bring them down while i make the defence good with this old and wearied body morton saw the importance of the advice and throwing himself on the horse which cuddy held in readiness for him behind the thicket galloped towards a body of cavalry which chanced to be composed entirely of cameronians ere he could speak his errand or utter his orders he was saluted by the execrations of the whole body he flies they exclaimed the cowardly traitor flies like a hart from the hunters and hath left valiant burley in the midst of the slaughter i do not fly said morton i come to lead you to the attack advance boldly and we shall yet do well follow him not follow him not such were the tumultuous exclamations which resounded from the ranks he hath sold you to the sword of the enemy and while morton argued entreated and commanded in vain the moment was lost in which the advance might have been useful and the outlet from the bridge with all its defences being in complete possession of the enemy burley and his remaining followers were driven back upon the main body to whom the spectacle of their hurried and harassed retreat was far from restoring the confidence which they had so much wanted in the meanwhile the forces of the king crossed the bridge at their leisure and securing the pass formed in line of battle while claverhouse who like a hawk perched on a rock and eyeing the time to pounce on its prey had watched the event of the action from the opposite bank now passed the bridge at the head of his cavalry at full trot and leading them in squadrons through the intervals and round the flanks of the royal infantry formed them in line on the moor and led them to the charge advancing in front with one large body while other two divisions threatened the flanks of the covenanters their devoted army was now in that situation when the slightest demonstration towards an attack was certain to inspire panic their broken spirits and disheartened courage were unable to endure the charge of the cavalry attended with all its terrible accompaniments of sight and sound the rush of the horses at full speed the shaking of the earth under their feet the glancing of the swords the waving of the plumes and the fierce shouts of the cavaliers the front ranks hardly attempted one ill-directed and disorderly fire and their rear were broken and flying in confusion ere the charge had been completed and in less than five minutes the horsemen were mixed with them cutting and hewing without mercy the voice of claverhouse was heard even above the din of conflict exclaiming to his soldiers kill kill no quarter think on richard graham the dragoons many of whom had shared the disgrace of loudon hill required no exhortations to vengeance as easy as it was complete their swords drank deep of slaughter among the unresisting fugitives screams for quarter were only answered by the shouts with which the pursuers accompanied their blows and the whole field presented one general scene of confused slaughter flight and pursuit about twelve hundred of the insurgents who remained in a body a little apart from the rest 
and out of the line of the charge of cavalry threw down their arms and surrendered at discretion upon the approach of the duke of monmouth at the head of the infantry that mild-tempered nobleman instantly allowed them the quarter which they prayed for and galloping about through the field exerted himself as much to stop the slaughter as he had done to obtain the victory while busied in this humane task he met with general dalzell who was encouraging the fierce highlanders and royal volunteers to show their zeal for king and country by quenching the flame of the rebellion with the blood of the rebels sheath your sword i command you general exclaimed the duke and sound the retreat enough of blood has been shed give quarter to the king's misguided subjects i obey your grace said the old man wiping his bloody sword and returning it to the scabbard but i warn you at the same time that enough has not been done to intimidate these desperate rebels has not your grace heard that basil oliphant has collected several gentlemen and men of substance in the west and is in the act of marching to join them basil oliphant said the duke who or what is he the next male heir to the last earl of torwood he is disaffected to government from his claim to the estate being set aside in favour of lady margaret bellenden and i suppose the hope of getting the inheritance has set him in motion be his motives what they will replied monmouth he must soon disperse his followers for this army is too much broken to rally again therefore once more i command that the pursuit be stopped it is your grace's province to command and to be responsible for your commands answered dalzell as he gave reluctant orders for checking the pursuit but the fiery and vindictive graham was already far out of hearing of the signal of retreat and continued with his cavalry an unwearied and bloody pursuit breaking dispersing and cutting to pieces all the insurgents whom they could come up with burley and morton were both hurried off the field by the confused tide of fugitives they made some attempt to defend the streets of the town of hamilton but while labouring to induce the flyers to face about and stand to their weapons burley received a bullet which broke his sword-arm may the hand be withered that shot the shot he exclaimed as the sword which he was waving over his head fell powerless to his side i can fight no longer then turning his horse's head he retreated out of the confusion morton also now saw that the continuing his unavailing efforts to rally the flyers could only end in his own death or captivity and followed by the faithful cuddy he extracted himself from the press and being well mounted leaped his horse over one or two enclosures and got into the open country from the first hill which they gained in their flight they looked back and beheld the whole country covered with their fugitive companions and with the pursuing dragoons whose wild shouts and halloo as they did execution on the groups whom they overtook mingled with the groans and screams of their victims rose shrilly up the hill it is impossible they can ever make head again said morton the heads taken off them as clean as i would bite it off a sibo rejoined cuddy eh lord see how the broadswords are flashing war's a fearsome thing there'll be cunning that catches me at this work again but for god's sake sir let us make for some strength morton saw the necessity of following the advice of his trusty squire they resumed a rapid pace and continued it without intermission directing their course towards the wild and mountainous country where they thought it likely some part of the fugitives might draw together for the sake either of making defence or of obtaining terms chapter twelve of old mortality by sir walter scott 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. They require of heaven the hearts of lions, breath of tigers, yea, and the fierceness too. Fletcher. Evening had fallen, and for the last two hours they had seen none of their ill-fated companions when morton and his faithful attendant gained the moorland and approached a large and solitary farmhouse situated in the entrance of a wild glen far remote from any other habitation our horses said morton will carry us no farther without rest or food and we must try to obtain them here if possible so speaking he led the way to the house the place had every appearance of being inhabited there was smoke issuing from the chimney in a considerable volume and the marks of recent hoofs were visible around the door they could even hear the murmuring of human voices within the house but all the lower windows were closely secured and when they knocked at the door no answer was returned after vainly calling and entreating admittance they withdrew to the stable or shed in order to accommodate their horses ere they used farther means of gaining admission in this place they found ten or twelve horses whose state of fatigue as well as the military yet disordered appearance of their saddles and accoutrements plainly indicated that their owners were fugitive insurgents in their own circumstances this meeting bodes luck said cuddy and they have wealth of beef that's one thing certain for here's a raw hide that has been about the hurdies of a stot not half an hour since it's warm yet encouraged by these appearances they returned again to the house and announcing themselves as men in the same predicament with the inmates clamoured loudly for admittance whoever ye be answered a stern voice from the window after a long and obdurate silence disturb not those who mourn for the desolation and captivity of the land and search out the causes of wrath and of defection that the stumbling blocks may be removed over which we have stumbled they are wild western whigs said cuddy in a whisper to his master i can by their language fiend have me if i like to venture on them morton however again called to the party within and insisted on admittance but finding his entreaties still disregarded he opened one of the lower windows and pushing asunder the shutters which were but slightly secured stepped into the large kitchen from which the voice had issued cuddy followed him muttering betwixt his teeth as he put his head within the window that he hoped there was no scalding brose on the fire and master and servant both found themselves in the company of ten or twelve armed men seated around the fire on which refreshments were preparing and busied apparently in their devotions in the gloomy countenances illuminated by the firelight morton had no difficulty in recognizing several of those zealots who had most distinguished themselves by their intemperate opposition to all moderate measures together with their noted pastor the fanatical ephraim macbriar and the maniac habakkuk mucklewrath the cameronians neither stirred tongue nor hand to welcome their brethren in misfortune but continued to listen to the low murmured exercise of macbriar as he prayed that the almighty would lift up his hand from his people and not make an end in the day of his anger that they were conscious of the presence of the intruders only appeared from the sullen and indignant glances which they shot at them from time to time as their eyes encountered morton finding into what unfriendly society he had unwittingly intruded began to think of retreating but on turning his head 
observed with some alarm that two strong men had silently placed themselves beside the window through which they had entered one of these ominous sentinels whispered to cuddy son of that precious woman maz hedrig do not cast thy lot farther with this child of treachery and perdition pass on thy way and tarry not for the avenger of blood is behind thee with this he pointed to the window out of which cuddy jumped without hesitation for the intimation he had received plainly implied the personal danger he would otherwise incur winox are no lucky with me was his first reflection when he was in the open air his next was upon the probable fate of his master they'll kill him the murdering loons and think they're doing a good turn but i's take the back road for hamilton and see if i canna get some of our own folk to bring help in time of necessity so saying cuddy hastened to the stable and taking the best horse he could find instead of his own tired animal he galloped off in the direction he proposed the noise of his horse's tread alarmed for an instant the devotion of the fanatics as it died in the distance macbriar brought his exercise to a conclusion and his audience raised themselves from the stooping posture and lowering downward look with which they had listened to it and all fixed their eyes sternly on henry morton you bend strange countenances on me gentlemen said he addressing them i am totally ignorant in what manner i have deserved them out upon thee out upon thee exclaimed mucklewrath starting up this word that thou hast spurned shall become a rock to crush and to bruise thee the spear which thou wouldst have broken shall pierce thy side we have prayed and wrestled and petitioned for an offering to atone the sins of the congregation and lo the very head of the offence is delivered into our hand he hath burst in like a thief through the window he is a ram caught in the thicket whose blood shall be a drink-offering to redeem vengeance from the church and the place shall from henceforth be called jehovah jera for the sacrifice is provided up then and bind the victim with cords to the horns of the altar there was a movement among the party and deeply did morton regret at that moment the incautious haste with which he had ventured into their company he was armed only with his sword for he had left his pistols at the bow of his saddle and as the wigs were all provided with firearms there was little or no chance of escaping from them by resistance the interposition however of macbriar protected him for the moment tarry yet a while brethren let us not use the sword rashly lest the load of innocent blood lie heavy on us come he said addressing himself to morton we will reckon with thee ere we avenge the cause thou hast betrayed hast thou not he continued made thy face as hard as flint against the truth in all the assemblies of the host he has he has murmured the deep voices of the assistants he hath ever urged peace with the malignants said one and pleaded for the dark and dismal guilt of the indulgence said another and would have surrendered the host into the hands of monmouth echoed a third and was the first to desert the honest and manly burleigh while he yet resisted at the pass i saw him on the moor with his horse bloody with spurring long ere the firing had ceased at the bridge gentlemen said morton if you mean to bear me down by clamour and take my life without hearing me it is perhaps a thing in your power but you will sin before god and man by the commission of such a murder i say hear the youth said macbriar for heaven knows our bowels have yearned for him that he might be brought to see the truth 
and exert his gifts in its defence but he is blinded by his carnal knowledge and has spurned the light when it blazed before him silence being obtained morton proceeded to assert the good faith which he had displayed in the treaty with monmouth and the active part he had borne in the subsequent action i may not gentlemen he said be fully able to go the lengths you desire in assigning to those of my own religion the means of tyrannizing over others but none shall go farther in asserting our own lawful freedom and i must needs aver that had others been of my mind in council or disposed to stand by my side in battle we should this evening instead of being a defeated and discordant remnant have sheathed our weapons in an useful and honourable peace or brandished them triumphantly after a decisive victory he hath spoken the word said one of the assembly he hath avowed his carnal self-seeking and erastianism let him die the death peace yet again said macbriar for i will try him further was it not by thy means that the malignant evandale twice escaped from death and captivity was it not through thee that miles bellenden and his garrison of cutthroats were saved from the edge of the sword i am proud to say that you have spoken the truth in both instances replied morton lo you see said macbriar again hath his mouth spoken it and didst thou not do this for the sake of a midianitish woman one of the spawn of prelacy a toy with which the arch enemy's trap is baited didst thou not do all this for the sake of edith bellenden you are incapable answered morton boldly of appreciating my feelings towards that young lady but all that i have done i would have done had she never existed thou art a hardy rebel to the truth said another dark-browed man and didst thou not so act that by conveying away the aged woman margaret bellenden and her granddaughter thou mightest thwart the wise and godly project of john balfour of burley for bringing forth to battle basil oliphant who had agreed to take the field if he were ensured possession of these women's worldly endowments i never heard of such a scheme said morton and therefore i could not thwart it but does your religion permit you to take such uncreditable and immoral modes of recruiting peace said macbriar somewhat disconcerted it is not for thee to instruct tender professors or to construe covenant obligations for the rest you have acknowledged enough of sin and sorrowful defection to draw down defeat on a host were it as numerous as the sands on the seashore and it is our judgment that we are not free to let you pass from us safe and in life since providence hath given you into our hands at the moment that we prayed with godly joshua saying what shall we say when israel turneth their backs before their enemies then camest thou delivered to us as it were by lot that thou mightest sustain the punishment of one that hath wrought folly in israel therefore mark my words this is the sabbath and our hand shall not be on thee to spill thy blood upon this day but when the twelfth hour shall strike it is a token that thy time on earth hath run wherefore improve thy span for it flitteth fast away seize on the prisoner brethren and take his weapon the command was so unexpectedly given and so suddenly executed by those of the party who had gradually closed behind and around morton that he was overpowered disarmed and a horse girth passed round his arms before he could offer any effectual resistance when this was accomplished a dead and stern silence took place the fanatics ranged themselves around a large oaken table 
placing morton amongst them bound and helpless in such a manner as to be opposite to the clock which was to strike his knell food was placed before them of which they offered their intended victim a share but it will readily be believed he had little appetite when this was removed the party resumed their devotions macbriar whose fierce zeal did not perhaps exclude some feelings of doubt and compunction began to expostulate in prayer as if to wring from the deity a signal that the bloody sacrifice they proposed was an acceptable service the eyes and ears of his hearers were anxiously strained as if to gain some sight or sound which might be converted or rested into a type of approbation and ever and anon dark looks were turned on the dial-plate of the timepiece to watch its progress towards the moment of execution morton's eye frequently took the same course with the sad reflection that there appeared no possibility of his life being expanded beyond the narrow segment which the index had yet to travel on the circle until it arrived at the fatal hour faith in his religion with a constant unyielding principle of honour and the sense of conscious innocence enabled him to pass through this dreadful interval with less agitation than he himself could have expected had the situation been prophesied to him yet there was a want of that eager and animating sense of right which supported him in similar circumstances when in the power of claverhouse then he was conscious that amid the spectators were many who were lamenting his condition and some who applauded his conduct but now among these pale-eyed and ferocious zealots whose hardened brows were soon to be bent not merely with indifference but with triumph upon his execution without a friend to speak a kindly word or give a look either of sympathy or encouragement awaiting till the sword destined to slay him crept out of the scabbard gradually and as it were by straw breaths and condemned to drink the bitterness of death drop by drop it is no wonder that his feelings were less composed than they had been on any former occasion of danger his destined executioners as he gazed around them seemed to alter their forms and features like spectres in a feverish dream their figures became larger and their faces more disturbed and as an excited imagination predominated over the realities which his eyes received he could have thought himself surrounded rather by a band of demons than of human beings the walls seemed to drop with blood and the light tick of the clock thrilled on his ear with such loud painful distinctness as if each sound were the prick of a bodkin inflicted on the naked nerve of the organ it was with pain that he felt his mind wavering while on the brink between this and the future world he made a strong effort to compose himself to devotional exercises and unequal during that fearful strife of nature to arrange his own thoughts into suitable expressions he had instinctively recourse to the petition for deliverance and for composure of spirit which is to be found in the book of common prayer of the church of england macbriar whose family were of that persuasion instantly recognized the words which the unfortunate prisoner pronounced half aloud there lacked but this he said his pale cheek kindling with resentment to root out my carnal reluctance to see his blood spilt he is a prelatist who has sought the camp under the disguise of an erastian and all and more than all that has been said of him must needs be verity his blood be on his head the deceiver let him go down to tophet with the ill-mumbled mass which he calls a prayer-book in his right hand 
i take up my song against him exclaimed the maniac as the sun went back on the dial ten degrees for intimating the recovery of holy hezekiah so it now go forward that the wicked may be taken away from among the people and the covenant established in its purity he sprang to a chair with an attitude of frenzy in order to anticipate the fatal moment by putting the index forward and several of the party began to make ready their slaughter weapons for immediate execution when mucklewrath's hand was arrested by one of his companions hist he said i hear a distant noise it is the rushing of the brook over the pebbles said one it is the sough of the wind among the bracken said another it is the galloping of horse said morton to himself his sense of hearing rendered acute by the dreadful situation in which he stood god grant they may come as my deliverers the noise approached rapidly and became more and more distinct it is hoarse cried macbriar look out and descry who they are the enemy are upon us cried one who had opened the window in obedience to his order a thick trampling and loud voices were heard immediately round the house some rose to resist and some to escape the doors and windows were forced at once and the red coats of the troopers appeared in the apartment have at the bloody rebels remember cornet graham was shouted on every side the lights were struck down but the dubious glare of the fire enabled them to continue the fray several pistol shots were fired the whig who stood next to morton received a shot as he was rising stumbled against the prisoner whom he bore down with his weight and lay stretched above him a dying man this accident probably saved morton from the damage he might otherwise have received in so close a struggle where firearms were discharged and sword blows given for upwards of five minutes is the prisoner safe exclaimed the well-known voice of claverhouse look about for him and dispatch the wig dog who is groaning there both orders were executed the groans of the wounded man were silenced by a thrust with a rapier and morton disencumbered of his weight was speedily raised and in the arms of the faithful cuddy who blubbered for joy when he found that the blood with which his master was covered had not flowed from his own veins a whisper in morton's ear while his trusty follower relieved him from his bonds explained the secret of the very timely appearance of the soldiers i fell into claverhouse's party when i was seeking for some of our own folk to help ye out of the hands of the whigs so being a twin the devil and the deep sea i even thought it best to bring him on with me for he'll be wearied with felling folk the night and the morn's a new day and lord evandale owes ye a day in harst and monmouth gives quarter the dragoons tell me for the asking so hold up your heart and i's warrant will do all well enough yet chapter thirteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah sound sound the clarion fill the fife to all the sensual world proclaim one crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name anonymous when the desperate affray had ceased claverhouse commanded his soldiers to remove the dead bodies to refresh themselves and their horses and prepare for passing the night at the farmhouse and for marching early in the ensuing morning he then turned his attention to morton and there was politeness and even kindness in the manner in which he addressed him 
you would have saved yourself risk from both sides mr morton if you had honoured my counsel yesterday morning with some attention but i respect your motives you are a prisoner of war at the disposal of the king and council but you shall be treated with no incivility and i will be satisfied with your parole that you will not attempt an escape when morton had passed his word to that effect cleverhouse bowed civilly and turning away from him called for his sergeant-major how many prisoners halliday and how many killed three killed in the house sir two cut down in the court and one in the garden six in all four prisoners armed or unarmed said claverhouse three of them armed to the teeth answered halliday one without arms he seems to be a preacher ay the trumpeter to the long-eared rout i suppose replied claverhouse glancing slightly round upon his victims i will talk with him to-morrow take the other three down to the yard draw out two files and fire upon them and do ye hear make a memorandum in the orderly book of three rebels taken in arms and shot with the date and name of the place drum shinnel i think they call it look after the preacher till to-morrow as he was not armed he must undergo a short examination or better perhaps take him before the privy council i think they should relieve me of a share of this disgusting drudgery let mr morton be civilly used and see that the men look well after their horses and let my groom wash wild blood's shoulder with some vinegar the saddle has touched him a little all these various orders for life and death the securing of his prisoners and the washing of his charger's shoulder were given in the same unmoved and equable voice of which no accent or tone intimated that the speaker considered one direction as of more importance than another the cameronians so lately about to be the willing agents of a bloody execution were now themselves to undergo it they seemed prepared alike for either extremity nor did any of them show the least sign of fear when ordered to leave the room for the purpose of meeting instant death their severe enthusiasm sustained them in that dreadful moment and they departed with a firm look and in silence excepting that one of them as he left the apartment looked claverhouse full in the face and pronounced with a stern and steady voice mischief shall haunt the violent man to which graham only answered by a smile of contempt they had no sooner left the room than claverhouse applied himself to some food which one or two of his party had hastily provided and invited morton to follow his example observing it had been a busy day for them both morton declined eating for the sudden change of circumstances the transition from the verge of the grave to a prospect of life had occasioned a dizzy revulsion in his whole system but the same confused sensation was accompanied by a burning thirst and he expressed his wish to drink i will pledge you with all my heart said claverhouse for here is a black jack full of ale and good it must be if there be good in the country for the whigs never miss to find it out my service to you mr morton he said filling one horn of ale for himself and handing another to his prisoner morton raised it to his head and was just about to drink when the discharge of carabins beneath the window followed by a deep and hollow groan repeated twice or thrice and more faint at each interval announced the fate of the three men who had just left them morton shuddered and set down the untasted cup you are but young in these matters mr morton said claverhouse after he had very composedly finished his draught and i do not think the worse of you as a young soldier for appearing to feel them acutely but habit 
duty and necessity reconcile men to everything i trust said morton they will never reconcile me to such scenes as these you would hardly believe said claverhouse in reply that in the beginning of my military career i had as much aversion to seeing blood spilt as ever man felt it seemed to me to be wrung from my own heart and yet if you trust one of those whig fellows he will tell you i drink a warm cup of it every morning before i breakfast but in truth mr morton why should we care so much for death light upon us or around us whenever it may men die daily not a bell tolls the hour but it is the death-note of some one or other and why hesitate to shorten the span of others or take over anxious care to prolong our own it is all a lottery when the hour of midnight came you were to die it has struck you are alive and safe and the lot has fallen on those fellows who were to murder you it is not the expiring pang that is worth thinking of in an event that must happen one day and may befall us on any given moment it is the memory which the soldier leaves behind him like the long train of light that follows the sunken sun that is all which is worth caring for which distinguishes the death of the brave or the ignoble when i think of death mr morton as a thing worth thinking of it is in the hope of pressing one day some well-fought and hard-won field of battle and dying with the shout of victory in my ear that would be worth dying for and more it would be worth having lived for at the moment when graham delivered these sentiments his eye glancing with the martial enthusiasm which formed such a prominent feature in his character a gory figure which seemed to rise out of the floor of the apartment stood upright before him and presented the wild person and hideous features of the maniac so often mentioned his face where it was not covered with blood-streaks was ghastly pale for the hand of death was on him he bent upon claverhouse eyes in which the grey light of insanity still twinkled though just about to flit for ever and exclaimed with his usual wildness of ejaculation wilt thou trust in thy bow and in thy spear in thy steed and in thy banner and shall not god visit thee for innocent blood wilt thou glory in thy wisdom and in thy courage and in thy might and shall not the lord judge thee behold the princes for whom thou hast sold thy soul to the destroyer shall be removed from their place and banished to other lands and their names shall be a desolation and an astonishment and a hissing and a curse and thou who hast partaken of the wine-cup of fury and hast been drunken and mad because thereof the wish of thy heart shall be granted to thy loss and the hope of thine own pride shall destroy thee i summon thee john graham to appear before the tribunal of god to answer for this innocent blood and the seas besides which thou hast shed he drew his right hand across his bleeding face and held it up to heaven as he uttered these words which he spoke very loud and then added more faintly how long o lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge the blood of thy saints as he uttered the last word he fell backwards without an attempt to save himself and was a dead man ere his head touched the floor morton was much shocked at this extraordinary scene and the prophecy of the dying man which tallied so strangely with the wish which claverhouse had just expressed and he often thought of it afterwards when that wish seemed to be accomplished two of the dragoons who were in the apartment hardened as they were and accustomed to such scenes showed great consternation at the sudden apparition the event 
and the words which preceded it claverhouse alone was unmoved at the first instant of mucklewrath's appearance he had put his hand to his pistol but on seeing the situation of the wounded wretch he immediately withdrew it and listened with great composure to his dying exclamation when he dropped claverhouse asked in an unconcerned tone of voice how came the fellow here speak you staring fool he added addressing the nearest dragoon unless you would have me think you such a poltroon as to fear a dying man the dragoon crossed himself and replied with a faltering voice that the dead fellow had escaped their notice when they removed the other bodies as he chanced to have fallen where a cloak or two had been flung aside and covered him take him away now then you gaping idiot and see that he does not bite you to put an old proverb to shame this is a new incident mr morton that dead men should rise and push us from our stools i must see that my blackguards grind their swords sharper they used not to do their work so slovenly but we have had a busy day they are tired and their blades blunted with their bloody work and i suppose you mr morton as well as i are well disposed for a few hours repose so saying he yawned and taking a candle which a soldier had placed ready saluted morton courteously and walked to the apartment which had been prepared for him morton was also accommodated for the evening with a separate room being left alone his first occupation was the returning thanks to heaven for redeeming him from danger even through the instrumentality of those who seemed his most dangerous enemies he also prayed sincerely for the divine assistance in guiding his course through times which held out so many dangers and so many errors and having thus poured out his spirit in prayer before the great being who gave it he betook himself to the repose which he so much required chapter fourteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah the charge is prepared the lawyers are met the judges all ranged a terrible show beggars opera so deep was the slumber which succeeded the agitation and embarrassment of the preceding day that morton hardly knew where he was when it was broken by the tramp of horses the hoarse voice of men and the wild sound of the trumpets blowing the reveille the sergeant-major immediately afterwards came to summon him which he did in a very respectful manner saying the general for claverhouse now held that rank hoped for the pleasure of his company upon the road in some situations an intimation is a command and morton considered that the present occasion was one of these he waited upon claverhouse as speedily as he could found his own horse saddled for his use and cutty in attendance both were deprived of their firearms though they seemed otherwise rather to make part of the troop than of the prisoners and morton was permitted to retain his sword the wearing which was in those days the distinguishing mark of a gentleman claverhouse seemed also to take pleasure in riding beside him in conversing with him and in confounding his ideas when he attempted to appreciate his real character the gentleness and urbanity of that officer's general manners the high and chivalrous sentiments of military devotion which he occasionally expressed his deep and accurate insight into the human bosom demanded at once the approbation and the wonder of those who conversed with him while on the other hand his cold indifference to military violence and cruelty seemed altogether inconsistent with the social 
and even admirable qualities which he displayed morton could not help in his heart contrasting him with balfour of burleigh and so deeply did the idea impress him that he dropped a hint of it as they rode together at some distance from the troop you are right said claverhouse with a smile you are very right we are both fanatics but there is some distinction between the fanaticism of honour and that of dark and sullen superstition yet you both shed blood without mercy or remorse said morton who could not suppress his feelings surely said claverhouse with the same composure but of what kind there is a difference i trust between the blood of learned and reverend prelates and scholars of gallant soldiers and noble gentlemen and the red puddle that stagnates in the veins of psalm-singing mechanics crack-brained demagogues and sullen boors some distinction in short between spilling a flask of generous wine and dashing down a can full of base muddy ale your distinction is too nice for my comprehension replied morton god gives every spark of life that of the peasant as well as of the prince and those who destroy his work recklessly or causelessly must answer in either case what right for example have i to general graham's protection now more than when i first met him and narrowly escaped the consequences you would say answered claverhouse why i will answer you frankly then i thought i had to do with the son of an old round-headed rebel and the nephew of a sordid presbyterian laird now i know your points better and there is that about you which i respect in an enemy as much as i like in a friend i have learned a good deal concerning you since our first meeting and i trust that you have found that my construction of the information has not been unfavourable to you but yet said morton but yet interrupted graham taking up the word you would say you were the same when i first met you that you are now true but then how could i know that though by the by even my reluctance to suspend your execution may show you how high your abilities stood in my estimation do you expect general said morton that i ought to be particularly grateful for such a mark of your esteem po po you are critical returned claverhouse i tell you i thought you a different sort of person did you ever read froissart no was morton's answer i have half a mind said claverhouse to contrive you should have six months imprisonment in order to procure you that pleasure his chapters inspire me with more enthusiasm than even poetry itself and the noble canon with what true chivalrous feeling he confines his beautiful expressions of sorrow to the death of the gallant and high-bred knight of whom it was a pity to see the fall such was his loyalty to his king pure faith to his religion hardihood towards his enemy and fidelity to his lady love ah benedicity how he will mourn over the fall of such a pearl of knighthood be it on the side he happens to favour or on the other but truly for sweeping from the face of the earth some few hundreds of villain churls who are born but to plough it the high-born and inquisitive historian has marvellous little sympathy as little or less perhaps than john graham of claverhouse there is one ploughman in your possession general for whom said morton in spite of the contempt in which you hold a profession which some philosophers have considered as useful as that of a soldier i would humbly request your favour you mean said claverhouse looking at a memorandum book one hatherick hetherick or or hedrick i cuthbert or cutty hedrick here i have him oh never fear him 
if he will be but tractable the ladies of tilly tudlam made interest with me on his account some time ago he is to marry their waiting-maid i think he will be allowed to slip off easy unless his obstinacy spoils his good fortune he has no ambition to be a martyr i believe said morton tis the better for him said claverhouse but besides although the fellow had more to answer for i should stand his friend for the sake of the blundering gallantry which threw him into the midst of our ranks last night when seeking assistance for you i never desert any man who trusts me with such implicit confidence but to deal sincerely with you he has been long in our eye here halliday bring me up the black book the sergeant having committed to his commander this ominous record of the disaffected which was arranged in alphabetical order claverhouse turning over the leaves as he rode on began to read names as they occurred gumble gumption a minister aged fifty indulged close sly and so forth pooh pooh he he i have him here heathercat outlawed a preacher a zealous cameronian keeps a conventicle among the campsy hills tush oh here is hedrig cuthbert his mother a bitter puritan himself a simple fellow like to be forward in action but of no genius for plots more for the hand than the head and might be drawn to the right side but for his attachment to here claverhouse looked at morton and then shut the book and changed his tone faithful and true are words never thrown away upon me mr morton you may depend on the young man's safety does it not revolt a mind like yours said morton to follow a system which is to be supported by such minute enquiries after obscure individuals you do not suppose we take the trouble said the general haughtily the curates for their own sakes willingly collect all these materials for their own regulation in each parish they know best the black sheep of the flock i have had your picture for three years indeed replied morton will you favour me by imparting it willingly said claverhouse it can signify little for you cannot avenge yourself on the curate as you will probably leave scotland for some time this was spoken in an indifferent tone morton felt an involuntary shudder at hearing words which implied a banishment from his native land but ere he answered claverhouse proceeded to read henry morton son of silas morton colonel of horse for the scottish parliament nephew and apparent heir of morton of milnwood imperfectly educated but with spirit beyond his years excellent at all exercises indifferent to forms of religion but seems to incline to the presbyterian has high-flown and dangerous notions about liberty of thought and speech and hovers between a latitudinarian and an enthusiast much admired and followed by the youth of his own age modest quiet and unassuming in manner but in his heart peculiarly bold and intractable he is here follow three red crosses mr morton which signify triply dangerous you see how important a person you are but what does this fellow want a horseman rode up as he spoke and gave a letter claverhouse glanced it over laughed scornfully bade him to tell his master to send his prisoners to edinburgh for there was no answer and as the man turned back said contemptuously to morton here is an ally of yours deserted from you or rather i should say an ally of your good friend burley hear how he sets forth dear sir i wonder when we were such intimates may it please your excellency to accept my humble congratulations on the victory hum hum blessed his majesty's army i pray you to understand i have my people under arms to take and intercept all fugitives and have already several prisoners and so forth 
subscribed basil oliphant you know the fellow by name i suppose a relative of lady margaret bellenden replied morton is he not ay replied graham and heir male of her father's family though a distant one and moreover a suitor to the fair edith though discarded as an unworthy one but above all a devoted admirer of the estate of tilly tudlam and all thereunto belonging he takes an ill mode of recommending himself said morton suppressing his feelings to the family at tilly tudlam by corresponding with our unhappy party oh this precious basil will turn cat in pan with any man replied claverhouse he was displeased with the government because they would not overturn in his favour a settlement of the late earl of torwood by which his lordship gave his own estate to his own daughter he was displeased with lady margaret because she avowed no desire for his alliance and with the pretty edith because she did not like his tall and gainly person so he held a close correspondence with burleigh and raised his followers with the purpose of helping him providing always he needed no help that is if you had beat us yesterday and now the rascal pretends he was all the while proposing the king's service and for aught i know the council will receive his pretext for current coin for he knows how to make friends among them and a dozen scores of poor vagabond fanatics will be shot or hanged while this cunning scoundrel lies hid under the double cloak of loyalty well lined with the fox fur of hypocrisy with conversation on this and other matters they beguile the way claverhouse all the while speaking with great frankness to morton and treating him rather as a friend and companion than as a prisoner so that however uncertain of his fate the hours he passed in the company of this remarkable man were so much lightened by the varied play of his imagination and the depth of his knowledge of human nature that since the period of his becoming a prisoner of war which relieved him at once from the cares of his doubtful and dangerous station among the insurgents and from the consequences of their suspicious resentment his hours flowed on less anxiously than at any time since his having commenced actor in public life he was now with respect to his fortune like a rider who has flung his reins on the horse's neck and while he abandoned himself to circumstances was at least relieved from the task of attempting to direct them in this mood he journeyed on the number of his companions being continually augmented by detached parties of horse who came in from every quarter of the country bringing with them for the most part the unfortunate persons who had fallen into their power at length they approached edinburgh our council said claverhouse being resolved i suppose to testify by their present exultation the extent of their former terror have decreed a kind of triumphal entry to us victors and our captives but as i do not quite approve the taste of it i am willing to avoid my own part in the show and at the same time to save you from yours so saying he gave up the command of the forces to allan now a lieutenant-colonel and turning his horse into a by-lane rode into the city privately accompanied by morton and two or three servants when claverhouse arrived at the quarters which he usually occupied in the cannon gate he assigned to his prisoner a small apartment with an intimation that his parole confined him to it for the present after about a quarter of an hour spent in solitary musing on the strange vicissitudes of his late life the attention of morton was summoned to the window by a great noise in the street beneath trumpets drums and kettle-drums contended in noise with the shouts of a numerous rabble and apprised him that the royal cavalry were passing in the triumphal attitude which claverhouse 
had mentioned the magistrates of the city attended by their guard of halberds had met the victors with their welcome at the gate of the city and now preceded them as a part of the procession the next object was two heads borne upon pikes and before each bloody head were carried the hands of the dismembered sufferers which were by the brutal mockery of those who bore them often approached towards each other as if in the attitude of exhortation or prayer these bloody trophies belonged to two preachers who had fallen at bothwell bridge after them came a cart led by the executioner's assistant in which were placed macbriar and other two prisoners who seemed of the same profession they were bareheaded and strongly bound yet looked around them with an air rather of triumph than dismay and appeared in no respect moved either by the fate of their companions of which the bloody evidences were carried before them or by the dread of their own approaching execution which these preliminaries so plainly indicated behind these prisoners thus held up to public infamy and derision came a body of horse brandishing their broadswords and filling the wide street with acclamations which were answered by the tumultuous outcries and shouts of the rabble who in every considerable town are too happy in being permitted to huzza for anything whatever which calls them together in the rear of these troopers came the main body of the prisoners at the head of whom were some of their leaders who were treated with every circumstance of inventive mockery and insult several were placed on horseback with their faces to the animal's tail others were chained to long bars of iron which they were obliged to support in their hands like the galley slaves in spain when travelling to the port where they are to be put on shipboard the heads of others who had fallen were borne in triumph before the survivors some on pikes and halberds some in sacks bearing the names of the slaughtered persons labelled on the outside such were the objects who headed the ghastly procession who seemed as effectually doomed to death as if they wore the san benitos of the condemned heretics in an auto de fe behind them came on the nameless crowd to the number of several hundreds some retaining under their misfortunes a sense of confidence in the cause for which they suffered captivity and were about to give a still more bloody testimony others seemed pale dispirited dejected questioning in their own minds their prudence in espousing a cause which providence seemed to have disowned and looking about for some avenue through which they might escape from the consequences of their rashness others there were who seemed incapable of forming an opinion on the subject or of entertaining either hope confidence or fear but who foaming with thirst and fatigue stumbled along like overdriven oxen lost to every thing but their present sense of wretchedness and without having any distinct idea whether they were led to the shambles or to the pasture these unfortunate men were guarded on each hand by troopers and behind them came the main body of the cavalry whose military music resounded back from the high houses on each side of the street and mingled with their own songs of jubilee and triumph and the wild shouts of the rabble morton felt himself heart-sick while he gazed on the dismal spectacle and recognized in the bloody heads and still more miserable and agonized features of the living sufferers faces which had been familiar to him during the brief insurrection he sunk down in a chair in a bewildered and stupefied state from which he was awakened by the voice of cuddy lord forgive us sir said the poor fellow his teeth chattering like a pair of nutcrackers his hair erect like boar's bristles and his face as pale as that of a corpse lord forgive us sir we mun instantly gang before the council 
oh lord what made them send for a poor body like me so many bra lords and gentles and there's my mither come up on the lang tramp from glasgow to see to gar me testify as she calls it that is to say confess and be hanged but devil take me if they make suck a guise of cuddy if i can do better but here's claverhouse himself the lord preserve and forgive us i say once more you must immediately attend the council mr morton said claverhouse who entered while cuddy spoke and your servant must go with you you need be under no apprehension for the consequences to yourself personally but i warn you that you will see something that will give you much pain and from which i would willingly have saved you if i had possessed the power my carriage waits us shall we go it will be readily supposed that morton did not venture to dispute this invitation however unpleasant he rose and accompanied claverhouse i must apprise you said the latter as he led the way downstairs that you will get off cheap and so will your servant provided he can keep his tongue quiet cuddy caught these last words to his exceeding joy devil of fear of me said he and my mither disna pit her finger in the pie at that moment his shoulder was seized by old maas who had contrived to thrust herself forward into the lobby of the apartment oh hinny hinny said she to cuddy hanging upon his neck glad and proud and sorry and humbled am i on one and the same instant to see my bairn ganging to testify for the truth gloriously with his mouth in council as he did with his weapon in the field whisht whisht mither cried cuddy impatiently odd ye daft wife is this a time to speak of those things i tell ye i'll testify nothing either one gate or another i have spoken to mr poundtext and i'll take the declaration or whatever they call it and we're all to win free off if we do that he's gotten life for himself and all his folk and that's a minister for my siller i like none of your sermons that end in a psalm at the grass market oh cuddy man laith would i be they should hurt ye said old maas divided grievously between the safety of her son's soul and that of his body but mind my bonny bairn ye have battled for the faith and didna let the dread of losing creature comforts withdraw ye from the good fight how tow mither replied cuddy i have fought even over muckle already and to speak plain i'm wearied of the trade i have swaggered with all the arms and muskets and pistols buff coats and bandoliers long enough and i like the plough paddle a hantle better i kin nothing should gar a man fight that's to say when he's no angry by and outtaken the dread of being hanged or killed if he turns back but my dear cuddy continued the persevering maas your bridal garment oh hinny dinna sully the marriage garment away away mither replied cuddy dinna ye see the folks waiting for me never fear me i ken how to turn this far better than ye do for ye're bleasin away about marriage and the job is how we are to win by hanging so saying he extricated himself out of his mother's embraces and requested the soldiers who took him in charge to conduct him to the place of examination without delay he had been already preceded by claverhouse and morton chapter fifteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah my native land good night lord byron the privy council of scotland in whom the practice since the union of the crowns 
vested great judicial powers as well as the general superintendents of the executive department was met in the ancient dark gothic room adjoining to the house of parliament in edinburgh when general graham entered and took his place amongst the members at the council table you have brought us a leash of game to-day general said a nobleman of high place amongst them here is a craven to confess a cock of the game to stand at bay and what shall i call the third general without further metaphor i will entreat your grace to call him a person in whom i am specially interested replied claverhouse and a wig into the bargain said the nobleman lolling out a tongue which was at all times too big for his mouth and accommodating his coarse features to a sneer to which they seemed to be familiar yes please your grace a wig as your grace was in sixteen forty one replied claverhouse with his usual appearance of imperturbable civility he has you there i think my lord duke said one of the privy councillors ay ay returned the duke laughing there's no speaking to him since drumclog but come bring in the prisoners and do you mr clerk read the record the clerk read forth a bond in which general graham of claverhouse and lord evandale entered themselves securities that henry morton younger of milnwood should go abroad and remain in foreign parts until his majesty's pleasure was further known in respect of the said henry morton's accession to the late rebellion and that under penalty of life and limb to the said henry morton and of ten thousand marks to each of his securities do you accept of the king's mercy upon these terms mr morton said the duke of lauderdale who presided in the council i have no other choice my lord replied morton then subscribe your name in the record morton did so without reply conscious that in the circumstances of his case it was impossible for him to have escaped more easily macbriar who was at the same instant brought to the foot of the council table bound upon a chair for his weakness prevented him from standing beheld morton in the act of what he accounted apostasy he hath summed his defection by owning the carnal power of the tyrant he exclaimed with a deep groan a fallen star a fallen star hold your peace sir said the duke and keep your own breath to cool your own porridge you'll find them scalding hot i promise you call in the other fellow who has some common sense one sheep will leap the ditch when another goes first cuddy was introduced unbound but under the guard of two halberdiers and placed beside macbriar at the foot of the table the poor fellow cast a piteous look around him in which were mingled awe for the great men in whose presence he stood and compassion for his fellow-sufferers with no small fear of the personal consequences which impended over himself he made his clownish obeisances with a double portion of reverence and then awaited the opening of the awful scene were you at the battle of bothwell brig was the first question which was thundered in his ears cuddy meditated a denial but had sense enough upon reflection to discover that the truth would be too strong for him so he replied with true caledonian indirectness of response i'll no say but it may be possible that i might have been there answer directly you knave yes or no you know you were there it's no for me to contradict your lordship's grace's honour said cuddy once more sir were you there yes or no said the duke impatiently dear stir again replied cuddy how can one mind precisely where they have been all the days of their life speak out you scoundrel said general dalzell 
or i'll dash your teeth out with my dungeon haft do you think we can stand here all day to be turning and dodging with you like greyhounds after a hare a well then said cuddy since nothing else will please ye write down that i cannot deny but i was there well sir said the duke and do you think that the rising upon that occasion was rebellion or not i'm no just free to give my opinion sir said the cautious captive on what might cost my neck but i doubt it will be very little better better than what just than rebellion as your honour calls it replied cuddy well sir that speaking to the purpose replied his grace and are you content to accept of the king's pardon for your guilt as a rebel and to keep the church and pray for the king blithely sir answered the unscrupulous cuddy and drink his health into the bargain when the ale's good egad said the duke this is a hearty cock what brought you into such a scrape mine honest friend just ill example sir replied the prisoner and a daft old jod of a mither with reference to your grace's honour why god a mercy my friend replied the duke take care of bad advice another time i think you are not likely to commit treason on your own score make out his free pardon and bring forward the rogue in the chair macbriar was then moved forward to the post of examination were you at the battle of bothwell bridge was in like manner demanded of him i was answered the prisoner in a bold and resolute tone were you armed i was not i went in my calling as a preacher of god's word to encourage them that drew the sword in his cause in other words to aid and abet the rebels said the duke thou hast spoken it replied the prisoner well then continued the interrogator let us know if you saw john balfour of burley among the party i presume you know him i bless god that i do know him replied macbriar he is a zealous and a sincere christian and when and where did you last see this pious personage was the query which immediately followed i am here to answer for myself said macbriar in the same dauntless manner and not to endanger others we shall know said dalzell how to make you find your tongue if you can make him fancy himself in a conventicle answered lauderdale he will find it without you come laddie speak while the play is good you're too young to bear the burden will be laid on you else i defy you retorted macbriar this has not been the first of my imprisonments or of my sufferings and young as i may be i have lived long enough to know how to die when i am called upon ay but there are some things which must go before an easy death if you continue obstinate said lauderdale and rung a small silver bell which was placed before him on the table a dark crimson curtain which covered a sort of niche or gothic recess in the wall rose at the signal and displayed the public executioner a tall grim and hideous man having an oaken table before him on which lay thumbscrews and an iron case called the scottish boot used in those tyrannical days to torture accused persons morton who was unprepared for this ghastly apparition started when the curtain arose but macbriar's nerves were more firm he gazed upon the horrible apparatus with much composure as if a touch of nature called the blood from his cheek for a second resolution sent it back to his brow with greater energy do you know who that man is said lauderdale in a low stern voice almost sinking into a whisper he is i suppose replied macbriar the infamous executioner of your bloodthirsty commands upon the persons of god's people 
he and you are equally beneath my regard and i bless god i no more fear what he can inflict than what you can command flesh and blood may shrink under the sufferings you can doom me to and poor frail nature may shed tears or send forth cries but i trust my soul is anchored firmly on the rock of ages do your duty said the duke to the executioner the fellow advanced and asked with a harsh and discordant voice upon which of the prisoner's limbs he should first employ his engine let him choose for himself said the duke i should like to oblige him in anything that is reasonable since you leave it to me said the prisoner stretching forth his right leg take the best i willingly bestow it in the cause for which i suffer the executioner with the help of his assistants enclosed the leg and knee within the tight iron boot or case and then placing a wedge of the same metal between the knee and the edge of the machine took a mallet in his hand and stood waiting for farther orders a well-dressed man by profession a surgeon placed himself by the other side of the prisoner's chair bared the prisoner's arm and applied his thumb to the pulse in order to regulate the torture according to the strength of the patient when these preparations were made the president of the council repeated with the same stern voice the question when and where did you last see john balfour of burley the prisoner instead of replying to him turned his eyes to heaven as if imploring divine strength and muttered a few words of which the last were distinctly audible thou hast said thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power the duke of lauderdale glanced his eye around the council as if to collect their suffrages and judging from their mute signs gave on his own part a nod to the executioner whose mallet instantly descended on the wedge and forcing it between the knee and the iron boot occasioned the most exquisite pain as was evident from the flush which instantly took place on the brow and on the cheeks of the sufferer the fellow then again raised his weapon and stood prepared to give a second blow will you yet say repeated the duke of lauderdale where and when you last parted from balfour of burley you have my answer said the sufferer resolutely and the second blow fell the third and fourth succeeded but at the fifth when a larger wedge had been introduced the prisoner set up a scream of agony morton whose blood boiled within him at witnessing such cruelty could bear no longer and although unarmed and himself in great danger was springing forward when claverhouse who observed his emotion withheld him by force laying one hand on his arm and the other on his mouth while he whispered for god's sake think where you are this movement fortunately for him was observed by no other of the councillors whose attention was engaged with the dreadful scene before them he is gone said the surgeon he has fainted my lords and human nature can endure no more release him said the duke and added returning to dalzell he will make an old proverb good for he'll scarce ride to-day though he has had his boots on i suppose we must finish with him ay dispatch his sentence and have done with him we have plenty of drudgery behind strong waters and essences were busily employed to recall the senses of the unfortunate captive and when his first faint gasps intimated a return of sensation the duke pronounced sentence of death upon him as a traitor taken in the act of open rebellion and adjudging him to be carried from the bar to the commonplace of execution and there hanged by the neck his hands and head to be stricken off after death and disposed of according to the pleasure of the council and all and sundry his movable goods and gear 
as sheet and inbrought to his majesty's use doomster he continued repeat the sentence to the prisoner the office of the doomster was in those days and till a much later period held by the executioner in commendum with his ordinary functions the duty consisted in reciting to the unhappy criminal the sentence of the law as pronounced by the judge which acquired an additional and horrid emphasis from the recollection that the hateful personage by whom it was uttered was to be the agent of the cruelties he denounced macbriar had scarce understood the purport of the words as first pronounced by the lord president of the council but he was sufficiently recovered to listen and to reply to the sentence when uttered by the harsh and odious voice of the ruffian who was to execute it and at the last awful words and this i pronounce for doom he answered boldly my lords i thank you for the only favour i looked for or would accept at your hands namely that you have sent the crushed and maimed carcass which has this day sustained your cruelty to this hasty end it were indeed little to me whether i perish on the gallows or in the prison-house but if death following close on what i have this day suffered had found me in my cell of darkness and bondage many might have lost the sight how a christian man can suffer in the good cause for the rest i forgive you my lords for what you have appointed and i have sustained and why should i not ye send me to a happy exchange to the company of angels and the spirits of the just for that of frail dust and ashes ye send me from darkness into day from mortality to immortality and in a word from earth to heaven if the thanks therefore and pardon of a dying man can do you good take them at my hand and may your last moments be as happy as mine as he spoke thus with a countenance radiant with joy and triumph he was withdrawn by those who had brought him into the apartment and executed within half an hour dying with the same enthusiastic firmness which his whole life had evinced the council broke up and morton found himself again in the carriage with general graham marvellous firmness and gallantry said morton as he reflected upon macbriar's conduct what a pity it is that with such self-devotion and heroism should have been mingled the fiercer features of his sect you mean said claverhouse his resolution to condemn you to death to that he would have reconciled himself by a single text for example and phineas arose and executed judgment or something to the same purpose but wot ye where you are now bound mr morton we are on the road to leith i observe answered morton can i not be permitted to see my friends ere i leave my native land your uncle replied graham has been spoken to and declines visiting you the good gentleman is terrified and not without some reason that the crime of your treason may extend itself over his lands and tenements he sends you however his blessing and a small sum of money lord evandale continues extremely indisposed major bellenden is at tilly tudlam putting matters in order the scoundrels have made great havoc there with lady margaret's muniments of antiquity and have desecrated and destroyed what the good lady called the throne of his most sacred majesty is there any one else whom you would wish to see morton sighed deeply as he answered no it would avail nothing but my preparations small as they are some must be necessary they are all ready for you said the general lord evandale has anticipated all you wish here is a packet from him with letters of recommendation for the court of the stadtholder prince of orange 
to which i have added one or two i made my first campaigns under him and first saw fire at the battle of senaf there are also bills of exchange for your immediate wants and more will be sent when you require it morton heard all this and received the parcel with an astounded and confused look so sudden was the execution of the sentence of banishment and my servant he said he shall be taken care of and replaced if it be practicable in the service of lady margaret bellenden i think he will hardly neglect the parade of the feudal retainers or go a wigging a second time but here we are upon the quay and the boat waits you it was even as clever house said a boat waited for captain morton with the trunks and baggage belonging to his rank claverhouse shook him by the hand and wished him good fortune and a happy return to scotland in quieter times i shall never forget he said the gallantry of your behaviour to my friend evandale in circumstances when many men would have sought to rid him out of their way another friendly pressure and they parted as morton descended the pier to get into the boat a hand placed in his a letter folded up in very small space he looked round the person who gave it seemed much muffled up he pressed his finger upon his lip and then disappeared among the crowd the incident awakened morton's curiosity and when he found himself on board of a vessel bound for rotterdam and saw all his companions of the voyage busy making their own arrangements he took an opportunity to open the billet thus mysteriously thrust upon him it ran thus thy courage on the fatal day when israel fled before his enemies hath in some measure atoned for thy unhappy owning of the erastian interest these are not days for ephraim to strive with israel i know thy heart is with the daughter of the stranger but turn from that folly for in exile and in flight and even in death itself shall my hand be heavy against that bloody and malignant house and providence hath given me the means of meeting unto them with their own measure of ruin and confiscation the resistance of their stronghold was the main cause of our being scattered at bothwell bridge and i have bound it upon my soul to visit it upon them wherefore think of her no more but join with our brethren in banishment whose hearts are still towards this miserable land to save and to relieve her there is an honest remnant in holland whose eyes are looking out for deliverance join thyself unto them like the true son of the stout and worthy silas morton and thou wilt have good acceptance among them for his sake and for thine own working shouldst thou be found worthy again to labour in the vineyard thou wilt at all times hear of my incomings and outgoings by inquiring after quentin mackell of iron grey at the house of that singular christian woman bessie mcclure near to the place called the Hauf, where neil blaine entertaineth guests so much from him who hopes to hear again from thee in brotherhood resisting unto blood and striving against sin meanwhile possess thyself in patience keep thy sword girded and thy lamp burning as one that wakes in the night for he who shall judge the mount of esau and shall make false professors as straw and malignants as stubble will come in the fourth watch with garments dyed in blood and the house of jacob shall be for spoil and the house of joseph for fire i am he that hath written it whose hand hath been on the mighty in the waste field this extraordinary letter was subscribed j b of b but the signature of these initials were not necessary for pointing out to morton than it could come from no other than burley it gave him new occasion to admire the indomitable spirit of this man 
who with art equal to his courage and obstinacy was even now endeavouring to re-establish the web of conspiracy which had been so lately torn to pieces but he felt no sort of desire in the present moment to sustain a correspondence which must be perilous or to renew an association which in so many ways had been nearly fatal to him the threats which burleigh held out against the family of bellenden he considered as a mere expression of his spleen on account of their defence of tilly tudlam and nothing seemed less likely than that at the very moment of their party being victorious their fugitive and distressed adversary could exercise the least influence over their fortunes morton however hesitated for an instant whether he should not send the major or lord evandale intimation of burleigh's threats upon consideration he thought he could not do so without betraying his confidential correspondence for to warn them of his menaces would have served little purpose unless he had given them a clue to prevent them by apprehending his person while by doing so he deemed he should commit an ungenerous breach of trust to remedy an evil which seemed almost imaginary upon mature consideration therefore he tore the letter having first made a memorandum of the name and place where the writer was to be heard of and threw the fragments into the sea while morton was thus employed the vessel was unmoored and the white sails swelled out before a favourable northwest wind the ship leaned her side to the gale and went roaring through the waves leaving a long and rippling furrow to track her course the city and port from which he had sailed became undistinguishable in the distance the hills by which they were surrounded melted finally into the blue sky and morton was separated for several years from the land of his nativity chapter sixteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Whom does time gallop with all as you like it? It is fortunate for tale tellers that they are not tied down like theatrical writers to the unities of time and place, but may conduct their personages to athens and thebes at their pleasure and bring them back at their convenience time to use rosalind's simile has hitherto paced with the hero of our tale for betwixt morton's first appearance as a competitor for the popinjay and his final departure for holland hardly two months elapsed years however glided away ere we find it possible to resume the thread of our narrative and time must be held to have galloped over the interval craving therefore the privilege of my cast i entreat the reader's attention to the continuation of the narrative as it starts from a new era being the year immediately subsequent to the british revolution scotland had just begun to repose from the convulsion occasioned by a change of dynasty and through the prudent tolerance of king william had narrowly escaped the horrors of a protracted civil war agriculture began to revive and men whose minds had been disturbed by the violent political concussions and the general change of government in church and state had begun to recover their ordinary temper and to give the usual attention to their own private affairs in lieu of discussing those of the public the highlanders alone resisted the newly established order of things and were in arms in a considerable body under the viscount of dundee whom our readers have hitherto known by the name of graham of claverhouse but the usual state of the highlands was so unruly that their being more or less disturbed was not supposed greatly to affect the general tranquillity 
of the country so long as their disorders were confined within their own frontiers in the lowlands the jacobites now the undermost party had ceased to expect any immediate advantage by open resistance and were in their turn driven to hold private meetings and form associations for mutual defence which the government termed treason while they cried out persecution the triumphant whigs while they re-established presbytery as the national religion and assigned to the general assemblies of the kirk their natural influence were very far from going the lengths which the cameronians and more extravagant portion of the nonconformists under charles and james loudly demanded they would listen to no proposal for re-establishing the solemn league and covenant and those who had expected to find in king william a zealous covenanted monarch were grievously disappointed when he intimated with the phlegm particular to his country his intention to tolerate all forms of religion which were consistent with the safety of the state the principles of indulgence thus espoused and gloried in by the government gave great offence to the more violent party who condemned them as diametrically contrary to scripture for which narrow-spirited doctrine they cited various texts all as it may well be supposed detached from their context and most of them derived from the charges given to the jews in the old testament dispensation to extirpate idolaters out of the promised land they also murmured highly against the influence assumed by secular persons in exercising the rights of patronage which they termed a rape upon the chastity of the church they censured and condemned as erastian many of the measures by which government after the revolution showed an inclination to interfere with the management of the church and they positively refused to take the oath of allegiance to king william and queen mary until they should on their part have sworn to the solemn league and covenant the magna charta as they termed it of the presbyterian church this party therefore remained grumbling and dissatisfied and made repeated declarations against affections and causes of wrath which had they been prosecuted as in the two former reigns would have led to the same consequence of open rebellion but as the murmurers were allowed to hold their meetings uninterrupted and to testify as much as they pleased against socinianism erastianism and all the compliances and defections of the time their zeal unfanned by persecution died gradually away their numbers became diminished and they sunk into the scattered remnant of serious scrupulous and harmless enthusiasts of whom old mortality whose legends have afforded the groundwork of my tale may be taken as no bad representative but in the years which immediately succeeded the revolution the cameronians continued a sect strong in numbers and vehement in their political opinions whom government wished to discourage while they prudently temporized with them these men formed one violent party in the state and the episcopalian and jacobite interest notwithstanding their ancient and national animosity yet repeatedly endeavoured to intrigue among them and avail themselves of their discontents to obtain their assistance in recalling the stuart family the revolutionary government in the meanwhile was supported by the great bulk of the lowland interest who were chiefly disposed to a moderate presbytery and formed in a great measure the party who in the former oppressive reigns were stigmatized by the cameronians for having exercised that form of worship under the declaration of indulgence issued by charles the second such was the state of parties in scotland immediately subsequent to the revolution it was on a delightful summer evening that a stranger well mounted 
and having the appearance of a military man of rank rode down a winding descent which terminated in view of the romantic ruins of bothwell castle and the river clyde which winds so beautifully between rocks and woods to sweep around the towers formerly built by Eimer de valence bothwell bridge was at a little distance and also in sight the opposite field once the scene of slaughter and conflict now lay as placid and quiet as the surface of a summer lake the trees and bushes which grew around in romantic variety of shade were hardly seen to stir under the influence of the evening breeze the very murmur of the river seemed to soften itself into unison with the stillness of the scene around the path through which the traveller descended was occasionally shaded by detached trees of great size and elsewhere by the hedges and boughs of flourishing orchards now laden with summer fruits the nearest object of consequence was a farmhouse or it might be the abode of a small proprietor situated on the side of a sunny bank which was covered by apple and pear trees at the foot of the path which led up to this modest mansion was a small cottage pretty much in the situation of a porter's lodge though obviously not designed for such a purpose the hut seemed comfortable and more neatly arranged than is usual in scotland it had its little garden where some fruit trees and bushes were mingled with kitchen herbs a cow and six sheep fed in a paddock hard by the cock strutted and crowed and summoned his family around him before the door a heap of brushwood and turf neatly made up indicated that the winter fuel was provided and the thin blue smoke which ascended from the straw-bound chimney and winded slowly out from among the green trees showed that the evening meal was in the act of being made ready to complete the little scene of rural peace and comfort a girl of about five years old was fetching water in a pitcher from a beautiful fountain of the purest transparency which bubbled up at the root of a decayed old oak tree about twenty yards from the end of the cottage the stranger reined up his horse and called to the little nymph desiring to know the way to fairy no the child set down her water pitcher hardly understanding what was said to her put her fair flaxen hair apart on her brows and opened her round blue eyes with the wondering what's your wall which is usually a peasant's first answer if it can be called one to all questions whatever i wish to know the way to fairy no mammy mammy exclaimed the little rustic running towards the door of the hut come out and speak to the gentleman her mother appeared a handsome young countrywoman to whose features originally sly and a spiegel in expression matrimony had given that decent matronly air which peculiarly marks the peasant's wife of scotland she had an infant in one arm and with the other she smoothed down her apron to which hung a chubby child of two years old the elder girl whom the traveller had first seen fell back behind her mother as soon as she appeared and kept that station occasionally peeping out to look at the stranger what was your pleasure sir said the woman with an air of respectful breeding not quite common in her rank of life but without anything resembling forwardness the stranger looked at her with great earnestness for a moment and then replied i am seeking a place called fairy no and a man called cuthbert hedrick you can probably direct me to him it's my good man sir said the young woman with a smile of welcome will you alight sir and come into our poor dwelling cutty cutty a white-headed rogue of four years appeared at the door of the hut run away my bonny man and tell your father a gentleman wants him or stay jenny you'll have more sense run ye away and tell him he's down at the four acres park 
winna ye light down and bide a blink sir or would ye take a mouthful of bread and cheese or a drink of ale till our good man comes it's good ale though i shouldna say so that bruise it but ploughman lads work hard and mon have something to keep their hearts a boon by ordinaire so i i pit a good gowpin of mot to the browst as the stranger declined her courteous offers cuddy the reader's old acquaintance made his appearance in person his countenance still presented the same mixture of apparent dullness with occasional sparkles which indicated the craft so often found in the clouded shoe he looked on the rider as on one whom he had never seen before and like his daughter and wife opened the conversation with the regular query what's your wool with me sir i have a curiosity to ask some questions about this country said the traveller and i was directed to you as an intelligent man who can answer them no doubt sir said cuddy after a moment's hesitation but i would first like to ken what sort of questions they are i have had so many questions speared at me in my day and in sick queer ways that if ye can all ye wouldna wonder at my jealousing all thing about them my mother guard me learn the single carriage whilk was a great vex then i behoved to learn about my godfathers and godmothers to please the old lady and whiles i jumbled them together and pleased none of them and when i came to man's estate came another kind of questioning in fashion that i liked worse than effectual calling and the did promise and vow of the tape were yoked to the end of the tother so ye see sir i i like to hear questions asked before i answer them you have nothing to apprehend from mine my good friend they only relate to the state of the country country replied cuddy oh the country's well enough and it werena that dour devil clavers they call him dundee now that's stirring about yet in the highlands they say with all the donalds and duncans and dougals that ever wore bottomless breeks driving about with him to set things a steer again now we have gotten them all reasonably well settled but mackay will pit him down there's little doubt of that he'll give him his fairing i'll be cautioned for it what makes you so positive of that my friend asked the horseman i heard it with my own lugs answered cuddy foretold to him by a man that had been three hours stone dead and came back to this earth again just to tell him his mind it was at a place they call drum shinnel indeed said the stranger i can hardly believe you my friend ye might ask my mither then if she were in life said cuddy it was her explained it all to me for i thought the man had only been wounded at any rate he spake of the casting out of the stewards by their very names and the vengeance that was brewing for claverhouse and his dragoons they called the man habakkuk mucklewrath his brain was a wee a gee but he was a bra preacher for all that you seem said the stranger to live in a rich and peaceful country it's no to complain of sir and we get the crap well in quoth cuddy but if ye had seen the blood rinnin up as fast on the tap of that brig yonder as ever the water ran below it ye wouldna have thought it so bonny a spectacle you mean the battle some years since i was waiting upon monmouth that morning my good friend and did see some part of the action said the stranger then ye saw a bonny stour said cuddy that sail serve me for fighting all the days of my life i judged ye would be a trooper by your red scarlet lace coat and your looped hat and which side were you upon my friend continued the inquisitive stranger aha lad retorted cuddy with a knowing look or what he designed for such there's no use in telling that unless i kenned what was asking me 
i commend your prudence but it is unnecessary i know you acted on that occasion as servant to henry morton ay said cuddy in surprise how came ye by that secret know that i care a bodie about it for the sun's on our side of the hedge now i wish my master were living to get a blink of it and what became of him said the writer he was lost in the vessel gone to that weary holland clean lost and all body perished and my poor master among them neither man nor mouse was ever heard of more then cuddy uttered a groan you had some regard for him then continued the stranger how could i help it his face was made of a fiddle as they say for all body that looked on him liked him and a bra soldier he was oh and ye had but seen him down at the bridge there fleeing about like a fleeing dragon to gar folk fight that had unto little will till it there was he and that sour wigamore they called burley if twa men could have won a field we wouldna have gotten our skins paid that day you mention burley do you know if he yet lives i can a muckle about him folks say he was abroad and our sufferers would hold no communion with him because of his having murdered the archbishop so he came home ten times dourer than ever and broke off with many of the presbyterians and at this last coming of the prince of orange he could get no countenance nor command for fear of his devilish temper and he hasna been heard of since only some folk say that pride and anger have driven him clean wood and and said the traveller after considerable hesitation do you know anything of lord evandale div i ken anything o lord evandale div i know is not my young lady up by yonder at the house that's as good as married to him and are they not married then said the rider hastily no only what they call betrothed me and my wife were witnesses it's no many months by past it was a long courtship few folk ken the reason by jenny and myself but will ye no light down i down abide to see ye sittin up there and the clouds are casting up thick in the west over glasgow ward and most skeely folk think that bodes rain in fact a deep black cloud had already surmounted the setting sun a few large drops of rain fell and the murmurs of distant thunder were heard the devil's in this man said cuddy to himself i wish he would either light off or ride on that he may quarter himself in hamilton or the shower begin but the rider sat motionless on his horse for two or three moments after his last question like one exhausted by some uncommon effort at length recovering himself as if with a sudden and painful effort he asked cuddy if lady margaret bellenden still lived she does replied cuddy but in a very small way they have been a sad changed family since the rough times began they have suffered enough first and last and to lose the old tower and all the bonny barony and the homes that i have ploughed so often and the mains and my kale yard that i should have gotten back again and all for nothing as a body may say but just the want of some bits of sheepskin that were lost in the confusion of the taking of tilly tudlam i have heard something of this said the stranger deepening his voice and averting his head i have some interest in the family and would willingly help them if i could can you give me a bed in your house to-night my friend it's but a corner of a place sir said cuddy but we's try rather than ye should ride on in the rain and thunder for to be free with ye sir i think ye seem no that over well i am liable to a dizziness said the stranger but it will soon wear off i can we can give ye a decent supper sir said cuddy and we'll see about a bed as well as we can we would be laith a stranger should lack what we have 
though we are jimply provided for in beds rather for jenny has so many bairns god bless them and her that troth i maun speak to lord evandale to give us a bit ike or outshot of some sort to the onstead i shall be easily accommodated said the stranger as he entered the house and ye may rely on your nag being well sorted said cuddy i ken well what belongs to suppering a horse and this is a very good one cuddy took the horse to the little cow-house and called to his wife to attend in the meanwhile to the stranger's accommodation the officer entered and threw himself on a settle at some distance from the fire and carefully turning his back to the little lattice window jenny or mrs hedrick if the reader pleases requested him to lay aside the cloak belt and flapped hat which he wore upon his journey but he excused himself under pretence of feeling cold and to divert the time till cuddy's return he entered into some chat with the children carefully avoiding during the interval the inquisitive glances of his landlady chapter thirty seven of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah what tragic tears bedim the eye what deaths we suffer ere we die our broken friendships we deplore and loves of youth that are no more logan cuddy soon returned assuring the stranger with a cheerful voice that the horse was properly suppered up and that the good wife should make a bed up for him at the house more purpose-like and comfortable than the like of them could give him are the family at the house said the stranger with an interrupted and broken voice no stir they're away with all the servants they keep only twa nowadays and my good wife there has the keys and the charge though she's not a feed servant she has been born and bred in the family and has a trust and management if they were there we'd behoove na to take sick freedom without their order but when they are away they will be well pleased we serve a stranger gentleman miss bellenden would help all the whole world and her power were as good as her will and her grandmother lady margaret has an unto respect for the gentry and she's no ill to the poor bodies neither and now wife what for are ye no getting for it with the sowens never mind lad rejoined jenny ye shall have them in good time i ken well that ye like your bros hat cuddy fidgeted and laughed with a peculiar expression of intelligence at this repartee which was followed by a dialogue of little consequence betwixt his wife and him in which the stranger took no share at length he suddenly interrupted them by the question can you tell me when lord evandale's marriage takes place very soon we expect answered jenny before it was possible for her husband to reply it would have been over afore now but for the death of old major bellenden the excellent old man said the stranger i heard at edinburgh he was no more was he long ill he could not be said to hold up his head after his brother's wife and his niece were turned out of their own house and he had himself sore borrowing siller to stand the law but it was in the latter end of king james's days and basil oliphant who claimed the estate turned a papist to please the managers and then nothing was to be refused him so the law gave again the leddies at last after they had fought a weary sort of years about it and as i said before the major never held up his head again and then came the pitting away of the stuart line and though he had but little reason to like them he could not brook that and it clean broke the heart of him 
and creditors came to charnwood and cleaned out all that was there he was never rich the good old man for he doubted na see anybody want he was indeed said the stranger with a faltering voice an admirable man that is i have heard that he was so so the ladies were left without fortune as well as without a protector they will neither want the tain nor the t'other while lord evandale lives said jenny he has been a true friend in their griefs even to the house they live in is his lordship's and never man as my old good mother used to say since the days of the patriarch jacob served so long and so sore for a wife as good lord evandale has done and why said the stranger with a voice that quivered with emotion why was he not sooner rewarded by the object of his attachment there was the lawsuit to be ended said jenny readily for by many other family arrangements na nah, but said cuddy there was another reason for by for the young lady whisht hang your tongue and sup your sowens said his wife i see the gentleman's far from well and down it eat our coarse supper i would kill him a chicken in an instant there is no occasion said the stranger i shall want only a glass of water and to be left alone you'll give yourself the trouble then to follow me said jenny lighting a small lantern and i'll show you the way cuddy also proffered his assistance but his wife reminded him that the bairn would be left to fight together and coop one another into the fire so that he remained to take charge of the menage his wife led the way up a little winding path which after threading some thickets of sweetbriar and honeysuckle conducted to the back door of a small garden jenny undid the latch and they passed through an old-fashioned flower-garden with its clipped yew hedges and formal parterres to a glass sashed door which she opened with a master key and lighting a candle which she placed upon a small work-table asked pardon for leaving him there for a few minutes until she prepared his apartment she did not exceed five minutes in these preparations but when she returned was startled to find that the stranger had sunk forward with his head upon the table in what she at first apprehended to be a swoon as she advanced to him however she could discover by his short-drawn sobs that it was a paroxysm of mental agony she prudently drew back until he raised his head and then showing herself without seeming to have observed his agitation informed him that his bed was prepared the stranger gazed at her a moment as if to collect the sense of her words she repeated them and only bending his head as an indication that he understood her he entered the apartment the door of which she pointed out to him it was a small bedchamber used as she informed him by lord evandale when a guest at fairy no connecting on one side with a little china cabinet which opened to the garden and on the other with a saloon from which it was only separated by a thin wainscot partition having wished the stranger better health and good rest jenny descended as speedily as she could to her own mansion oh cuddy she exclaimed to her helpmate as she entered i doubt we're ruined folk how can that be what's the matter with ye returned the imperturbed cuddy who was one of those persons who do not easily take alarm at anything what do you think yon gentleman is oh that ever ye should have asked him to light here exclaimed jenny why what the muckle devil do you say he is there's no law against harbouring and intercommunicating now said cuddy so whig or tory what need we care what he be ay but it's one will ding lord evandale's marriage a gee yet 
if it's no the better look to said jenny it's miss edith's first joe your own old maester cuddy the devil woman exclaimed cuddy starting up crow ye that i am blind i would have canned mr harry morton among a hunder ay but cuddy lad replied jenny though ye are no blind ye are no so notice-taking as i am well for what needs ye cast that up to me just now or what did ye see about the man that was like our maester harry i will tell ye said jenny i jealous his keeping his face from us and speaking with a maid-like voice so i even tried him with some tales of lang syne and when i spoke of the brose ye can he did not just laugh he's over grave for that nowadays but he gave a gledge with his eye that i kenned he took up what i said and all his distress is about miss edith's marriage and i never saw a man more taken down with true love in my days i might say man or woman only i mind how ill miss edith was when she first got word that him and you ye muckle graceless loon were coming against tilly tudlam with the rebels but what's the matter with the man now what's the matter with me indeed said cuddy who was again hastily putting on some of his garments he had stripped himself of am i no gone up this instant to see my maester at well cuddy ye are gone no sick gate said jenny coolly and resolutely the devil's in the wife said cuddy do ye think i am to be john tamson's man and mastered by women all the days of my life and whose man would ye be and what would ye have to master ye but me cuddy lad answered jenny i'll gar ye comprehend in the making of a hay-band nobody kens that this young gentleman is living but ourselves and from that he keeps himself up so close i am judging that he's purposing if he fand miss edith either married or just going to be married he would just slide away easy and give them no more trouble but if miss edith kenned that he was living and if she were standing before the very minister with lord evandale when it was told to her i's warrant she would say no when she should say yes well replied cuddy and what's my business with that if miss edith likes her old joe better than her new one what for should she no be free to change her mind like other folk ye can jenny halliday i threeps he had a promise from yourself halliday's a liar and ye're nothing but a gomeral to hearken till him cuddy and then for this lady's choice lack a day ye may be sure all the gowd mr morton has is on the outside of his coat and how can he keep lady margaret and the young lady isna there milnwood said cuddy no doubt the old lord left his housekeeper the life rent as he heard not of his nephew but it's but speaking the old wife fair and they may all live brawly together lady margaret and all row tow lad replied jenny ye ken them little to think ladies of their rank would set up house with old eily wilson when they're most over proud to take favors from lord evandale himself no no they maun follow the camp if she take morton that would sort ill with the old lady to be sure said cuddy she would hardly win over a long day in the baggage wain then sick of flighting as there would be between them all about whig and tory continued jenny to be sure said cuddy the old ladies unto kittle in those points and then cuddy continued his helpmate who had reserved her strongest argument to the last 
if this marriage with lord evandale is broken off what comes of our own bit free house and the kale-yard and the cow's grass i trow that both us and the bonny bairns will be turned on the wide world here jenny began to whimper cuddy writhed himself this way and that way the very picture of indecision at length he broke out well woman canna ye tell what we should do without all this din about it just do nothing at all said jenny never seem to ken anything about this gentleman and for your life say a word that he should have been here or up at the house an i had kenned i would have given him my own bed and sleep it in the byre or he had gone up by but it canna be help it now the next thing's to get him cannily away the morn and i judge he'll be in no hurry to come back again my poor master said cuddy and mon i no speak to him then for your life no said jenny ye're no obliged to ken him and i wouldna have told ye only i feared ye would ken him in the morning a oh, well said cuddy sighing heavily i's a way to plough the outfield then for if i am not to speak to him i would rather be out of the gate very right my dear hinny replied jenny nobody has better sense than you when ye crack a bit with me over your affairs but ye should never do anything off-hand out of your own head one would think it's true quoth cuddy for i have i had some carline or queen or another to gar me gang their gate instead of my own there was first my mother he continued as he undressed and tumbled himself into bed then there was lady margaret didna let me call my soul my own then my mither and her quarrelled and pulled me twa ways at once as if ilk one had an end of me like pinch and the devil rugging about the baker at the fair and now i have gotten a wife he murmured in continuation as he stowed the blankets around his person and she likes to take the guiding of me all thegither and am not i the best guide ye ever had in all your life said jenny as she closed the conversation by assuming her place beside her husband and extinguishing the candle leaving this couple to their repose we have next to inform the reader that early on the next morning two ladies on horseback attended by their servants arrived at the house of fairy no whom to jenny's utter confusion she instantly recognized as miss bellenden and lady emily hamilton a sister of lord evandale had i no better gang to the house to put things to rights said jenny confounded with this unexpected apparition we want nothing but the pass-key said miss bellenden goodyell will open the windows of the little parlour the little parlour's locked and the locks spoiled answered jenny who recollected the local sympathy between that apartment and the bedchamber of her guest in the red parlour then said miss bellenden and rode up to the front of the house but by an approach different from that through which morton had been conducted all will be out thought jenny unless i can get him smuggled out of the house the back way so saying she sped up the bank in great tribulation and uncertainty i had better have said at auntie there was a stranger there was her next natural reflection but then they would have been for asking him to breakfast oh save us what will i do and there's good deal walking in the garden too she exclaimed internally on approaching the wicket and i darn a gang in the back way till he's off the coast oh sirs what will become of us in this state of perplexity she approached the sitivant butler with the purpose of decoying him out of the garden but john goodyell's temper was not improved by his decline in rank 
and increase in years like many peevish people too he seemed to have an intuitive perception as to what was most likely to tease those whom he conversed with and on the present occasion all jenny's efforts to remove him from the garden served only to root him in it as fast as if he had been one of the shrubs unluckily also he had commenced florist during his residence at fairy no and leaving all the other things to the charge of lady emily's servant his first care was dedicated to the flowers which he had taken under his special protection and which he propped dug and watered prosing all the while upon their respective merits to poor jenny who stood by him trembling and almost crying with anxiety fear and impatience fate seemed determined to win a match against jenny this unfortunate morning as soon as the ladies entered the house they observed that the door of the little parlour the very apartment out of which she was desirous of excluding them on account of its contiguity to the room in which morton slept was not only unlocked but absolutely ajar miss bellenden was too much engaged with her own immediate subjects of reflection to take much notice of the circumstance but desiring the servant to open the window-shutters walked into the room along with her friend he is not yet come she said what can your brother possibly mean why express so anxious a wish that we should meet him here and why not come to castle dinan as he proposed i own my dear emily that even engaged as we are to each other and with the sanction of your presence i do not feel that i have done quite right in indulging him evandale was never capricious answered his sister i am sure he will satisfy us with his reasons and if he does not i will help you to scold him what i chiefly fear said edith is his having engaged in some of the plots of this fluctuating and unhappy time i know his heart is with that dreadful claverhouse and his army and i believe he would have joined them ere now but for my uncle's death which gave him so much additional trouble on our account how singular that one so rational and so deeply sensible of the errors of the exiled family should be ready to risk all for their restoration what can i say answered lady emily it is a point of honour with evandale our family have always been loyal he served long in the guards the viscount of dundee was his commander and his friend for years he is looked on with an evil eye by many of his own relations who set down his inactivity to the score of want of spirit you must be aware my dear edith how often family connections and early predilections influence our actions more than abstract arguments but i trust evandale will continue quiet though to tell you truth i believe you are the only one who can keep him so and how is it in my power said miss bellenden you can furnish him with the scriptural apology for not going forth with the host he has married a wife and therefore cannot come i have promised said edith in a faint voice but i trust i shall not be urged on the score of time nay said lady emily i will leave evandale and here he comes to plead his own cause stay stay for god's sake said edith endeavouring to detain her not i not i said the young lady making her escape the third person makes a silly figure on such occasions when you want me for breakfast i will be found in the willow walk by the river as she tripped out of the room lord evandale entered good morrow brother and good-bye till breakfast-time said the lively young lady i trust you will give miss bellenden some good reasons for disturbing her rest so early in the morning and so saying she left them together without waiting a reply 
and now my lord said edith may i desire to know the meaning of your singular request to meet you here at so early an hour she was about to add that she hardly felt herself excusable in having complied with it but upon looking at the person whom she addressed she was struck dumb by the singular and agitated expression of his countenance and interrupted herself to exclaim for god's sake what is the matter his majesty's faithful subjects have gained a great and most decisive victory near blair of athole but alas my gallant friend lord dundee has fallen said edith anticipating the rest of his tidings true most true he has fallen in the arms of victory and not a man remains of talents and influence sufficient to fill up his loss in king james's service this edith is no time for temporizing with our duty i have given directions to raise my followers and i must take leave of you this evening do not think of it my lord answered edith your life is essential to your friends do not throw it away in an adventure so rash what can your single arm and the few tenants or servants who might follow you do against the force of almost all scotland the highland clans only excepted listen to me edith said lord evandale i am not so rash as you may suppose me nor are my present motives of such light importance as to affect only those personally dependent on myself the lifeguards with whom i served so long although new modelled and new officered by the prince of orange retain a predilection for the cause of their rightful master and here he whispered as if he feared even the walls of the apartment had ears when my foot is known to be in the stirrup two regiments of cavalry have sworn to renounce the usurper's service and fight under my orders they delayed only till dundee should descend into the lowlands but since he is no more which of his successors dare take that decisive step unless encouraged by the troops declaring themselves meantime the zeal of the soldiers will die away i must bring them to a decision while their hearts are glowing with the victory their old leader has obtained and burning to avenge his untimely death and will you on the faith of such men as you know these soldiers to be said edith take a part of such dreadful moment i will said lord evandale i must my honour and loyalty are both pledged for it and all for the sake continued miss bellenden of a prince whose measures while he was on the throne no one could condemn more than lord evandale most true replied lord evandale and as i resented even during the plenitude of his power his innovations on church and state like a free-born subject i am determined i will assert his real rights when he is in adversity like a loyal one let courtiers and sycophants flatter power and desert misfortune i will neither do the one nor the other and if you are determined to act what my feeble judgment must still term rashly why give yourself the pain of this untimely meeting were it not enough to answer said lord evandale that ere rushing on battle i wished to bid adieu to my betrothed bride surely it is judging coldly of my feelings and showing too plainly the indifference of your own to question my motive for a request so natural but why in this place my lord said edith and why with such peculiar circumstances of mystery because he replied putting a letter into her hand i have yet another request which i dare hardly proffer even when prefaced by these credentials in haste and terror edith glanced over the letter which was from her grandmother my dearest child 
such was its tenor in style and spelling i never more deeply regretted the rheumatism which disqualified me from riding on horseback than at this present riding when i would most have wished to be where this paper will soon be that is at very no with my poor dear willie's only child but it is the will of god i should not be with her which i conclude to be the case as much for the pain i now suffer as because it hath now not given way either to chamomile poultices or to decoction of wild mustard wherewith i have often relieved others therefore i must tell you by writing instead of word of mouth that as my young lord evandale is called to the present campaign both by his honour and his duty he hath earnestly solicited me that the bonds of holy matrimony be knitted before his departure to the wars between you and him in implement of the indenture formerly entered into for that effect whereuntil as i see no reasonable objection so i trust that you who have been always a good and obedient child will not devise any which has less than reason it is true that the contracts of our house have heretofore been celebrated in a manner more befitting our rank and not in private and with few witnesses as a thing done in a corner but it has been heaven's own free will as well as those of the kingdom where we live to take away from us our estate and from the king his throne yet i trust he will yet restore the rightful heir to the throne and turn his heart to the true protestant episcopal faith which i have the better right to expect to see even with my old eyes as i have beheld the royal family when they were struggling as sorely with masterful usurpers and rebels as they are now that is to say when his most sacred majesty charles the second of happy memory honoured our poor house of tillytudlam by taking his disjune therein etc 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 we will not abuse the reader's patience by quoting more of lady margaret's prolix epistle suffice it to say that it closed by laying her commands on her grandchild to consent to the solemnization of her marriage without loss of time i never thought till this instant said edith dropping the letter from her hand that lord evandale would have acted ungenerously ungenerously edith replied her lover and how can you apply such a term to my desire to call you mine ere i part from you perhaps for ever lord evandale ought to have remembered said edith that when his perseverance and i must add a due sense of his merit and of the obligations we owed him wrung from me a slow consent that i would one day comply with his wishes i made it my condition that i should not be pressed to a hasty accomplishment of my promise and now he avails himself of his interest with my only remaining relative to hurry me with precipitate and even indelicate importunity there is more selfishness than generosity my lord in such eager and urgent solicitation lord evandale evidently much hurt took two or three turns through the apartment ere he replied to this accusation at length he spoke i should have escaped this painful charge durst i at once have mentioned to miss bellenden my principal reason for urging this request it is one which she will probably despise on her own account but which ought to weigh with her for the sake of lady margaret my death in battle must give my whole estate to my heirs of entail my forfeiture as a traitor by the usurping government may vest it in the prince of orange or some dutch favourite in either case my venerable friend and betrothed bride must remain unprotected 
and in poverty vested with the rights and provisions of lady evandale edith will find in the power of supporting her aged parent some consolation for having condescended to share the titles and fortunes of one who does not pretend to be worthy of her edith was struck dumb by an argument which she had not expected and was compelled to acknowledge that lord evandale's suit was urged with delicacy as well as with consideration and yet she said such is the waywardness with which my heart reverts to former times that i cannot she burst into tears suppress a degree of ominous reluctance at fulfilling my engagement upon such a brief summons we have already fully considered this painful subject said lord evandale and i hoped my dear edith your own inquiries as well as mine had fully convinced you that these regrets were fruitless fruitless indeed said edith with a deep sigh which as if by an unexpected echo was repeated from the adjoining apartment miss bellenden started at the sound and scarcely composed herself upon lord evandale's assurances that she had heard but the echo of her own respiration it sounded strangely distinct she said and almost ominous but my feelings are so harassed that the slightest trifle agitates them lord evandale eagerly attempted to soothe her alarm and reconcile her to a measure which however hasty appeared to him the only means by which he could secure her independence he urged his claim in virtue of the contract her grandmother's wish and command the propriety of ensuring her comfort and independence and touched lightly on his own long attachment which he had evinced by so many and such various services these edith felt the more the less they were insisted upon and at length as she had nothing to oppose to his ardour excepting a causeless reluctance which she herself was ashamed to oppose against so much generosity she was compelled to rest upon the impossibility of having the ceremony performed upon such hasty notice at such a time and place but for all this lord evandale was prepared and he explained with joyful alacrity that the former chaplain of his regiment was in attendance at the lodge with a faithful domestic once a non-commissioned officer in the same corps that his sister was also possessed of the secret and that hedrick and his wife might be added to the list of witnesses if agreeable to miss bellenden as to the place he had chosen it on very purpose the marriage was to remain a secret since lord evandale was to depart in disguise very soon after it was solemnized a circumstance which had their union been public must have drawn upon him the attention of the government as being altogether unaccountable unless from his being engaged in some dangerous design having hastily urged these motives and explained his arrangements he ran without waiting for an answer to summon his sister to attend his bride while he went in search of the other persons whose presence was necessary when lady emily arrived she found her friend in an agony of tears of which she was at some loss to comprehend the reason being one of those damsels who think there is nothing either wonderful or terrible in matrimony and joining with most who knew him in thinking that it could not be rendered peculiarly alarming by lord evandale being the bridegroom influenced by these feelings she exhausted in succession all the usual arguments for courage and all the expressions of sympathy and condolence ordinarily employed on such occasions but when lady emily beheld her future sister-in-law deaf to all those ordinary topics of consolation when she beheld tears follow fast and without intermission down cheeks as pale as marble 
when she felt that the hand which she pressed in order to enforce her arguments turned cold within her grasp and lay like that of a corpse insensible and unresponsive to her caresses her feelings of sympathy gave way to those of hurt pride and pettish displeasure i must own she said that i am something at a loss to understand all this miss bellenden months have passed since you agreed to marry my brother and you have postponed the fulfilment of your engagement from one period to another as if you had to avoid some dishonourable or highly disagreeable connection i think i can answer for lord evandale that he will seek no woman's hand against her inclination and though his sister i may boldly say that he does not need to urge any lady further than her inclinations carry her you will forgive me miss bellenden but your present distress augurs ill for my brother's future happiness and i must needs say that he does not merit all these expressions of dislike and dolor and that they seem an odd return for an attachment which he has manifested so long and in so many ways you are right lady emily said edith drying her eyes and endeavouring to resume her natural manner though still betrayed by her faltering voice and the paleness of her cheeks you are quite right lord evandale merits such usage from no one least of all from her whom he has honoured with his regard but if i have given way for the last time to a sudden and irresistible burst of feeling it is my consolation lady emily that your brother knows the cause that i have hid nothing from him and that he at least is not apprehensive of finding in edith bellenden a wife undeserving of his affection but still you are right and i merit your censure for indulging for a moment fruitless regret and painful remembrances it shall be so no longer my lot is cast with evandale and with him i am resolved to bear it nothing shall in future occur to excite his complaints or the resentment of his relations no idle recollections of other days shall intervene to prevent the zealous and affectionate discharge of my duty no vain illusions recall the memory of other days as she spoke these words she slowly raised her eyes which had before been hidden by her hand to the latticed window of her apartment which was partly open uttered a dismal shriek and fainted lady emily turned her eyes in the same direction but saw only the shadow of a man which seemed to disappear from the window and terrified more by the state of edith than by the apparition she had herself witnessed she uttered shriek upon shriek for assistance her brother soon arrived with the chaplain and jenny dennison but strong and vigorous remedies were necessary ere they could recall miss bellenden to sense and motion even then her language was wild and incoherent press me no farther she said to lord evandale it cannot be heaven and earth the living and the dead have leagued themselves against this ill-omened union take all i can give my sisterly regard my devoted friendship i will love you as a sister and serve you as a bondswoman but never speak to me more of marriage the astonishment of lord evandale may easily be conceived emily he said to his sister this is your doing i was accursed when i thought of bringing you here some of your confounded folly has driven her mad on my word brother answered lady emily you're sufficient to drive all the women in scotland mad because your mistress seems much disposed to jilt you you quarrel with your sister who has been arguing in your cause and had brought her to a quiet hearing when all of a sudden a man looked in at a window whom her crazed sensibility mistook either for you 
or some one else and has treated us gratis with an excellent tragic scene what man what window said lord evandale in impatient displeasure miss bellenden is incapable of trifling with me and yet what else could have hush hush said jenny whose interest lay particularly in shifting further inquiry for heaven's sake my lord speak low for my lady begins to recover edith was no sooner somewhat restored to herself than she begged in a feeble voice to be left alone with lord evandale all retreated jenny with her usual air of officious simplicity lady emily and the chaplain with that of awakened curiosity no sooner had they left the apartment than edith beckoned lord evandale to sit beside her on the couch her next motion was to take his hand in spite of his surprised resistance to her lips her last was to sink from her seat and to clasp his knees forgive me my lord she exclaimed forgive me i must deal most untruly by you and break a solemn engagement you have my friendship my highest regard my most sincere gratitude you have more you have my word and my faith but oh forgive me for the fault is not mine you have not my love and i cannot marry you without a sin you dream my dearest edith said evandale perplexed in the utmost degree you let your imagination beguile you this is but some delusion of an oversensitive mind the person whom you preferred to me has been long in a better world where your unavailing regret cannot follow him or if it could would only diminish his happiness you are mistaken lord evandale said edith solemnly i am not a sleep-walker or a madwoman no i could not have believed from any one what i have seen but having seen him i must believe mine own eyes seen him seen whom asked lord evandale in great anxiety henry morton replied edith uttering these two words as if they were her last and very nearly fainting when she had done so miss bellenden said lord evandale you treat me like a fool or a child if you repent your engagement to me he continued indignantly i am not a man to enforce it against your inclination but deal with me as a man and forbear this trifling he was about to go on when he perceived from her quivering eye and pallid cheek that nothing less than imposture was intended and that by whatever means her imagination had been so impressed it was really disturbed by unaffected awe and terror he changed his tone and exerted all his eloquence in endeavouring to soothe and extract from her the secret cause of such terror i saw him she repeated i saw henry morton stand at that window and look into the apartment at the moment i was on the point of abjuring him for ever his face was darker thinner and paler than it was wont to be his dress was a horseman's cloak and hat looped down over his face his expression was like that he wore on that dreadful morning when he was examined by claverhouse at tilly tudlam ask your sister ask lady emily if she did not see him as well as i i know what has called him up he came to upbraid me that while my heart was with him in the deep and dead sea i was about to give my hand to another my lord it is ended between you and me be the consequences what they will she cannot marry whose union disturbs the repose of the dead good heaven said evandale as he paced the room half mad himself with surprise and vexation her fine understanding must be totally overthrown and that by the effort which she has made to comply with my ill-timed though well-meant request without rest and attention her health is ruined for ever 
at this moment the door opened and halliday who had been lord evandale's principal personal attendant since they both left the guards on the revolution stumbled into the room with a countenance as pale and ghastly as terror could paint it what is the matter next halliday cried his master starting up any discovery of the he had just recollection sufficient to stop short in the midst of the dangerous sentence no sir said halliday it is not that nor anything like that but i have seen a ghost a ghost you eternal idiot said lord evandale forced altogether out of his patience has all mankind sworn to go mad in order to drive me so what ghost you simpleton the ghost of henry morton the whig captain at bothwell bridge replied halliday he passed by me like a fire flot when i was in the garden this is midsummer madness said lord evandale or there is some strange villainy afloat jenny attend your lady to her chamber while i endeavour to find a clue to all this but lord evandale's inquiries were in vain jenny who might have given had she chosen a very satisfactory explanation had an interest to leave the matter in darkness and interest was a matter which now weighed principally with jenny since the possession of an active and affectionate husband in her own proper right had altogether allayed her spirit of coquetry she had made the best use of the first moments of confusion hastily to remove all traces of any one having slept in the apartment adjoining to the parlour and even to erase the mark of footsteps beneath the window through which she conjectured morton's face had been seen while attempting ere he left the garden to gain one look at her whom he had so long loved and was now on the point of losing for ever that he had passed halliday in the garden was equally clear and she learned from her elder boy whom she had employed to have the stranger's horse saddled and ready for his departure that he had rushed into the stable thrown the child a broad gold piece and mounting his horse had ridden with fearful rapidity down towards the clyde the secret was therefore in their own family and jenny was resolved it should remain so for to be sure she said although her lady and halliday kenned mr morton by broad daylight that was no reason i should own to kenning him in the gloaming and by candlelight and him keeping his face from cutty and me all the time so she stood resolutely upon the negative when examined by lord evandale as for halliday he could only say that as he entered the garden door the supposed apparition met him walking swiftly and with a visage on which anger and grief appeared to be contending he knew him well he said having been repeatedly guard upon him and obliged to write down his marks of stature and visage in case of escape and there were few faces like mr morton's but what should make him haunt the country where he was neither hanged nor shot he the said halliday did not pretend to conceive lady emily confessed she had seen the face of a man at the window but her evidence went no farther john goodyell deponed nil novit in casa he had left his gardening to get his morning dram just at the time when the apparition had taken place lady emily's servant was waiting orders in the kitchen and there was not another being within a quarter of a mile of the house lord evandale returned perplexed and dissatisfied in the highest degree at beholding a plan which he thought necessary not less for the protection of edith in contingent circumstances than for the assurance of his own happiness and which he had brought so very near perfection thus broken off without any apparent or rational cause his knowledge of edith's character set her beyond the suspicion of covering any capricious change of determination by a pretended vision 
but he would have set the apparition down to the influence of an overstrained imagination agitated by the circumstances in which she had so suddenly been placed had it not been for the coinciding testimony of halliday who had no reason for thinking of morton more than any other person and knew nothing of miss bellenden's vision when he promulgated his own on the other hand it seemed in the highest degree improbable that morton so long and so vainly sought after and who was with such good reason supposed to be lost when the vryhide of rotterdam went down with crew and passengers should be alive and lurking in this country where there was no longer any reason why he should not openly show himself since the present government favoured his party in politics when lord evandale reluctantly brought himself to communicate these doubts to the chaplain in order to obtain his opinion he could only obtain a long lecture on demonology in which after quoting del rio and berthoug and de lancre on the subject of apparitions together with sundry civilians and common lawyers on the nature of testimony the learned gentleman expressed his definite and determined opinion to be either that there had been an actual apparition of the deceased henry morton's spirit the possibility of which he was as a divine and a philosopher neither fully prepared to admit or to deny or else that the said henry morton being still in rerum natura had appeared in his proper person that morning or finally that some strong deceptio vices or striking similitude of person had deceived the eyes of miss bellenden and of thomas halliday which of these was the most probable hypothesis the doctor declined to pronounce but expressed himself ready to die in the opinion that one or other of them had occasioned that morning's disturbance lord evandale soon had additional cause for distressful anxiety miss bellenden was declared to be dangerously ill i will not leave this place he exclaimed till she is pronounced to be in safety i neither can nor ought to do so for whatever may have been the immediate occasion of her illness i gave the first cause for it by my unhappy solicitation he established himself therefore as a guest in the family which the presence of his sister as well as of lady margaret bellenden who in despite of her rheumatism caused herself to be transported thither when she heard of her granddaughter's illness rendered a step equally natural and delicate and thus he anxiously awaited until without injury to her health edith could sustain a final explanation ere his departure on his expedition she shall never said the generous young man look on her engagement with me as the means of fettering her to a union the idea of which seems almost to unhinge her understanding chapter eighteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah ah happy hills ah pleasing shades ah fields beloved in vain where once my careless childhood strayed a stranger yet to pain owed on a distant prospect of eton college it is not by corporal wants and infirmities only that men of the most distinguished talents are levelled during their lifetime with the common mass of mankind there are periods of mental agitation when the firmest of mortals must be ranked with the weakest of his brethren and when in paying the general tax of humanity his distresses are even aggravated by feeling that he transgresses in the indulgence of his grief the rules of religion and philosophy by which he endeavours in general to regulate his passions and his actions it was during such a paroxysm that the unfortunate morton 
left fairy know to know that his long-loved and still-beloved edith whose image had filled his mind for so many years was on the point of marriage to his early rival who had laid claim to her heart by so many services as hardly left her a title to refuse his addresses bitter as the intelligence was yet came not as an unexpected blow during his residence abroad he had once written to edith it was to bid her farewell for ever and to conjure her to forget him he had requested her not to answer his letter yet he half hoped for many a day that she might transgress his injunction the letter never reached her to whom it was addressed and morton ignorant of its miscarriage could only conclude himself laid aside and forgotten according to his own self-denying request all that he had heard of their mutual relations since his return to scotland prepared him to expect that he could only look upon miss bellenden as the betrothed bride of lord evandale and even if freed from the burden of obligation to the latter it would still have been inconsistent with morton's generosity of disposition to disturb their arrangements by attempting the assertion of a claim proscribed by absence never sanctioned by the consent of friends and barred by a thousand circumstances of difficulty why then did he seek the cottage which their broken fortunes had now rendered the retreat of lady margaret bellenden and her granddaughter he yielded we are under the necessity of acknowledging to the impulse of an inconsistent wish which many might have felt in his situation accident apprised him while travelling towards his native district that the ladies near whose mansion he must necessarily pass were absent and learning that cuddy and his wife acted as their principal domestics he could not resist pausing at their cottage to learn if possible the real progress which lord evandale had made in the affections of miss bellenden alas no longer his edith this rash experiment ended as we have related and he parted from the house of fairy no conscious that he was still beloved by edith yet compelled by faith and honour to relinquish her for ever with what feelings he must have listened to the dialogue between lord evandale and edith the greater part of which he involuntarily overheard the reader must conceive for we dare not attempt to describe them an hundred times he was tempted to burst upon their interview or to exclaim aloud edith i yet live and as often the recollection of her plighted troth and of the debt of gratitude which he owed lord evandale to whose influence with claverhouse he justly ascribed his escape from torture and from death withheld him from a rashness which might indeed have involved all in further distress but gave little prospect of forwarding his own happiness he repressed forcibly these selfish emotions though with an agony which thrilled his every nerve no edith was his internal oath never will i add a thorn to thy pillow that which heaven has ordained let it be and let me not add by my selfish sorrows one atom's weight to the burden thou hast to bear i was dead to thee when thy resolution was adopted and never never shalt thou know that henry morton still lives as he formed this resolution diffident of his own power to keep it and seeking that firmness in flight which was every moment shaken by his continuing within hearing of edith's voice he hastily rushed from his apartment by the little closet and the sash door which led to the garden but firmly as he thought his resolution was fixed he could not leave the spot where the last tones of a voice so beloved still vibrated on his ear 
without endeavouring to avail himself of the opportunity which the parlour window afforded to steal one last glance at the lovely speaker it was in this attempt made while edith seemed to have her eyes unalterably bent upon the ground that morton's presence was detected by her raising them suddenly so soon as her wild scream made this known to the unfortunate object of a passion so constant and which seemed so ill-fated he hurried from the place as if pursued by the furies he passed holiday in the garden without recognizing or even being sensible that he had seen him threw himself on his horse and by a sort of instinct rather than recollection took the first by-road in preference to the public route to hamilton in all probability this prevented lord evandale from learning that he was actually in existence for the news that the highlanders had obtained a decisive victory at killiecrankie had occasioned an accurate lookout to be kept by order of the government on all the passes for fear of some commotion among the lowland jacobites they did not omit to post sentinels on bothwell bridge and as these men had not seen any traveller pass westward in that direction and as besides their comrades stationed in the village of bothwell were equally positive that none had gone eastward the apparition in the existence of which edith and halliday were equally positive became yet more mysterious in the judgment of lord evandale who was finally inclined to settle in the belief that the heated and disturbed imagination of edith had summoned up the phantom she stated herself to have seen and that halliday had in some unaccountable manner been infected by the same superstition meanwhile the by-path which morton pursued with all the speed which his vigorous horse could exert brought him in a very few seconds to the brink of the clyde at a spot marked with the feet of horses who were conducted to it as a watering place the steed urged as he was to the gallop did not pause a single instant but throwing himself into the river was soon beyond his depth the plunge which the animal made as his feet quitted the ground with the feeling that the cold water rose above his sword-belt were the first incidents which recalled morton whose movements had been hitherto mechanical to the necessity of taking measures for preserving himself and the noble animal which he bestrode a perfect master of all manly exercises the management of a horse in water was as familiar to him as when upon a meadow he directed the animal's course somewhat down the stream towards a low plain or home which seemed to promise an easy egress from the river in the first and second attempt to get on shore the horse was frustrated by the nature of the ground and nearly fell backwards on his rider the instinct of self-preservation seldom fails even in the most desperate circumstances to recall the human mind to some degree of equipoise unless when altogether distracted by terror and morton was obliged to the danger in which he was placed for complete recovery of his self-possession a third attempt at a spot more carefully and judiciously selected succeeded better than the former and placed the horse and his rider in safety upon the farther and left-hand bank of the clyde but whither said morton in the bitterness of his heart am i now to direct my course or rather what does it signify to which point of the compass a wretch so forlorn betakes himself i would to god could the wish be without a sin that these dark waters had flowed over me and drowned my recollection of that which was and that which is the sense of impatience which the disturbed state of his feelings had occasioned scarcely had vented itself in these violent expressions ere he was struck with shame at having given way to such a paroxysm he remembered how signally 
the life which he now held so lightly in the bitterness of his disappointment had been preserved through the almost incessant perils which had beset him since he entered upon his public career i am a fool he said and worse than a fool to set light by that existence which heaven has so often preserved in the most marvellous manner something there yet remains for me in this world were it only to bear my sorrows like a man and to aid those who need my assistance what have i seen what have i heard but the very conclusion of that which i knew was to happen they he durst not utter their names even in soliloquy they are embarrassed and in difficulties she is stripped of her inheritance and he seems rushing on some dangerous career with which but for the low voice in which he spoke i might have become acquainted are there no means to aid or to warn them as he pondered upon this topic forcibly withdrawing his mind from his own disappointment and compelling his attention to the affairs of edith and her betrothed husband the letter of burleigh long forgotten suddenly rushed on his memory like a ray of light darting through a mist their ruin must have been his work was his internal conclusion if it can be repaired it must be through his means or by information obtained from him i will search him out stern crafty and enthusiastic as he is my plain and downright rectitude of purpose has more than once prevailed with him i will seek him out at least and who knows what influence the information i may acquire from him may have on the fortunes of those whom i shall never see more and who will probably never learn that i am now suppressing my own grief to add if possible to their happiness animated by these hopes though the foundation was but slight he sought the nearest way to the high road and as all the tracks through the valley were known to him since he hunted through them in youth he had no other difficulty than that of surmounting one or two enclosures ere he found himself on the road to the small burg where the feast of the popinjay had been celebrated he journeyed in a state of mind sad indeed and dejected yet relieved from its earlier and more intolerable state of anguish for virtuous resolution and manly disinterestedness seldom fail to restore tranquillity even where they cannot create happiness he turned his thoughts with strong effort upon the means of discovering burleigh and the chance there was of extracting from him any knowledge which he might possess favourable to her in whose cause he interested himself and at length formed the resolution of guiding himself by the circumstances in which he might discover the object of his quest trusting that from cuddy's account of a schism betwixt burleigh and his brethren of the presbyterian persuasion he might find him less rancorously disposed against miss bellenden and inclined to exert the power which he asserted himself to possess over her fortunes more favourably than heretofore noontide had passed away when our traveller found himself in the neighbourhood of his deceased uncle's habitation of milnwood it rose among glades and groves that were chequered with a thousand early recollections of joy and sorrow and made upon morton that mournful impression soft and affecting yet withal soothing which the sensitive mind usually receives from a return to the haunts of childhood and early youth after having experienced the vicissitudes and tempests of public life a strong desire came upon him to visit the house itself old allison he thought will not know me more than the honest couple whom i saw yesterday i may indulge my curiosity and proceed on my journey 
without her having any knowledge of my existence i think they said my uncle had bequeathed to her my family mansion well be it so i have enough to sorrow for to enable me to dispense with lamenting such a disappointment as that and yet methinks he has chosen an odd successor in my grumbling old dame to a line of respectable if not distinguished ancestry let it be as it may i will visit the old mansion at least once more the house of milnwood even in its best days had nothing cheerful about it but its gloom appeared to be doubled under the auspices of the old housekeeper everything indeed was in repair there were no slates deficient upon the steep grey roof and no panes broken in the narrow windows but the grass in the courtyard looked as if the foot of man had not been there for years the doors were carefully locked and that which admitted to the hall seemed to have been shut for a length of time since the spiders had fairly drawn their webs over the doorway and the staples living sight or sound there was none until after much knocking morton heard the little window through which it was usual to reconnoitre visitors open with much caution the face of allison puckered with some score of wrinkles in addition to those with which it was furrowed when morton left scotland now presented itself enveloped in a toy from under the protection of which some of her grey tresses had escaped in a manner more picturesque than beautiful while her shrill tremulous voice demanded the cause of the knocking i wish to speak an instant with one alison wilson who resides here said henry she's no at home the day answered mrs wilson in propria persona the state of whose headdress perhaps inspired her with this direct mode of denying herself and ye are but a misleared person to spear for her in sick a manner ye might have had an m under your belt for mistress wilson of milnwood i beg pardon said morton internally smiling at finding in old ailie the same jealousy of disrespect which she used to exhibit upon former occasions i beg pardon i am but a stranger in this country and have been so long abroad that i have almost forgotten my own language did ye come from foreign parts said ailie then maybe ye may have heard of a young gentleman of this country that they call henry morton i have heard said morton of such a name in germany then bide a wee bit where ye are friend or stay gang round by the back of the house and ye'll find a laugh door it's on the latch for it's never barred till sunset ye'll open it and take care ye dinna fall over the tub for the entry's dark and then ye'll turn to the right and then ye'll hand straight forward and then ye'll turn to the right again and ye'll take heed of the cellar stairs and then ye'll be at the door of the little kitchen it's all the kitchen that's at milnwood now and i'll come down to ye and whatever ye would say to mistress wilson ye may very safely tell it to me a stranger might have had some difficulty notwithstanding the minuteness of the directions supplied by ailie to pilot himself in safety through the dark labyrinth of passages that led from the back door to the little kitchen but henry was too well acquainted with the navigation of these straits to experience danger either from the skilla which lurked on one side in shape of a bucking tub or the charbitus which yawned on the other in the profundity of a winding cellar stair his only impediment arose from the snarling and vehement barking of a small cocking spaniel once his own property but which unlike to the faithful argus saw his master return from his wanderings without any symptom of recognition the little dogs and all said morton to himself on being disowned by his former favourite 
i am so changed that no breathing creature that i have known and loved will now acknowledge me at this moment he had reached the kitchen and soon after the tread of allison's high heels and the pat of the crutch-handled cane which served at once to prop and to guide her footsteps were heard upon the stairs an annunciation which continued for some time ere she fairly reached the kitchen morton had therefore time to survey the slender preparations for housekeeping which were now sufficient in the house of his ancestors the fire though coals are plenty in that neighbourhood was husbanded with the closest attention to economy of fuel and the small pipkin in which was preparing the dinner of the old woman and her maid of all work a girl of twelve years old intimated by its thin and watery vapour that ellie had not mended her cheer with her improved fortune when she entered the head which nodded with self-importance the features in which an irritable peevishness acquired by habit and indulgence strove with a temper naturally affectionate and good-natured the coif the apron the blue-checked gown were all those of old ailey but laced pinners hastily put on to meet the stranger with some other trifling articles of decoration marked the difference between mrs wilson life rentrix of milnwood and the housekeeper of the late proprietor what were ye pleased to want with mrs wilson sir i am mrs wilson was her first address for the five minutes time which she had gained for the business of the toilet entitled her she conceived to assume the full merit of her illustrious name and shine forth on her guest in unchastened splendour morton's sensations confounded between the past and present fairly confused him so much that he would have had difficulty in answering her even if he had known well what to say but as he had not determined what character he was to adopt while concealing that which was properly his own he had an additional reason for remaining silent mrs wilson in perplexity and with some apprehension repeated her question what were ye pleased to want with me sir ye said ye kenned mr henry morton pardon me madam answered henry it was of one silas morton i spoke the old woman's countenance fell it was his father then ye kent of the brother of the late milnwood he canna mind him abroad i would think he was come home afore ye were born i thought ye had brought me news of poor master harry it was from my father i learned to know colonel morton said henry of the son i know little or nothing rumour says he died abroad on his passage to holland that's over like to be true said the old woman with a sigh and many a tear it's cost my old eye his uncle poor gentleman had soft away with it in his mouth he had been giving me precise directions anent the bread and the wine and the brandy at his burial and how often it was to be handed round the company for dead or alive he was a prudent frugal painstaking man and then he said said he ailie he i called me ailie we were old acquaintance ailie take ye care and hold the gear well together for the name of morton of milnwood's gone out like the last sough of an old song and so he fell out of one dwam into another and never spake a word more unless it were something we couldna make out about a dipped candle being good enough to see to dee with he could never bide to see a moulded one and there was one by ill luck on the table while mrs wilson was thus detailing the last moments of the old miser morton was pressingly engaged in diverting the assiduous curiosity of the dog which recovered from his first surprise and combining former recollections had 
after much snuffing and examination begun a course of capering and jumping upon the stranger which threatened every instant to betray him at length in the urgency of his impatience morton could not forbear exclaiming in a tone of hasty impatience down elfin down sir ye ken our dog's name said the old lady struck with great and sudden surprise ye ken our dog's name and it's no a common one and the creature kens you too she continued in a more agitated and shriller tone god guide us it's my own bairn so saying the poor old woman threw herself around morton's neck cling to him kissed him as if he had been actually her child and wept for joy there was no parrying the discovery if he could have had the heart to attempt any further disguise he returned the embrace with the most grateful warmth and answered i do indeed live dear ailey to thank you for all your kindness past and present and to rejoice that there is at least one friend to welcome me to my native country friends exclaimed ailey ye'll have many friends ye'll have many friends for ye will have gear hinny ye will have gear heaven make ye a good guide of it but eh sirs she continued pushing him back from her with her trembling hand and shrivelled arm and gazing in his face as if to read at more convenient distance the ravages which sorrow rather than time had made on his face eh sirs you're sore altered hinny your face is turned pale and your eyne are sunken and your bonny red and white cheeks are turned all dark and sunburnt oh weary on the wars many's the comely face they destroy and when came ye here hinny and where have ye been and what have ye been doing and what for did ye no right to us and how came you to pass yourself for dead and what for did ye come creeping to your own house as if ye had been an unto body to give poor old ally sick a start she concluded smiling through her tears it was some time ere morton could overcome his own emotion so as to give the kind old woman the information which we shall communicate to our readers in the next chapter chapter nineteen of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah a merle that was but that is gone for being richard's friend and madam you must call him rutland now richard the second the scene of explanation was hastily removed from the little kitchen to mrs wilson's own matted room the very same which she had occupied as housekeeper and which she continued to retain it was she said better secured against sifting winds than the hall which she had found dangerous to her rheumatisms and it was more fitting for her use than the late milnwood's apartment honest man which gave her sad thoughts and as for the great oak parlour it was never opened but to be aired washed and dusted according to the invariable practice of the family unless upon their most solemn festivals in the matted room therefore they were settled surrounded by pickle pots and conserves of all kinds which the ci devant housekeeper continued to compound out of mere habit although neither she herself nor any one else ever partook of the comfits which she so regularly prepared morton adapting his narrative to the comprehension of his auditor informed her briefly of the wreck of the vessel and the loss of all hands excepting two or three common seamen who had early secured the skiff and were just putting off from the vessel 
when he leaped from the deck into their boat and unexpectedly as well as contrary to their inclination made himself partner of their voyage and of their safety landed at flushing he was fortunate enough to meet with an old officer who had been in service with his father by his advice he shunned going immediately to the hague but forwarded his letters to the court of the stadtholder our prince said the veteran must as yet keep terms with his father-in-law and with your king charles and to approach him in the character of a scottish malcontent would render it imprudent for him to distinguish you by his favour wait therefore his orders without forcing yourself on his notice observe the strictest prudence and retirement assume for the present a different name shun the company of the british exiles and depend upon it you will not repent your prudence the old friend of silas morton argued justly after a considerable time had elapsed the prince of orange in a progress through the united states came to the town where morton impatient at his situation and the incognito which he was obliged to observe still continued nevertheless to be a resident he had an hour of private interview assigned in which the prince expressed himself highly pleased with his intelligence his prudence and the liberal view which he seemed to take of the factions of his native country their motives and their purposes i would gladly said william attach you to my own person but that cannot be without giving offence in england but i will do as much for you as well out of respect for the sentiments you have expressed as for the recommendations you have brought me here is a commission in a swiss regiment at present in garrison in a distant province where you will meet few or none of your countrymen continue to be captain melville and let the name of morton sleep till better days thus began my fortune continued morton and my services have on various occasions been distinguished by his royal highness until the moment that brought him to britain as our political deliverer his commands must excuse my silence to my few friends in scotland and i wonder not at the report of my death considering the wreck of the vessel and that i found no occasion to use the letters of exchange with which i was furnished by the liberality of some of them a circumstance which must have confirmed the belief that i had perished but dear henny asked mrs wilson did ye find no scotch body at the prince of orangers court that kenned ye i would have thought morton of milnwood was kenned all through the country i was purposely engaged in distant service said morton until a period when few without as deep and kind a motive of interest as yours ailie would have known the stripling morton in major-general melville melville was your mother's name said mrs wilson but morton sounds far bonnier in my old lugs and when ye take up the lairdship ye maun take the old name and designation again i am like to be in no haste to do either the one or the other ailie for i have some reasons for the present to conceal my being alive from every one but you and as for the lairdship of milnwood it is in as good hands as good hands henny re-echoed ailie i'm hopeful ye are no meaning mine the rents and the lands are but a sore fash to me and i'm over fail to take a helpmate though wily mactricket the writer was very pressing and spake very civilly but i'm over old a cat to draw that stray before me he canna will a wha me as he's done many a one and then i thought ay ye would come back and i would get my pickle meal and my soup milk and keep all things right about ye as i used to do in your poor uncle's time and it would be just pleasure enough for me to see ye thrive and guide the gear canny 
ye'll have learned that in holland i's warrant for they're thrifty folk there as i hear tell but ye'll be for keeping rather a more house than poor old milnwood that's gave and indeed i would approve of your eating butcher meat maybe as often as three times a week it keeps the wind out of the stomach we will talk of all this another time said morton surprised at the generosity upon a large scale which mingled in ailie's thoughts and actions with habitual and sordid parsimony and at the odd contrast between her love of saving and indifference to self-acquisition you must know he continued that i am in this country only for a few days on some special business of importance to the government and therefore ailie not a word of having seen me at some other time i will acquaint you fully with my motives and intentions even be it so my jo replied ailie i can keep a secret like my neighbours and well old milnwood kenned it honest man for he told me where he keep it his gear and that's what most folk like to have as private as possibly may be but come away with me henny till i show ye the oak parlour how grandly it's keep it just as if ye had been expected home every day i loot nobody sort it but my own hands it was a kind of divertisement to me though whilst the tear ran into my eye and i said to myself what needs i fash with grates and carpets and cushions and the muckle brass candlesticks any more for they'll never come home that ought it rightfully with these words she hauled him away to the sanctum sanctorum the scrubbing and cleaning whereof was her daily employment as its high state of good order constituted the very pride of her heart morton as he followed her into the room underwent a rebuke for not diding his shoon which showed that ailie had not relinquished her habits of authority on entering the oak parlour he could not but recollect the feelings of solemn awe with which when a boy he had been affected at his occasional and rare admission to an apartment which he then supposed had not its equal save in the halls of princes it may be readily supposed that the worked worsted chairs with their short ebony legs and long upright backs had lost much of their influence over his mind that the large brass andirons seemed diminished in splendour that the green worsted tapestry appeared no masterpiece of the heiress loom and that the room looked on the whole dark gloomy and disconsolate yet there were two objects the counterfeit presentment of two brothers which dissimilar as those described by hamlet affected his mind with a variety of sensations one full-length portrait represented his father in complete armour with a countenance indicating his masculine and determined character and the other set forth his uncle in velvet and brocade looking as if he were ashamed of his own finery though entirely indebted for it to the liberality of the painter it was an idle fancy ailie said to dress the honest old man in the expensive falwals that he never wore in his life instead of his douce raplock grey and his band with the narrow edging in private morton could not help being much of her opinion for anything approaching to the dress of a gentleman sat as ill on the ungainly person of his relative as an open or generous expression would have done on his mean and money-making features he now extricated himself from ailie to visit some of his haunts in the neighbouring wood while her own hands made an addition to the dinner she was preparing an incident no otherwise remarkable than as it cost the life of a fowl which for any event of less importance than the arrival of henry morton might have cackled on to a good old age ere ailie could have been guilty of the extravagance of killing 
and dressing it the meal was seasoned by talk of old times and by the plans which ailie laid out for futurity in which she assigned her young master all the prudential habits of her old one and planned out the dexterity with which she was to exercise her duty as governant morton let the old woman enjoy her day-dreams and castle-building during moments of such pleasure and deferred till some fitter occasion the communication of his purpose again to return and spend his life upon the continent his next care was to lay aside his military dress which he considered likely to render more difficult his researches after burleigh he exchanged it for a grey doublet and cloak formerly his usual attire at milnwood and which mrs wilson produced from a chest of walnut tree wherein she had laid them aside without forgetting carefully to brush and air them from time to time morton retained his sword and firearms without which few persons travelled in those unsettled times when he appeared in his new attire mrs wilson was first thankful that they fitted him so decently since though he was no fatter yet he looked more manly than when he was taken from milnwood next she enlarged on the advantage of saving old clothes to be what she called beatmasters to the new and was far advanced in the history of a velvet cloak belonging to the late milnwood which had first been converted to a velvet doublet and then into a pair of breeches and appeared each time as good as new when morton interrupted her account of its transmigration to bid her good-bye he gave indeed a sufficient shock to her feelings by expressing the necessity he was under of proceeding on his journey that evening and where are ye goin and what would ye do that for and where would ye sleep but in your own house after ye have been so many years from home i feel all the unkindness of it ailie but it must be so and that was the reason that i attempted to conceal myself from you as i suspected you would not let me part from you so easily but where are ye goin then said ailie once more saw ever mortal eyne the like of you just to come one moment and flee away like an arrow out of a bow the next i must go down replied morton to neil blaine the piper's half he can give me a bed i suppose a bed i's warrant can he replied ailie and gar ye pay well for it into the bargain laddie i dare say ye have lost your wits in those foreign parts to gang and give siller for a supper and a bed and might have both for nothing and thanks to ye for accepting them i assure you ailie said morton desirous to silence her remonstrances that this is a business of great importance in which i may be a great gainer and cannot possibly be a loser i dinna see how that can be if ye begin by giving maybe the fack of twelve shillings scots for your supper but young folks are aye venturesome and think to get siller that way my poor old master took a surer gait and never parted with it when he had once gotten it persevering in his desperate resolution morton took leave of ailie and mounted his horse to proceed to the little town after exacting a solemn promise that she would conceal his return until she again saw or heard from him i am not very extravagant was his natural reflection as he trotted slowly towards the town but were ailie and i to set up house together as she proposes i think my profusion would break the good old creature's heart before a week were out chapter twenty of old mortality by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by dion gines salt lake city utah where's the jolly host you told me of it has been my custom ever 
to parley with mine host lover's progress morton reached the borough town without meeting with any remarkable adventure and alighted at the little inn it had occurred to him more than once while upon his journey that his resumption of the dress which he had worn while a youth although favourable to his views in other respects might render it more difficult for him to remain incognito but a few years of campaigns and wandering had so changed his appearance that he had great confidence that in the grown man whose brows exhibited the traces of resolution and considerate thought none would recognize the raw and bashful stripling who won the game of the popinjay the only chance was that here and there some whig whom he had led to battle might remember the captain of the milnwood marksman but the risk if there was any could not be guarded against the half seemed full and frequented as if possessed of all its old celebrity the person and demeanour of neil blaine more fat and less civil than of yore intimated that he had increased as well in purse as in corpulence for in scotland a landlord's complaisance for his guests decreases in exact proportion to his rise in the world his daughter had acquired the air of a dexterous barmaid undisturbed by the circumstances of love and war so apt to perplex her in the exercise of her vocation both showed morton the degree of attention which could have been expected by a stranger travelling without attendance at a time when they were particularly the badges of distinction he took upon himself exactly the character his appearance presented went to the stable and saw his horse accommodated then returned to the house and seating himself in the public room for to request one to himself would in those days have been thought an overweening degree of conceit he found himself in the very apartment in which he had some years before celebrated his victory at the game of the popinjay a jocular preferment which led to so many serious consequences he felt himself as may well be supposed a much changed man since that festivity and yet to look around him the groups assembled in the half seemed not dissimilar to those which the same scene had formerly presented two or three burghers husbanded their dribbles of brandy two or three dragoons lounged over their muddy ale and cursed the inactive times that allowed them no better cheer their cornet did not indeed play at backgammon with the curate in his cassock but he drank a little modicum of aqua mirabilis with the grey cloaked presbyterian minister the scene was another and yet the same differing only in persons but corresponding in general character let the tide of the world wax or wan as it will morton thought as he looked around him enough will be found to fill the places which chance renders vacant and in the usual occupations and amusements of life human beings will succeed each other as leaves upon the same tree with the same individual difference and the same general resemblance after pausing a few minutes morton whose experience had taught him the readiest mode of securing attention ordered a pint of claret and as the smiling landlord appeared with the pewter measure foaming fresh from the tap for bottling wine was not then in fashion he asked him to sit down and take a share of the good cheer this invitation was peculiarly acceptable to neil blaine who if he did not positively expect it from every guest not provided with better company yet received it from many and was not a whit abashed or surprised at the summons he sat down along with his guest 
in a secluded nook near the chimney and while he received encouragement to drink by far the greater share of the liquor before them he entered at length as a part of his expected functions upon the news of the country the births deaths and marriages the change of property the downfall of old families and the rise of new but politics now the fertile source of eloquence mine host did not care to mingle in his theme and it was only in answer to a question of morton that he replied with an air of indifference um ay we ay have soldiers among us more or less there's a wheen german horse down at glasgow yonder they call their commander Whittybody or some sick name although he's as grave and gruesome an old dutchman as ever i saw wittenbold perhaps said morton an old man with gray hair and short black moustaches speaks seldom and smokes for ever replied neil blaine i see your honor kens the man he may be a very good man too for aught i see that is considering he is a soldier and a dutchman but if he were ten generals and as many witty bodies he has no skill in the pipes he guard me stop in the middle of torpichen's rant the best piece of music that ever bag gave wind to but these fellows said morton glancing his eye towards the soldiers that were in the apartment are not of his corps no no these are scotch dragoons said mine host our own old caterpillars these were claverhouse's lads a while sen and would be again maybe if he had the lang tan in his hand is there not a report of his death inquired morton troth is there said the landlord your honour is right there is sick of fleeing rumour but in my poor opinion it's lang or the devil die i would have the folks here look to themselves if he makes an outbreak he'll be down from the highlands where i could drink this glass and where are they then all the hell rakers of dragoons would be at his whistle in a moment no doubt they're willie's men even now as they were james's a while sin and reason good they fight for their pay what else have they to fight for they have neither lands nor houses i trow there's one good thing of the change or the revolution as they call it folks may speak out afore the burkies now and no fear of being hauled away to the guard-house or having the thumbikin screwed on your finger-ends just as i would drive the screw through a cork there was a little pause when morton feeling confident in the progress he had made in mine host's familiarity asked though with the hesitation proper to one who puts a question on the answer to which rests something of importance whether blaine knew a woman in that neighbourhood called elizabeth mcclure whether i can bessie mcclure answered the landlord with a landlord's laugh how can i but can my own wife's haley be her rest my own wife's first goodman's sister bessie mcclure an honest wife she is but sore she's been trysted with misfortunes the loss of twa decent lads of sons in the time of the persecution as they call it nowadays and dousley and decently she has borne her burden blaming none and condemning none if there's an honest woman in the world it's bessie mcclure and to lose her twa sons as i was saying and to have dragoons clink down on her for a month by past for be whig or tory uppermost they i quarter those loons on victuallers to lose as i was saying this woman keeps an inn then interrupted morton a public in a poor way replied blaine looking round at his own superior accommodations a sour browst of small ale that she sells to folk that are over drouthy with travel to be nice but nothing to call a stirring trade or a thriving change-house 
can you get me a guide there said morton your honour will rest here all the night you'll hardly get accommodation at bussy's said neil whose regard for his deceased wife's relative by no means extended to sending company from his own house to hers there is a friend answered morton whom i am to meet with there and i only called here to take a stirrup cup and inquire the way your honour had better answered the landlord with the perseverance of his calling send some one to warn your friend to come on here i tell you landlord answered morton impatiently that will not serve my purpose i must go straight to this woman mcclure's house and i desire you to find me a guide a oh, well sir you'll choose for yourself to be sure said neil blaine somewhat disconcerted but devil a guide you'll need if ye go down the water for twa mile or so as gin ye were bound for milnwood house and then take the first broken disjacked looking road that makes for the hills ye'll ken it by a broken ash-tree that stands at the side of a burn just where the roads meet and then travel out the path ye canna miss widow mcclure's public for devil another house or hold is on the road for ten long scots miles and that's worth twenty english i am sorry your honour would think of goin out of my house the night but my wife's good sister is a decent woman and it's no lost that a friend gets morton accordingly paid his reckoning and departed the sunset of the summer day placed him at the ash-tree where the path led up towards the moors here he said to himself my misfortunes commenced for just here when burley and i were about to separate on the first night we ever met he was alarmed by the intelligence that the passes were secured by soldiers lying in wait for him beneath that very ash sat the old woman who apprised him of his danger how strange that my whole fortunes should have become inseparably interwoven with that man's without anything more on my part than the discharge of an ordinary duty of humanity would to heaven it were possible i could find my humble quiet and tranquillity of mind upon the spot where i lost them thus arranging his reflections betwixt speech and thought he turned his horse's head up the path evening lowered around him as he advanced up the narrow dell which had once been a wood but was now a ravine divested of trees unless where a few from their inaccessible situation on the edge of precipitous banks or clinging among rocks and huge stones defied the invasion of men and of cattle like the scattered tribes of a conquered country driven to take refuge in the barren strengths of its mountains these two wasted and decayed seemed rather to exist than to flourish and only served to indicate what the landscape had once been but the stream brawled down among them in all its freshness and vivacity giving the life and animation which a mountain rivulet alone can confer on the barest and most savage scenes and which the inhabitants of such a country miss when gazing even upon the tranquil winding of a majestic stream through plains of fertility and beside palaces of splendour the track of the road followed the course of the brook which was now visible and now only to be distinguished by its brawling herd among the stones or in the clefts of the rock that occasionally interrupted its course murmurer that thou art said morton in the enthusiasm of his reverie why chafe with the rocks that stop thy course for a moment there is a sea to receive thee in its bosom and there is an eternity for man when his fretful and hasty course through the veil of time shall be ceased and over what thy petty fuming is to the deep and vast billows of a shoreless ocean 
are our cares hopes fears joys and sorrows to the objects which must occupy us through the awful and boundless succession of ages thus moralizing our traveller passed on till the dell opened and the banks receding from the brook left a little green veil exhibiting a croft or small field on which some corn was growing and a cottage whose walls were not above five feet high and whose thatched roof green with moisture age house-leek and grass had in some places suffered damage from the encroachment of two cows whose appetite this appearance of verdure had diverted from their more legitimate pasture an ill-spelt and worse written inscription intimated to the traveller that he might here find refreshment for man and horse no unacceptable intimation rude as the hut appeared to be considering the wild path he had trod in approaching it and the high and waste mountains which rose in desolate dignity behind this humble asylum it must have been thought morton in some such spot as this that burley was likely to find a congenial confidant as he approached he observed the good dame of the house herself seated by the door she had hitherto been concealed from him by a huge alder bush good evening mother said the traveller your name is mistress mcclure elizabeth mcclure sir a poor widow was the reply can you lodge a stranger for a night i can sir if he will be pleased with the widow's cake and the widow's cruise i have been a soldier good dame answered morton and nothing can come amiss to me in the way of entertainment a soldier sir said the old woman with a sigh god send ye a better trade it is believed to be an honourable profession my good dame i hope you do not think the worse of me for having belonged to it i judge no one sir replied the woman and your voice sounds like that of a civil gentleman but i have witnessed so muckle ill with sojering in this poor land that i am even content that i can see no more of it with these sightless organs as she spoke thus morton observed that she was blind shall i not be troublesome to you my good dame said he compassionately your infirmity seems ill calculated for your profession no sir answered the old woman i can gang about the house readily enough and i have a bit lassie to help me and the dragoon lads will look after your horse when they come home from their patrol for a small matter they are civiler now than lang syne upon these assurances morton alighted peggy my bonny bird continued the hostess addressing a little girl of twelve years old who had by this time appeared take the gentleman's horse to the stable and slack his girths and take off the bridle and shake down a lock of hay before him till the dragoons come back come this way sir she continued ye'll find my house clean though it's a poor one morton followed her into the cottage accordingly this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 21 of Old Mortality by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Then out and spake the old mother, and fast her tears did fall. Ye wouldna be warned, my son Johnny from the hunting to bide away old ballad when he entered the cottage morton perceived 
that the old hostess had spoken truth the inside of the hut belied its outward appearance and was neat and even comfortable especially the inner apartment in which the hostess informed her guest that he was to sup and sleep refreshments were placed before him such as the little inn afforded and though he had small occasion for them he accepted the offer as the means of maintaining some discourse with the landlady notwithstanding her blindness she was assiduous in her attendance and seemed by a sort of instinct to find her way to what she wanted have you no one but this pretty little girl to assist you in waiting on your guests was the natural question none sir replied his old hostess i dwell alone like the widow of zarephath few guests come to this poor place and i have na custom enough to hire servants i had one's twa fine sons that look it after all thing but god gives and takes away his name be praised she continued turning her clouded eyes towards heaven i was once better off that is worldly speaking even since i lost them but that was before this last change indeed said morton and yet you are a presbyterian my good mother i am sir praised be the light that showed me the right way replied the landlady then i should have thought continued the guest the revolution would have brought you nothing but good if said the old woman it has brought the land good and freedom of worship to tender consciences it's little matter what it has brought to a poor blind worm like me still replied morton i cannot see how it could possibly injure you it's a long story sir answered his hostess with a sigh but one night six weeks or thereby afore bothwell brig a young gentleman stopped at this poor cottage stiff and bloody with wounds pale and done out with riding and his horse so weary he couldna drag one foot after the other and his foes were close ahint him and he was one of our enemies what could i do sir you that's a soldier will think me but a silly old wife but i fed him and relieved him and keep it him hidden until the pursuit was over and who said morton dares disapprove of your having done so i canna answered the blind woman i got ill will about it among some of our own folk they said i should have been to him what jail was to sisera but well i wot i had no divine command to shed blood and to save it was both like a woman and a christian and then they said i wanted natural affection to relieve one that belonged to the band that murdered my two sons that murdered your two sons ay sir though maybe ye'll give their deaths another name the tan fell with sword in hand fighting for a broken national covenant the t'other oh they took him and shot him dead on the green before his mother's face my old ein dazzled when the shots were lootin off and to my thought they waxed weaker and weaker ever since that weary day and sorrow and heartbreak and tears that would not be dried might help on the disorder but alas betraying lord evandale's young blood to his enemy's sword would never have brought my ninian and johnny alive again lord evandale said morton in surprise was it lord evandale whose life you saved in troth even his she replied and kind he was to me after and gave me a cow and calf malt mill and siller and none durst steer me when he was in power but we live on an outside bit of tilly tudlam land and the estate was sore plead between letty margaret bellenden and the present laird basil oliphant and lord evandale backed the old lady for love of her daughter miss edith as the country said one of the best 
and bonniest lassies in Scotland. But they behooved to give way, and Basil got the castle and land, and on the back of that came the revolution, and what to turn coat faster than the laird, for he said he had been a true Whig all the time, and turned papist only for fashion's sake, and then he got favor, and Lord Evandale's head was under water, for he was over proud and manful to bend to every blast of wind, though many a one may ken as well as me that be his own principles as they might, he was no ill friend to our folk when he could protect us, and far kinder than Basil Oliphant, that I keep it the cobble head down the stream. But he was set by, and ill looked on, and his word never asked, and then Basil, what's a revengeful man, set himself to vex him in all shapes, and especially by oppressing and despoiling the old blind widow, Bessie McClure, that saved Lord Evandale's life, and that he was so kind to. But he's mistaken, if that's his end, for it will be long, or Lord Evandale hears a word from me about the selling my key for rent, or ever it was due, or the putting the dragoons on me when the country's quiet, or anything else that will vex him. I can bear my own burden patiently, and world's loss is the least part of it. Astonished and interested at this picture of patient, grateful, and high-minded resignation, Morton could not help bestowing an execration upon the poor-spirited rascal who had taken such a dastardly course of vengeance. "'Dinna curse him, sir,' said the old woman. "'I have heard a good man say that a curse was like a stone flung up to the heavens, and most like to return on the head that sent it. But if ye can, Lord Evandale, bid him look to himself, for I hear strange words pass atween the soldiers that are lying here, and his name is often mentioned, and the tone of them has been twice up at Tilly Tudlam. He's a kind of favorite with the laird, though he was in former times one of the most cruel oppressors ever rode through a country. Outtaken Sergeant Bothwell, they call him Inglis. I have the deepest interest in Lord Evandale's safety, said Morton, and you may depend on my finding some mode to apprise him of these suspicious circumstances, and in return, my good friend, will you indulge me with another question? Do you know anything of Quentin McKell of Iron Grey? Do I know whom? echoed the blind woman, in a tone of great surprise and alarm. Quentin McKell of Iron Grey, repeated Morton, is there anything so alarming in the sound of that name? Na, na, answered the woman, with hesitation, but to hear him asked after by a stranger and a soldier, good protect us, what mischief is to come next? None by my means, I assure you, said Morton, the subject of my inquiry has nothing to fear from me, if, as I suppose, this Quinton McKell is the same with John Ball. Do not mention his name, said the widow, pressing his lips with her fingers. I see you have his secret and his password, and I'll be free with you. But for God's sake, speak loud and low in the name of heaven. I trust ye seek him not to his hurt. Ye said ye were a soldier. I said truly, but one he has nothing to fear from. I commanded a party at Bothwell Bridge. Indeed, said the woman, and verily there is something in your voice I can trust. Ye speak prompt and readily, and like an honest man. I trust I am so, said Morton. But no displeasure to you, sir, in these warful times, continued Mrs. McClure. The hand of brother is against brother and he fears as mickle almost from this government as ever he did from the old persecutors indeed said morton in a tone of inquiry i was not aware of that but i am only just now returned from abroad i'll tell ye said the blind woman 
first assuming an attitude of listening that showed how effectually her powers of collecting intelligence had been transferred from the eye to the ear for instead of casting a glance of circumspection around she stooped her face and turned her head slowly around in such a manner as to ensure that there was not the slightest sound stirring in the neighborhood and then continued i'll tell ye ye ken how he has labored to raise up again the covenant burned broken and buried in the hard hearts and selfish devices of this stubborn people now when he went to holland far from the countenance and thanks of the great and the comfortable fellowship of the godly both while he was in right to expect the prince of orange would show him no favor and the ministers no godly communion this was hard to bide for one that had suffered and done mickle over mickle it may be but why should i be a judge he came back to me and to the old place of refuge that had often received him in his distresses more especially before the great day of victory at drumclod for i shall never forget how he was bending hither of all nights in the year on that evening after the play when young milnwood won the popinjay but i warned him off for that time what exclaimed morton it was you that sat in your red cloak by the high road and told him there was a lion in the path in the name of heaven what are ye said the old woman breaking off her narrative in astonishment but be what ye may she continued resuming it with tranquillity ye can ken nothing worse of me than that i have been willing to save the life of friend and foe i know no ill of you mrs mcclure and i mean no ill by you i only wish to show you that i know so much of this person's affairs that i might be safely entrusted with the rest proceed if you please in your narrative there is a strange command in your voice said the blind woman though its tones are sweet i have little more to say the stuarts have been dethroned and william and mary reign in their stead but no more word of the covenant than if it were a dead letter they have taken the indulged clergy and an erastian general assembly of the ante-pure and triumphant kirk of scotland even into their very arms and bosoms our faithful champions of the testimony agree even worse with this than with the open tyranny and apostasy of the persecuting times for souls are hardened and deadened and the mouths of fasting multitudes are crammed with fissonless bran instead of the sweet word in season and many an hungry starving creature when he sits down on a sunday forenoon to get something that might warm him to the great work has a dry clatter of morality driven about his lugs and in short said morton desirous to stop a discussion which the good old woman as enthusiastically attached to her religious profession as to the duties of humanity might probably have indulged longer in short you are not disposed to acquiesce in this new government and burley is of the same opinion many of our brethren sir are of belief we fought for the covenant and fasted and prayed and suffered for that grand national league and now we are like neither to see nor hear tell of that which we suffered and fought and fasted and prayed for and once it was thought something might be made by bringing back the old family on a new bargain and a new bottom as after all when king james went away i understand the great quarrel of the english against him was in behalf of seven unhallowed prelates and so though one part of our people were free to join with the present model and levied an armed regiment under the ural of angus yet our honest friend and others that stood up for purity of doctrine and freedom of conscience were determined to hear the breath of the jacobites before they took part again them 
fearing to fall to the ground like a wall built with unslaked mortar or from sitting between twa stools they chose an odd quarter said morton from which to expect freedom of conscience and purity of doctrine oh dear sir said the landlady the natural day-spring rises in the east but the spiritual day-spring may rise in the north for what we blinded mortals can and burley went to the north to seek it replied the guest truly ay sir and he saw claverhouse himself that they call dundee now what exclaimed morton in amazement i would have sworn that meeting would have been the last of one of their lives no no sir in troubled times as i understand said mrs mcclure their sudden changes montgomery and ferguson and many one more that were king james's greatest foes are on his side now claverhouse spake our friend fair and sent him to consult with lord evandale but then there was a break-off for lord evandale wouldna look at hear or speak with him and now he's one's wood and i war and roars for revenge again lord evandale and will hear naught of anything but burn and slay and oh that starts of passion they unsettle his mind and give the enemy sore advantages the enemy said morton what enemy what enemy are ye acquainted familiarly with john balfour of burley and dinna ken that he has had sore and frequent combats to sustain against the evil one did ye ever see him alone but the bible was in his hand and the drawn sword on his knee did ye never sleep in the same room with him and hear him strive in his dreams with the delusions of satan oh ye ken little of him if ye have seen him only in fair daylight for no man can put the face upon his doleful visits and strifes that he can do i have seen him after sick a strife of agony tremble that an infant might have held him while the hair on his brow was draping as fast as ever my poor thatched roof did in a heavy rain as she spoke morton began to recollect the appearance of burley during his sleep in the hayloft at milnwood the report of cuddy that his senses had become impaired and some whispers current among the cameronians who boasted frequently of burley's soul exercises and his strifes with the foul fiend which several circumstances led him to conclude that this man himself was a victim to those delusions though his mind naturally acute and forcible not only disguised his superstition from those in whose opinion it might have discredited his judgment but by exerting such a force as is said to be proper to those afflicted with epilepsy could postpone the fits which it occasioned until he was either freed from superintendence or surrounded by such as held him more highly on account of these visitations it was natural to suppose and could easily be inferred from the narrative of mrs mcclure that disappointed ambition wrecked hopes and the downfall of the party which he had served with such desperate fidelity were likely to aggravate enthusiasm into temporary insanity it was indeed no uncommon circumstance in those singular times that men like sir harry vane harrison overton and others themselves slaves to the wildest and most enthusiastic dreams could when mingling with the world conduct themselves not only with good sense in difficulties and courage in dangers but with the most acute sagacity and determined valor the subsequent part of mrs mcclure's information confirmed morton in these impressions in the grey of the morning she said my little peggy shall show ye the gate to him before the soldiers are up but ye maun let his hour of danger as he calls it 
be over afore ye venture on him in his place of refuge peggy will tell ye when to venture in she kens his ways well for while she carries him some little helps that he canna do without to sustain life and in what retreat then said morton has this unfortunate person found refuge an awesome place answered the blind woman as ever living creature took refuge in they call it the black lynn of linkletter it's a doleful place but he loves it above all others because he has so often been in safe hiding there and it's my belief he prefers it to a tapestried chamber and a down bed but ye'll see it i have seen it myself many a day sin i was a daft hempy lassie then and little thought what was to come of it would ye choose only one thing sir ere ye betake yourself to your rest for ye maun stir with the first dawn of the grey light nothing more my good mother said morton and they parted for the evening morton recommended himself to heaven threw himself on the bed heard between sleeping and waking the trampling of the dragoon horses at the riders return from their patrol and then slept soundly after such painful agitation chapter twenty